Money to Burn, an adventure story by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Stephen Seidel in Bozeman, Montana, December 7, 2020. Money to Burn, Chapter 1. Dedication to charles keen hammett dear governor like most men of affairs you prefer your books to be after the manner of this one that's my belief anyway on a train by day or a bed by night you will read money to burn and immediately forget it which is as it should be for then you can profitably reread it a year hence but i'm certain it will entertain you while you are reading it if it gives you the realization of good fights on strange islands in tropic seas, if it stirs you with a sense of its hairbreadth escapes, if its mystery keeps you guessing and inveigles you past your proper railroad station, or runs up the house electric light bill by holding you tight until morning, then it is the sort of book that I have planned it to be. I am betting that it will accomplish such feats, and so i am dedicating it to you your affectionate r w k geneva switzerland december seventh nineteen twenty three money to burn chapter one queer streets by night the most silent spots in all the five boroughs of greater new york are those places which are most crowded by day when evening has fallen, the money market's gold cram canyons, lately echoing to the hoarse cries of the greedy, are deserted by all except watchmen in ambush, sedulously concealed. The warehouse district that, since morning, has resounded with the clamor of drays and the shouts of drivers, is changed to paths of druids' graveyards whose tombs are towers. The outstretched waterfront from Ottoman Park on the Hudson, around the Battery, and up through the East River and the Harlem to Macomb's Dam Bridge, those sometimes scenes of an immense activity broadcast to the world's remotest corners become, with darkness, leagues of desert, just so much solemn stillness and so many mute miles. Nor is there any road throughout that lonely course more lonely than the streets that bound Atlantic Basin on the Brooklyn side and look across Buttermilk Channel, now a channel of ink, to Fort Columbus and Castle William beyond it on what was once the Governor's Isle. Few lights there, yet plenty of shadows. Scarce anybody visible, yet the sense of many lives skulking nearby, which would add to civilization's security by remaining invisible and torpid forever. When young Stone turned out of Conover Street, he seemed on the edge of a city killed by the explosion of some gigantic gas shell. After he had walked a hundred yards, he began to feel that stealthy beasts were creeping in to feed upon the dead. Where are you going? He came up short before a deep doorway from the comparative security of which two policemen peered out at him. He could distinguish their caps and nothing more. He understood that the law's officers are safer in pairs when they keep their nocturnal vigils in such quarters. "'I'm out for a walk,' said Dan. It was a natural excursion for him. He worked hard all day over his books at the medical school, or over such public ward patients as he was permitted to attend in the hospital. By evening he wanted fresh air, and this night he had sought it out at the waterside. He had to study so intently that there was small opportunity for the cultivation of friendship, and so he walked alone. He liked the smell of tar in the neighborhood of ships as only an inlander can, and so, though this particular spot was new to him, he often explored the wharves. Nevertheless, as he gave those policemen his entirely voracious explanation, he realized that it could not sound entirely convincing to its auditors. It wasn't. Let's have a look at you. A flash lamp shot its rays from the policeman's fist to the wanderer's face. The face of an enthusiast. Blue eyes that smiled, but that, even when smiling, could hint of zealous faiths and determined defense of them. 
a mouth that smiled also and smiled like the eyes fresh complexion frank expression light hair that fought its way toward freedom under a soft hat impossible to suspect such a chap of evil intent here yet equally impossible to consider such a chap safe in such a district well as here's no place for a quiet stroll said the policeman a quiet's deceiving me boy his companion added i can take care of myself said stone the second policeman grunted the east river's full of lads that thought the same run along up town with yous or somebody'll be goin fishin for yous in the mornin dan made some pretense at obedience but he soon turned back again and resumed his walk by the water it was full of motionless ships their masts and funnels dimly visible ships that had come in yesterday with cargoes of furs and laces of sugar and coffee spices and cocoa from distant ports ships that would sail to distant ports to-morrow with american chemicals and copper medicines and machinery coal and oil and hardware for the next fifteen minutes he met nobody then up a narrow street to his left a door opened and closed again there had been a faint glow and a howl a whining dog limped toward stone and with that canine instinct which recognizes dog lovers at the first encounter nestled against his already pausing feet dan bent to stroke the cur it whimpered hurt asked stone he felt the animal one of its forelegs was broken there was a corner lamp some distance forward he lifted the dog and bore it thither a brutal kick had probably done the damage dan read that and the meek eyes turned up to his he found a bit of wood relic of some box dropped and broken by a van and whittling the stick and ripping his handkerchief he improvised a splint the dog held quiet with understanding patience when the operation was complete stone felt a damp muzzle kissing his hand if that was your home said dan i think i'll take you back there perhaps a sight of what they've done will make it safer for you than outside carefully carrying his bundle he made his way back to the point whence he thought the glow had issued it was an apparently vacant warehouse but stone knocked at the smaller of its doors no answer he couldn't well take his charge home with him his third-rate boarding-house opened to much that he disapproved of but the angular landlady set her face sternly and it was a flint face against dogs she owned a cat which was her sole comfort and one of the hundred hardships of her lodgers nothing to be done in that respect moreover stone was the sort of person who the more impulsively he has embarked upon an enterprise the more deliberately and determinedly he persists in it he knocked again still no answer well he was going through with this thing if the dog had chosen to decamp that would be another matter there was a good deal to be said against returning him to the scene of his injury but there was more to be said against turning an injured cur loose to the mercies of street urchins such as must by day infest a neighborhood like this dan wished the animal would run away the animal lay quiet in his arms so he knocked a third time now louder and now a response the echoes of his knuckle blows rolled up the dark and empty street they caromed from the black walls of one side to the black walls farther along on the other and as they lessened with distance there came a shuffling step from behind that portal before which the medical student was standing a shuffling step first and then a whispered and hesitant but entirely audible voice demanded who's there end of chapter one chapter two of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two cross-eyed johnson a moment before stone had been wishing that the dog would decamp and relieve him of his self-imposed duty the dog fled now yet too late to save its preserver from the necessity of going forward at sound of that low voice behind the door dan's little patient jumped out of its physician's arms and scuttled on three legs but with significant speed up the thoroughfare where darkness instantly engulfed it 
in that canine mind any one of the street's thousand dangers was evidently preferable to another encounter with the man who had just spoken for stone pursuit was obviously useless there was no overtaking the fugitive yet so affected was he by its determination to escape that he poised upon the edge of giving chase he was ready to make that enterprise an excuse for his own departure when a bolt was shot back and the door opened no retreat now dan stood his ground at first scarcely anything was to be seen there a bullet-shaped head a head like a modern elongated bullet stood on end with wide ears flanking it or like those conical spikes balanced by steel wings which airmen dropped in the later raids of the world war what illumination was vouchsafed came from back of this man who now confronted him i asked you who you was stone rejoiced that the dog had escaped anyhow dogs knew best where their comparative safety lay the tone of this inquisitor was thick his breath was heavy with bad liquor said dan a pup ran out of here a few minutes ago somebody kicked it the fellow in the doorway swayed well it was my dog this is a free country or used to be i guess i got a right to kick my own dog ain't i its legs broken stone explained his anger, always quick to rise against cruelty, he did his best to put down. I set the leg. I was bringing him back to you. Whether protest was not entirely absent from that reply and was felt and feared by the dog owner, or whether the man really experienced some remorse at learning the extent of the injuries he had inflicted, it was difficult to say. In either event, he suffered a sudden and palpable change of heart. His tone softened leg broken i'm sorry where is he as soon as he heard you coming he beat it the bullet-headed man hesitated you ain't an agent of that association for cruelty to animals i'm not well then don't worry about that there dog i knows him and he knows me see he knows my little ways don't mean nothing and he'll be back when his bread basket's empty i am sort of quick-tempered sometimes but i get right over it i'm much obliged to you for setting that leg of his come on in there was absolutely no reason in the world why such an invitation should be accepted by a hard-working sober living medical student whose sole ambition lay strictly within the limits of his chosen profession and whose scarcely indulged hobby was of all things conceivable the study of that spanish american church architecture no true example of which he had ever seen dan knew that this neighborhood was a precarious one he knew that he faced a man subject to a form of brutality that stone for his part always found especially repellent nevertheless he was that kind of young american who finds a compelling reason for any course in the very fact that there is no reason apparent thanks he said i will come in for a minute i've been walking a good way and i'm tired he was curious too he stepped inside the other man bolted the door. "'If you're done up,' he croaked, "'I can give you a drop of something.' They now stood under a dreary hanging lamp. Dan could see that his host was burly, flushed, and watery-eyed. The host, on the other hand, studied Stone's face, and evidently found it as reassuring as the policeman had done. "'It's the real stuff,' he continued with a wavering smile that gave added proof, if added proof were required, of the efficacy of his own liquor just got it in from rum row out there and i'm selling it cheaper than any other bar in new york nan shook his tow-colored head only that afternoon he had been helping in hospital to treat the case of a longshoreman who had succumbed to wood alcohol poisoning through use of some real stuff however since stone seemed to have stumbled upon one of the many waterfront dives that catered to the thirst of wharf workers and sailors ashore no good could come from rousing antagonism by casting suspicion on the wares thus offered so he said only no thanks i'm off the stuff but i don't mind taking a cigar the dealer led the way down a shadowy hall and into a little room that must once have been the outer office of some legitimate business concern what had been the cashier's cage was now lengthened and relieved of its wire mesh made a quite practical bar with an impressively labeled array of bottles on the shelves behind it 
There were two or three tables in the room, but only one of these was occupied. At it sat three men. Two of these were engaged in a loud and muddled controversy. It was postponed at Dan's entrance, but after a glance in his direction, its participants paid him no further compliment of attention. He took a chair near them. I'll get you that smoke, said the dive manager, and you'll find it A1. He shuffled behind the bar. A member of the trio at the neighboring table was asking a companion, When do you sail? Stone heard the answer, Two weeks from last Wednesday. The barkeep returned, bringing not a box, but a handful of cigars that were as dark as the night outside. Try one of these here, he said, real Cuban and never paid a cent of duty, neither. That's why I can afford to sell them at fifteen cents per. A glance told Dan that there was no choice among the handful. He selected at random, and while the dive manager retreated behind the desk, there polishing glasses with a dirty towel and occasionally filling and emptying one for his own uses, he lighted the weed. Awful stuff. Dan coughed over it. He began to cast about for some pretense whereby, without giving offense, he might escape before this alleged tobacco choked him. "'When do you say you sailed, Mr. Johnson?' The customer that had acquired a moment since about the date of sailing had drunkenly repeated the question. Idly, Dan looked again at his neighbors. The fellow to whom the queries were addressed was of just the type that would have been expected to frequent this place. He had a broad, weather-beaten face and a bad cast in one eye. By the way in which he wore his clothes, it was clear that they were the shore clothes of the sailor and by the awkward movement of his roughened fist as he raised his glass, it was equally clear that he had raised it quite often enough this evening. I told you once, we're scheduled to get away a fortnight from last Wednesday. He pronounced the S-C-H of scheduled as if it were S-H only, and he spoke with a rising inflection. Dan bit off an inch from the less dangerous end of his cigar and dropped that inch inconspicuously under his table. There was, he reflected, something queer about the questioner and about the silent man of the party. The latter seemed to be the questioner's particular friend. They somehow appeared to have made the acquaintance of the man called Johnson recently, and the acquaintance seemed to have a common taste for liquor as its foundation. Well, that was not unusual, and the manager of this place gave no hint of sharing Stone's feelings about Johnson's table-mates, though, to be sure, the manager was fonder of his stock than he ought to be, and perhaps this dulled the fine edge of that caution which is a requisite to succeed in such a trade. What, anyhow, roused Dan's doubts? Their subjects were unshaven men in suits that had seen hard usage. Both were muscular and both uncouth. They ought to belong here, and yet they didn't. They were not seafaring men. They were not longshoremen. Stone could bring to mind no calling indigenous to this section of the city which they gave token of pursuing. They lolled in their chairs as if they had drunk as much as their cross-eyed companion, but even as Dan was seeking to appraise them, he saw the silent fellow quietly lower his glass beneath their table edge and let quite half the contents trickle to the rusty carpet. Have another drink, the inquisitive stranger urged his sailor guest. Johnson laughed in a silly manner. A hiccup interrupted his laughter. H had about enough, he said. Not near, none of us have. Come on and lick her up. Johnson looked at the tempter out of his one good eye. It was rather glassy, but Dan saw in it, or thought he saw, a struggling mistrust. The generous person was in the act of summoning the barkeeper. He raised a beckoning hand. Across the table, Johnson pulled it down. Don't want another drop. The man who had not spoken nudged his neighbor. That one clasped Johnson's restraining fingers with vast good fellowship. Say, he wheedled, why won't you tell us what the old tub's carrying? If Blue Nose Goldthwait heard you speak disrespectful of the hawk, said Johnson, He'd throw you, throw you across that bar there. Well, anyway, what's he going to have aboard of her, matey? There was a moment's pause, during which it could be seen that the sailor was making desperate endeavor to gather his wits together. Then, as if repeating a lesson learned by heart, he growled, 
condensed milk for the west indies i said so before and i say it again this must have been the topic over which they had been wrangling when dan entered milk nothing mocked the inquisitor johnson sat back in his chair do you mean i'm a liar the man who had hitherto been silent spoke now he spoke hurriedly and soothingly course he don't come on and have a little drink course he does johnson stubbornly persisted then rage flamed what business of you chaps is it what we carry eh what i don't like your i don't like your looks and i've half a mind he made it a whole mind then and there he threw his empty glass in the face opposite him leapt up overset the table and then jumped it with a knife raised in his right fist everybody was afoot the dive manager hurdled his bar stone darted forward the cautious man called don't hurt him tom they were all three too late the threatened customer picked up his chair and brought it down upon johnson's head brought johnson down too down to the floor you fool yelled the cautious man you fool he shot across the room and up the hall his friend was at his heels before any of the three who were left behind could move to stop retreat the outer door was unbolted it opened it closed the fight had been successful prohibition enforcement agents asked stone as he bent above the supine johnson after evidence the violator of the eighteenth amendment mopped his low brow they wouldn't never have made this kind of trouble if they was he said they'd have just pinched me right off johnson opened his crossed eye am i much hurt a quick examination brought dan's negative verdict but you're slated for a few days in hospital he said i don't mind that johnson gave a glare at the doorway through which his recent enemies had made good their escape i only wish i'd got my knife into one of them they didn't learn anything from me eh that opened eye almost disappeared under the bridge of his nose well my lad don't you go a thinkin things the reason they didn't get anything out of me was because there ain't nothin to be got that's why end of chapter two chapter three of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three deadly weapons after squeamish days of infernal weather the british tramp steamer hawk nine hundred tons captain goldthwaite new york to west indian ports limped across an unruffled sea blue and transparent there where the waters of the atlantic and the caribbean meet morning had dawned like the unfolding of a pale pink rose far away off the old tub starboard quarter a silver-gray blot against the glittering azure of the sky increased in size gradually it seemed to descend to the world's rim until it detached itself from the heavens mount diablo of santo domingo the hawk groaned at the sight of it like a man with sore corns but the cranky screw continued however unsteadily its revolutions the heat was intense and the direct summer sun cast a shadowless glare over a peeling stack suspicious deck paint hungry sides a sinister craft as regiments contract the temperament of their colonels so do merchant vessels assume a likeness to their commanders sullen ominous a discord in that marine sympathy Captain Goldthwaite's ocean peddler advertised its master's character to air and wave. Below, in the cabin forward, Dan Stone's straight blue eyes grew bluer. His open smile widened. Oh, she's a rum ship, all right, he grinned. The Greek philosopher who advised us to know ourselves counseled the impossible. The briefest experience suffices for a practical understanding of nature. A kitten need fall only once into the water and be rescued. It will dread drowning ever thereafter. A baby needs few tumbles before he realizes that heights are best avoided. Yet, though the wasp born yesterday can today design and build its intricate nest, the longest life and the hardest study are not long enough or hard enough to furnish man with self-comprehension. He may acquire all the lore of the scholar, all the arts of business, but he will never thoroughly read his own mind and his own heart. 
he would tell his child that the attraction of gravity draws the loosened apple to the ground but he can master nothing except the broadest principles of that inevitable law of cause and effect as it determines his own history a sicilian slave throws away his worn-out sandal and thereby becomes a roman general proceeding leisurely to his office a rich new york broker pauses to buy a cravat that has attracted him from a haberdasher's window and so starts in motion a train of events that five years later makes him a pauper dan stone set the broken leg of a dog in brooklyn that act sent him southward aboard the hawk that's what she is he repeated a rum ship he had in his capacity of acting ship's doctor just concluded the professional portion of his call on the tramp's only passenger seen by daylight or by so much of it as the cabin permitted to enter stone presented a picture of the physically well-proportioned man but so nicely balanced were his muscles that no gaze save a trained one would have marked him out for owning the unusual strength the quick movement and long endurance which he really possessed anybody not both anatomist and psychologist must have been preoccupied with his impetuous face his frank glance that was too ready to accept the rest of the world on its own terms and his boyishly unruly hair tow-colored and irreconcilably rebellious to the brushes and anybody with a knowledge of the hawk's captain would have wondered how stone came to be his medico and how long he could stand that tyrant's gaff from his bunk the passenger echoed his physician's last word rum he nearly pulled himself to a sitting posture is that what she is the hawk was no floating fortress of free speech though few of the hands on that british boat understood the english tongue stone glanced beyond the cabin door to make sure that he wasn't overheard then he glanced back at his mysterious patient i don't mean liquor mr hoagland her liquor's milk all right condensed milk to be dropped here there and everywhere till we dump the last at port of spain only i bet it's curdled by now i just meant that she was well what captain goldthwaite or any of his fellow countrymen would mean when they used the word that i used in the way i used it she's rum this patient was the only other american aboard and if stone's presence furnished him with material for speculation he was a puzzle to stone the acting doctor rarely indulged in the vice of personal questions but he found it hard to understand why so well-groomed a man well-groomed even in his illness should have chosen this manifestly disreputable tramp when as a hundred signs gave testimony to even this fresh-water physician he was accustomed to ocean liners however the urbane mr hoagland had kept largely to himself and until stricken with ptomaine poisoning mostly confined his conversation to the tempestuous captain and the latter's malicious mate the hawk if she had made much more bad weather would have been in real danger of foundering during the storm which had swooped down upon them within an hour of their dropping sandy hook which had indeed only yesterday subsided she shipped veritable seas that seemed to push her completely beneath the surface of the ocean and hold her there until miraculously she wriggled back to life though possibly ignorant of her captain's temper hoagland who must have had some choice of boat should have gleaned from the most cursory observation a general idea of the hawk's sea qualities before he ever came aboard of her larger more comfortable and far swifter boats touched at all the ports at which the hawk called though their sailings might be fairly infrequent it seemed to the doctor that hoagland's haste must therefore have been to leave america rather than to arrive at his destination did he have to hurry from his country for his country's good you're some doctor he said now he was a wiry little man with thin hair and a snub nose his eyes of a gray that generally veiled their alertness by staring into vacancy now turned with frank questioning directly on the figure in the doorway why'd you pick a tub like this it was exactly the query that dan stone m d minus would have liked to put to hoagland 
However, he answered it easily enough. Because I'm not really a doctor yet. No diploma? Third year and working my way through. First summer, I was a second-rate hotel clerk at a third-rate seaside resort. Last year, I was a hospital orderly. Two weeks ago, the mate of this boat got in a scrap, and I happened along when he needed some first aid. The hawk wanted a doctor and asked no questions. I wanted a job and didn't ask any either, so here I am. It was his way to make light of his own hardships. He honestly laughed at them now. He didn't like to talk about himself, and so he neglected to add that, nursing a dream about some day setting up practice in these latitudes, he wanted to better his already nearly perfect knowledge of Spanish, and that he wanted also to see something of West Indian ecclesiastical architecture. Well, persisted his patient, but why do you call it a rum ship? Dan laughed again. He thought of the hawk's rats, which scuttled over him when he tried to sleep. He was bunking with a crew that had no notion of personal cleanliness. Even now he could smell the stench of their quarters. They never volunteered to police the place. Its deck was a mass of filth, swabbed only when his threats of violence moved his messmates to sullen effort. But he laughed, because he had found that the easiest way of supporting tyranny and all he said was, You wouldn't call it a champagne one, would you? Rum it was, because rum furnished its commander with the chiefest of his preoccupations. Congressmen from the farm and senators that have never gone deeper than the Leviathan's dining room have devised some well-intentioned laws for sailor folk. So has his Britannic Majesty's Parliament. But when a ship's master is far at sea and his boat returns only once in five years to its home port, that master may become a master indeed. If he is a bully born with a hatred of humanity because he can abuse it, and if he overstokes his temper with the fuel of alcohol, his ship will be as much a floating hell as ever was any slaver's in the middle passage. And Captain Goldthwaite was exactly the sort of devil to meet all these requirements and enjoy them. For Stone, things had begun to go wrong when the goddess of liberty stolidly watched the hawk pass her pedestal. The bull-necked, blue-nosed captain had coveted the liberal graft to be acquired by surrendering his cabin to the unexpected and eleventh-hour passenger. But once his cabin was surrendered, he fell into an abiding rage because he had to occupy the mates instead. Cross-eyed Johnson, the mate, cursed at having to bunk with the engineer, whom he hated, and Dan, who had been promised a couch in the engineer's quarters, was contemptuously housed with the doubtful West Indian crew. Being there, he was promptly treated as belonging. Almost the first warmth, when she nosed her way into the Gulf Stream, proved too much for the hawk's so-called cold storage locker. The beef went bad and half the ship's company with it. Hoagland, the solitary passenger, fell a victim. Dan saved himself by subsisting on pilot biscuit and coffee, yet that he saved the others was not charged to his credit. Captain Goldthwaite's habit was to regard as less than human any being that lived forward. Twice already he had raised his drunken but powerful hands against the doctor. It's my own fault, Dan reflected. I ought to have known better. I did. I knew Johnson was a brute the minute I saw him, and he as good as told me what his captain was. I've only myself to blame for ever shipping on this boat, but I won't take any man's fist and not come back at him. The day that Goldthwaite touches me, Stone quietly vowed, I'll first knock him down and then leave the ship if I have to swim till I go under. Now Hoagland, with a wry smile that drew his thin face into deep wrinkles, was answering Dan's latest question with another. No, I wouldn't call it a champagne ship, but I might say it was a milk punch. What do you make of the captain? Was the misplaced passenger asking all this because he really wanted to learn more of the hawk? or because he wanted to ferret out something about stone. It was all too pointed to be the mere making of conversation. Dan had nothing to conceal, and therefore retained his natural reticence. 
I haven't seen enough of them to think anything worth repeating, he said. He bade his patient a quick goodbye and went on deck. The tramp had entered a bay and was skirting shores where luxuriant vegetation rose abruptly from the water's edge and climbed mountain high behind. Tangles of greenery grew steep as a medieval city's walls, from the sea grape to the banana fan, and so to a strange variety of palm. At the far head of the landlocked sea, a little town, all gleaming white and hot, peeped from its verdant frame. Dan accosted a passing member of the crew. "'What's this?' he asked. "'Sanchez, Senor Medico.' The sailor pointed also to San Lorenzo, close off their port bow. He indicated, well to starboard, Santa Barbara de Samana. The profession of medicine and the study of church architecture do not entail a thorough knowledge of geography. Dan had understood that the city of Santo Domingo was to be their first call, and he now assumed that all this lay in their course thither. For the rest, it was enough for him that the way was beautiful and that he was passing over waters that Columbus sailed when he had his first glimpse of the new world. Bells rang out orders from above. The throb of rickety machinery suddenly stopped and gave the tired ship an instant's rest. There came a cry from alongside and answering shouts from the bridge. A face appeared over the rail. Wide nose and thick lips, yet skin of purest copper and straight black hair. The body that followed was clad in a dirty uniform bedecked with much gold lace. One foot wore a patent leather dancing pump, the other a canvas tennis shoe. The Negro Indian pilot climbed to the wheelhouse. A moment later, bulking Captain Goldthwaite passed Stone without so much as a nod on his way below. The hawk's progress was anything but rapid. Dan waited until the swift tropical night descended and the yellow stars drooped close above the funnel. The land turned to lilac and little lights began to appear on shore. Then Cross-Eyed Johnson hurried up to the American. Notwithstanding Dan's ministrations in the speakeasy and at the hospital, the mate had never pretended friendliness. Perhaps he realized the unexpressed but low opinion in which he was held. Certainly, he had proffered the post of ship's doctor, not out of gratitude of Stone, but because Stone's casually announced desire for such a position provided an opportunity to do Goldwaith a good turn by getting him a medical officer at a low figure. "'Where have you been?' The mate spoke always the broad tongue of Avonmouth and now he spoke with an even more than usual brusqueness. Here, said Dan imperturbably, been a lurkin everywheres for you. I've been in full view all the time. Well, you're wanted. Where? In my cabin, Johnson leered. And, he added, I'd advise you to hurry, my lad. Soane left him and went where ordered. His heart was hot. He wanted to practice obedience, but he was nearing the limits of his endurance. Until this afternoon, he had had small time for reflection, but today's respite, with the land so close and the prospect of weeks of browbeating ahead, had determined him on a definite course of action that began with his recorded vow to meet possible force by certain retaliation. There was a small table in the mate's stifling quarters. Here, under a smoking lamp, sprawled Captain Goldthwaite. His huge bulk slumped forward, his lurching elbows, supported by the tabletop, swelled the muscles of his arms until, over them, the coat sleeves strained tight. His monstrous shoulders were hunched to his hairy ears. A lowering, bestial face, his brows were knitted over a large book and over his repugnance for anything so contemptible as the printed page. His blue nose was a dark splash between his crimson cheeks. From his thick lips, curling scornfully, his breath issued with a sibilant sound, and, in this airless cubbyhole, hung as heavily as that dive-keepers in the Brooklyn grog-shop. Goldwaith's breath was rank with Barbados rum. "'You sent for me?' asked Dan, and then he recognized the book and flushed. "'Yes,' Goldwaith growled a monosyllable. He had always detested the doctor, because the doctor would show no fear of him. Not able to wreak resentment on the passenger who had deprived him, at a good price, of his quarters, 
the captain fastened it on the sole compatriot of that passenger aboard now a drunken cunning had come to the aid of enmity and pointed a way to revenge and a profit as well the drunkard transfixed his auditor with a concentrated glare dan did not so much as blink he was resolved to make this fellow state his grievance the captain on the other hand was equally resolved to stare the medical student into startled speech and then to take offence at it dan's temper was longer than goldthwaite's and dan won i sent for you half an hour ago the captain suddenly roared where have you been hiding yourself i have been on deck all afternoon on deck why haven't you been attending to your job i haven't any patience left except the passenger and he won't need me till eight bells if even then none of your lip i've found out you're no doctor and i'll have no damned lip from you gulfway's hairy right fist pounded the volume lying open on his table and at that dan winced he had to speak decisively after all but he kept as much anger from his voice as he could manage i don't mean to be impudent sir but at the same time i want proper treatment in return had the captain been sober his reply would have been a blow he was of course far from sober and so there was no honesty in his rage it was the slow rage that traps he leaned back in his chair with an ugly grin and a choked oath go on said he johnson had entered the cabin with a twist of his crossed eye he grunted an echo to his master's order i never pretended to be a graduate physician dan quietly continued but i was shipped as doctor and i've been treated like a deckhand graduate or not i've saved half your crew for you and all i've got in return is curses almost blows our agreement hasn't once been kept on your part or johnson's so that's it sneered the captain well what do you want the mate grunted again dan cleared his throat he spoke with firmness i'm going to have my pay to date and leave this ship at santo domingo city whether or not that statement was expected he never knew it served in any case as the opening for an attack which was what goldthwaite wanted leave the ship the captain sprang up with such violence that even johnson drew aside desert will you you sign for the voyage and i'll have you in irons in five minutes he leaned across the table and shook a fist under dan's nose if you do that began stone i'll la screamed the captain before any mention could be made of courts don't you talk to me about law you signed on as doctor and you ain't one what's the law say to that a doctor he thumped the volume again and his descending paw tore loose one of its treasured pages johnson found this book in your duffel bag didn't you johnson and what's it about medicine no it's about how they built churches now then young fellow you go to jail ashore for a faker breaking the regulations governing ship's doctors or else you stay aboard of us without pay the guile of this tyrant was unworthy of its name his flagrant scheme was to punish dan and at the same time divert to his own pocket the medico's wages goldthwaite's right hand went up again its open palm thrust over the table caught stone across the face dan staggered back when in an instant sight returned he saw the captain in the act of wrenching the cover from the book there are not extant a dozen samples of the 1620 edition of Amares Lizarrago's monumental work on the cathedrals and churches of New Spain, and this copy was one of them. It was priceless in the old book market, but, poor as he was, Dan Stone would never have sold his copy. Along with a useless passion for the lesser phases of ecclesiastical architecture, and a hundred or two other old volumes that book formed the only legacy left him by the father he had loved the captain's last act was too much for dan he vaulted the table goldthwaite sprang back until the cabin wall stopped him he whipped out a pistol and fired one of stone's fists knocked up the weapon not an instant too soon the other drove itself into the captain's raging face almost at once the thing had happened johnson stood motionless 
so amazed at this marvel of resistance as to be unable to help a superior officer. Goldthwaite, on his part, was too dissipated a bully to stand punishment. His eyes started from their sockets. As if a painter's brush swept over them, his cheeks turned purple, his mouth screwed upward on one side like the mouth of a man in a fit, and he pitched over and fell his full length on the floor. You've murdered him. You'll swing for this. My God, you'll swing for it. Cross-eyed Johnson came to life with his declaration of Goldthwaite's leaving it. He sprang between Dan and the doorway. Stone gave one look at the captain's form. It was horribly still. He wheeled and with one sweep of his arm drove the mate aside. A steep flight of stairs ascended directly from the corridor. Dan plunged up them. He heard the cross-eyed man yell, heard the pounding of the mate's feet and gaining pursuit, but he reached the deck. There were sailors about. They looked up at the noise of his approach. Stop him, shrieked Johnson. Dan ran to the rail. He climbed it. He poised there one instant only. Then he flung his hands together above his head and dived over the side through the darkness toward the invisible sea. End of chapter 3《ハッピー・オブ・モニト・バーン》by Reginald Wright Kaufman。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 4 《The Beachcomber》Stone was a good swimmer. On this night of his plunge from the hawk, he needed all his strength and all of his art. It was with the speed of a St. Moritz toboggan that he struck the water a few yards beyond the ship's side. Down he went among the cool recesses and still down. His ears roared, his chest collapsed, yet there kept ringing in his consciousness those words which spurred his every muscle to escape. You'll swing for this, by God, you'll swing for it. Still down. He remembered, having heard that somewhere off Puerto Rico, Mount Everest itself could all but be submerged. He seemed to be plumbing a scarcely minor abyss. Nevertheless, there is a level at which seawater refuses the unprotected body of a human diver. He reached that at last, and from it was catapulted upward. Lights overhead, stars, lights directly in front of him, a town. He struck out for it. Blue parrotfish swam with him. He could not see them. Striped sergeant majors fled his approach, a cub shark followed him, and then turned tail. It turned tail because Dan found himself among breakers. He fought, he was tossed high, he believed he was lost, but the tide was with him in the underpool light. One great wave flung him landward, he lowered his feet, waist deep in the water he stood on comfortingly firm sands. He was penniless. The threat of the disgraceful gallows, or of an almost equally disgraceful prison term for manslaughter, overpowered him. The chances of capture were a hundred to one, and if he went free for the present, he might never show himself in his chosen profession. To do so would be to court attention. He thought of that even now. The career he had struggled so hard to make possible must be abandoned. As for any immediate course, he dared not enter the town, and yet he was too near exhaustion to go beyond it. He staggered down the damp darkness of the beach. Here, though the sky was illuminated overhead, the night was impenetrable. His right foot struck something that moved with a groan. He bounded aside, and his left kicked a body that swore cordially. The sands were full of derelict men seeking sleep. With a resignation that made him one of them, Dan sank down, at last more desirous of rest than of escape. The town's waterfront street was not a hundred yards away, and under its rare lamps he could see barefoot citizens parading with umbrellas raised against the supposedly evil effects of starshine. The heat of the day was gone, the air was chilly, and he was wet through. He burrowed into the sand. Look out there, don't crowd. Dan gasped an apology to the invisible neighbor whom he had discommoded. The fellow was evidently an American. 
There's plenty of room on San Lorenzo Sands, he grumbled. San Lorenzo? Dan had assumed that, during his interview in the cabin, the hawk had progressed toward her announced destination. This isn't Santo Domingo? The voice of his fellow beachcomber crackled a feeble laugh. What sort of rum do you drink? Of course it's Santo Domingo, but Santo Domingo City's clear across the island. And if you've just come to Hispaniola, why, take it from me, you've come to the nearest thing to hell this side of the real place. He dropped into a low monologue of anathemas. This was a land of fever and of sudden death. The towns were barbarous, the jungle savage. In the interior, human sacrifices established the reign of the worshipped snake. San Lorenzo saloons were outnumbered by the home forts of sorcerers. Neither Dan's silence nor the livid objections of other sleepy loafers discouraged the diatribe. If you don't take your hat off and say good day before you ask a negro for a job, he'll tell you he'll cut your heart out and drink your blood. And if you turn your back, he'll make good, too. And don't you get sick here. If you do, they'll call in a witch doctor. I had the Jim Jams last week. They took me to the municipal hospital. The cots are dirty mattresses on the floor, and the chickens walk over you. All they do for you is give you one mess of red beans and then let you die. He rumbled on. The oaths of the surrounding company ended in discouragement. Even Dan ceased to listen. Where was the pursuit? And what, if it failed, was he to do? It was barely conceivable that Johnson counted him drowned. But even if he was not sought, his plight was desperate. Small opportunity for a medical student in this isle of witchcraft, and for a medical student who, if recognized, would be arrested as a murderer. Ecclesiastical architecture? Dan smiled grimly at the darkness. In the little town where he had been brought up, that Pennsylvania Dutch lawyer who administered the Elder Stone's estate, comprising, as he thought, nothing save valueless books, had cautioned the heir. Your pop was the kindest-hearted man as ever lived, but he hadn't an eye for money yet. So if you want to get along, boy, keep your eyes off in print. And now, because of a printed book, Dan had incurred a capital charge. Despair propped wide his eyelids. He thought of his father, and of his father's high sense of honor. His father, who had had such hopes for his boy, such faith in his son's future. His father, who, though not himself successful in any worldly way, had given so much more than the worldly to young Dan. He could have wished that that book had never been given. Dawn came at last, or rather, full morning. Would capture a company yet? One minute, the waters were dark as at midnight. The next, and with the smell of seaweed at low tide, the silver gulls and long tails and silver spray flew above a sea of dancing gold. Dan's neighbor sat up, stretching and scratching, in every concluding stage of rascally vagabondage. Negroes from Haiti and Martinique, Frenchmen from Marseilles, outcast Britons dismissed by the Bahamas, Spanish, Portuguese, Italians, Levantines, and the New York wharf rat who had cursed Santo Domingo. The sweepings of fifty ports from Glasgow and Varna to Demerara and the Chagres. Over on the waterfront street, gaudily dressed mulatto women appeared, hands on swaying hips, baskets of green and yellow mangoes balanced on their turbaned heads. Through these, a tall, fat man in spotless white pushed his easy way. He led by the arm a shy and graceful girl and walked with magnificent unconcern straight among the riffraff of the beach. In those surroundings, the mere physical cleanliness of the newcomers shone like ice. The man's broad Panama was the largest Dan had ever seen. It surmounted a wide, dark face with eyes distinctly Latin, very bright and quick. Full lips smiled urbanely under a sweeping mustache, when not hidden by a plump hand, the nails of which strong teeth bit now and then, as if by some habit acquired in childhood and never overcome. To the wrist of this hand, a leather thong secured a malacca cane, 
and when the fingers were not at the mouth the stick was swung with utter carelessness of its frequent descent upon the backs of beachcombers scuttling like beetles before it dan had lounged away he addressed a fellow who might hail from caracas quien está el rico senor the south american shrugged he didn't know who the rich gentleman might be besides what difference could it make the rich were rich because they hung on to their money not because they peppered the sands with dominicanos it were better to inquire about the woman the derelict concluded with a look in reply to which dan's kick sent him sprawling the girl was a picture of dusky loveliness pure and pure spanish she slightly turned her ankle in the sands and the lace covering fell from her head and frightened face a face that one would say was merely peeping in at life's door and not liking what it saw there well enough to enter her glance met dan's she blushed and hurriedly replaced the mantilla an opening tea rose blown upon an ash heap stone felt the dust upon him he turned aside as he did so his eyes swept the bay san lorenzo boasted no docks the men of ships must come ashore in boats well there was the hawk and a longboat putting off from her the medical student wheeled again and found himself closely face to face with a man in white can you give me a job the startled question rose to his tongue at the thought that here might be a planter from the interior about to return thither and it proved well grounded it came instinctively in english but in english the large man at once smilingly replied this is a strange question and you do not look as if you belonged the speaker smiled down at the denizens of the foreshore as if you belonged here what sort of work do you want out of the corner of an eye dan studied the harbor he saw the hawk's boat hurrying to shore like a water spider any kind said he the panama shook a soft negative any kind is no kind i fear I could do most all sorts of unskilled labor. Stone extended a detaining hand. I'm a third-year medical student, but... He stopped short. He could have bitten out his tongue. Medical student. If he was to be sought by the police, that would be one of the first terms used to describe him. It should therefore be the last for him to employ. And yet, it was this very word of betrayal that caught the big man's attention. At mention of medicine, his smile passed. He was all interest. A doctor? The error had been made now. Dan might as well tell a part of the truth. Not quite, said he. But almost, yes? Why then, perhaps listen, senor. On my sugar plantation, the one man invaluable who truly understands the machinery is too ill to move. I am but now arrived, waiting that a doctor's office should open, but despairing that a medico should leave his practice for me. If you could prove yourself what you say, it would be worth to me anything, anything. The bright black eyes appraised the American rapidly. It would be worth to me one thousand dollars monthly. Besides, these two San Lorenzo doctors of course speak Spanish. I prefer a foreigner. There has been talk of peonage groundless most assuredly but still you do not know spanish the tone of the question plainly asked for a negative answer two hundred yards away the boat was landing no said dan desperately ah then if you could prove that you have sufficient knowledge of medicine you have papers that will no doubt substantiate the young american ran his hands through his unruly hair he spoke so fast that his words fell over one another's heels senor said he i can't i've no papers but didn't i tell you i was a third-year student tell you before i could guess what you wanted only get me away from here get me away from here quick he saw johnson stepping ashore evidently a hurried and fruitless search of the previous night was now to be renewed by day it must be made fruitless to the end i was a ship's doctor on that tramp out there i killed a man in a fight I give you my word it was an accident, but it looked bad, and they're after me. He put the stranger directly between him and the search party. He appealed to the girl. Senorita, you... The girl was watching him with wide-eyed fascination, 
but at his appeal to her she seemed to draw back and her hand made a gesture as if of dissent the planter interrupted quickly my niece does not speak english nevertheless you did indeed call yourself a medical student before i had spoken of a physician he looked over his shoulder and observed and understood the hustle at the boat walk slowly he concluded but ahead of us and in this direction opposite to your pursuers i think that i may be persuaded to engage your professional services End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 A Shadow at a Door. From San Lorenzo's waterfront, Dan paced slowly inland, the broad man in white shielding his retreat, one hand a grip of the veiled girl beside him. They skirted half the town. To the right now his smiling dark face bent forward and over the shorter dan he popped a cigar into the american's wonderingly open mouth and plumped his flamboyant panama on the american's head which was two sizes too small for it zo so, he said in a rich tone of self-congratulation at his foresight you must not attract too much attention but i may be a gentleman taking hatless the early air they turned into a street lined by tamarind trees. Barefoot mulattoes made way for them with the inherent courtesy that the Dominican always exhibits on a thoroughfare. In the middle distance, two soldiers in ragged blue lounged toward them. Stop! The stranger paused before a providential public surrey drawn by two humble horses. The negro driver glowed and saluted with his whip. Then he looked inquiry. To Sanchez, Stone's protector directed the Jehu, and double pay for double speed once we've turned the corner of the corniche. He lifted the girl into the front seat and overshadowed Dan in the rear. To the coffee house of Jose Logrono in the street of the pink turtle doves, and thereafter forget. The driver appeared used to such instructions. Without parley, he lashed his beasts, and Dan sank against the moth eaten cushions too weak and too grateful to be inquisitive. He saw the town recede on either hand. They turned beyond it into the shore road between the open water and a natural hedge of prickly pear and red cedar. The horses were lashed to a gallop. The crazy Surrey canopy swayed like a boat in a land swell. Dan saw the girl toss this way and that. She did not cry out, but she clutched the seat back with delicate fingers, the knuckles straining through their satin skin. The lady, he began, he had turned to find his benefactor's brilliant eyes steadily contemplating him. She will not be hurt. My niece understands our Domingan conveyances, as she understands other matters Domingan. Speak rather of yourself. I wish to hear more of your medical education. He used the calm of one accustomed to obedience. Talk of any sort was more of a physical feat than an intellectual amusement in that rattling carriage and Dan was never a man to consider himself an interesting topic. Nevertheless, the stranger's questions were pointed, and Stone managed to answer them. That his replies were satisfactory was evidenced by the Inquisitor's frequent nods of approval, and the long cross-examination was still in progress when they entered what Dan concluded must be the city of Sanchez. Slower here, the big man ordered. Speed would now have been, indeed, impossible. The streets were narrow and crooked, they were ill-paved and full of rotting refuse, and of a human rabble equally decayed. Gray palaces of the early sixteenth century were elbowed by modern huts in staring yellow or impertinent pink. On the ruined wall of a stately dwelling that must once have housed some Spanish hidalgo, there blazed the red and green poster of a music hall. Gambling hells and low saloons pressed upon squalid shops haphazard electric wires drooped dangerously from fragile poles bending under the weight of lolling loafers here said the planter with the manner of an apologetic host you see the worst of the republica dominicana it is the mixture of blood that affects this he drew himself up until his head nearly touched the carriage top i for my part am pure castilian whether from a lurch of the surrey or interest in her uncle's tone 
Dan saw that the head of the girl turned slightly, and against the farther edge of the black mantilla, he caught a glimpse of her pale, cameo-like profile. His new employer must also have noted the shift in her position. He added hastily, Oh, and all our family, to be sure, are of the Spanish blood only. My sainted wife, God rest her soul, and her deceased brother, the saints preserve him, who was my dear niece's father. Their ancestors were among the first to come to this island from old Spain and establish the plantation to which we now go. For any evidence in her expression, his niece might not have heard him. Dan was watching it when he recalled that her uncle had said that she did not understand English. Besides, as Vieta finished his brief genealogical statement, she again faced the horses. They were passing the neglected remains of a once splendid church. Dan's glance caressed it. His theoretical knowledge could date it almost to the day of its consecration. But his guide had evidently concluded that the time was come to repay some of Stone's personal information in kind. My name, said he in his silken voice, is Ramon Diego Vieta y Cortes. Unlike most persons of my caste in this country, I raise some herds of cattle. But, as I intimated to you, senor, I possess a large sugar plantation. Again, there was a movement from the seat forward, but this time the planter plainly ignored it. To that has come an order very big and very pressing. Well, then, at such a moment, my only engineer, he is taken ill. He has spasms, convulsions. He says that he has suffered this before. He says that it is what you doctors call uramic poisoning. Is this, Don Ramon smiled ingratiatingly, is this urgent? Dan tore his eyes from the church. Urgent? If he diagnoses his own case correctly, it's all that and then some. Vieta explained symptoms. He may be cured at once, said Dan, or he may be dead before we arrive. The Domingan shrugged. It is far into the interior that we must go. They were drawing toward the squalid outskirts of Sanchez. Don Ramon waved the driver to a series of inconspicuous streets and bade him reduce the pace and proceed more slowly still. You observe, he pursued to his guest, that I take you on faith. I have told you my name. What is yours? Dan Stone, the American gulped as he pronounced it. Daniel Gurney Stone. On the ship where you met with your little, let us say, accident, Vieta's broad shoulders shook the matter casually away. You had signed in that complete manner? No, simply D.G. Stone. I see. Well, now, a silly law makes it imperative that we register at the coffee house, because we shall be delayed there for a couple of hours. I suggest to you, senor, that it might be the part of wisdom to forget the surname temporarily. That would in no way be using a false name if the authorities should by the merest chance inquire. Just forgetfulness. My advice is that you call yourself Daniel Gurney. Dan said nothing. He did not like subterfuge, but he cared still less for the gallows or the jail. He would call himself anything the planter suggested. He had called himself a fool throughout the past night, and yet, though Vieta seemed the soul of frankness, Stone had some feeling of mistrust for him. The planter was plausible, but too ready to accept a runaway. However, here and now was no place or time for self-communion of such sort, for hesitation of any sort, whatever. Very good, sir, said Dan. They were climbing the narrowest and foulest of all the streets thus far encountered. The horses slipped on the slops, and the girl on the front seat pressed a lace handkerchief to her nose. Behind the red jalousies of doorways was the glimpse of already tired inhabitants. Dark children reached up brown hands for coppers. Don Ramon shooed them off with his jeweled fingers like so many flies. The tropics, he smiled at Dan, do not make for American hustle. Except for the engineer, my workmen are all natives. They also are tired like this. They mean no harm, but the siesta is consolatory. So, when they feel like taking it, they have the slightly awkward habit of suspending labor by throwing a stone into the machinery. That is why Tucker's health is so important to me. Ah, he exclaimed as the carriage stopped before a grimy white building that was just sleepily opening for the day. 
here is our present destination he paid the driver whose exultant gracias bore instant testimony to the size of the reward and again leading the veiled girl pushed dan before him into a small dark compartment set with tables and high-backed benches from among these an aproned host waiter appeared and bowed low in patent recognition jose said don ramon your parlor at once he clapped his fat hands i shall have to leave this american senor there for a short time and you will send coffee to him coffee two eggs a la coque some of your wife's delicious rolls butter honey yes and a bit of fresh fish if you have it he is very hungry there was something superbly authoritative about the domingan something that with radiant gesture swept aside all the superfluous he did not appear to miss the smallest details even in ordering a breakfast but it was plain that his was the sort of mind that prefers to deal in large things in a large way don ramon looked to dan even in this moment when reflection were absurd like the magnificent real estate operator or contractor who scorning the mere building of one house erects on an empty hillside an entire suburb of a great city the american was indeed very hungry and he was glad when the trio of them were obsequiously showed into a mouldy living-room on the floor above the girl at last released by don ramon seated herself in the darkest corner her mantilla still concealing her face dan at his employer's order forced his mind strictly to business and wrote out prescriptions for such medicines as he thought might be needed by his distant patient don ramon watched him biting his nails the while when the orders were completed i shall borrow your hat he said jovially and proceed on these errands he retook his panama with a flourish i shall buy you another head covering dr gurney oh and do not shudder at the appellation and i shall procure you an alpaca coat that will more or less fit rest here until i come back you are best not observed is it not so was the question put out of pure kindness or could there be just the hint of a warning in it vaguely connected with don ramon himself dan wondered he was beginning to wonder about a good many things involuntarily his eyes turned toward the shadowy figure of the girl he recalled in time that he had said he did not know spanish if only the senorita spoke english she said the time would pass all too rapidly in the company of your very charming niece he may have spoken with too obvious gallantry at any rate don ramon's hand went to his mustache mouth and the planter frowned uneasily the senorita gertruda requires a constitutional said he she will of course accompany me he bowed low to his niece she rose slowly and took his proffered arm her manner might well be slightly bewildered but it was oddly obedient to her uncle the planter however was all smiles he led the girl from the room humming blithely of an old domingan song my mistress is a lady a lady his lady she smiles her lord not looking and throws a rose to me well he couldn't mean his niece by that dan tried to forget her but over the edge of the departing mantilla a pair of slow black eyes had given him a glance that was almost an appeal and yet at the same time rebuff he walked toward the window and looked down through the half-open shutter held wide at its base by a stick this to let in the morning air before the sun should rise so high as to demand its barricade. Don Ramon was still audibly humming as he passed up the street with the girl on his arm, but the words of his song could no longer be distinguished. The Senorita Gertruda seemed in no hurry. Clearly the girl was unhappy about something. There were few other pedestrians in view, yet, as the pair below proceeded, Dan suddenly saw a shadow detach itself from a doorway opposite the coffee-house of the Street of the Pink Turtle Doves, and cautiously follow the Domingans. There could be no doubt as to its identity. It was the solitary passenger of the hawk, the American, Hoagland. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six in the Dark. 
two hot hours later vieta and his party were aboard the slipshod train that when so inclined and hurricanes permit strolls now and then between sanchez and concepcion de la vega the mantilla hidden girl package laden don ramon and dan suitably clothed and restored to some semblance of his proper self dan's eyes had swept the sanchez station for a renewed glimpse of hoagland and he breathed a sigh of relief when they could not find him nor had the passenger been anywhere in sight when vieta and his niece returned to jose's coffee-house and since the planter had seemingly chanced to elude his unsuspected stalker stone maintained silence concerning him don ramon dan finally reasoned appears to have arguments of his own for avoiding investigations if i tell him his association with me has been observed and has resulted in an attempt to follow him he may think better of his bargain and decide to leave me behind that is what stone's conscious self contended but there is in every man a self more subtle dan's subconsciousness remained unsatisfied regarding the very genial santo domingan some qualms at all events vieta on his part must have had when the train was delayed by an upturned switch just east of the terminus of la vega he ordered a premature descent lest so he said telegrams had advised the police there to be on the lookout for dan's arrival and the speed with which he conducted the exit of his party was worthy of admiration here the air was bracing though la vega lay on a flat savanna mountains rose not far away and one especially beautiful peak held the american's gaze ah yes his guide was instantly aware of his preoccupation our beautiful yaqui of the cordilleras del cibao myself i prefer the sierra de monte cristi and the dead volcanic north he made a wide gesture alas it is in the opposite direction that our path lies we must leave this exquisite city though it has for its beauty been called the love city of santo domingo we must go tediously through the dark country that striking acclivity yonder is the Cerro Santo, on which Signor Christopher Columbus, some four hundred and thirty years ago, placed one of his first great crosses in the New World. Now, turn to the left. But Dan fastened his fascinated gaze on the magnificent cathedral that shared with the holy hill dominion over the little city. There was a picture of this in the volume that Goldthwaite had destroyed. Among the bitter recollections such thought awakened, stone hardly noticed that once more they were threading by streets vieta's knowledge of these towns seemed inexhaustible and that they were proceeding to an inn where mules awaited them a broken-nosed carib in charge senor medico said don ramon this is my faithful and devoted luis in spanish he added to the indian is there any news the tone was suspiciously altered for the last words which received a negative reply from the indian but before dan could weigh this distinction an inquisitive landlord who did not appear to know vieta by sight began to question him don ramon after a moment's survey of the man became effusive in explanation we are bound for santo cerro to be sure for the sugar plantation of the illustrious senor juanito come luis let us start we must arrive at our destination before sundown they mounted the girl evidently friendly to her side saddle and with elaborate adieus trotted off santo cerro lay as a matter of fact toward the sierras the landlord watched the caravan set out in that direction it seemed doubtful to dan however if he saw them sharply turn at the next street to the left and proceed rapidly on to a road to the southwest it was market day la vega was gay with farmers and their families from the uplands men women and children creoles mulattoes in blue denim silk sashes and brilliant bodices high sombreros and crimson turbans any party leaving the town was a party after their own hearts the elders waved brown palms the youngsters toddled up and offered each cheek for kissing dan saw the senorita's lithe shoulders heave saw her bend to pat the curly head of a laughing boy he pressed his mount forward he knew not why and as her hand returned it brushed his now said don ramon immediately pushing between now you shall see the true santo domingo 
they made first for the plains and among the sources of the yaqui del norte with its miraculous waterfalls its rapids boiling over rocks of every brilliant shade luis headed the line the girl followed and vieta and dan where it was possible went abreast to bring up the rear the spirited planter never ceased a continual flow of conversation the rich tones of it warning roadside rodents and other minute animal life of the wilderness caused strange rustling escapes beside them the flapping retreats of brilliantly winged birds camouflaged until they were nearly within a hand's reach and contrasted oddly with the silence of the guide and the girl dan was suddenly aware that he had not yet heard the senorita gertruda's voice he discovered himself wondering what it would be like only once was the order of march shifted and the shift revealed that the indian lived in mortal terror of his master ramon interrupted some jovial description of local customs to urge his mount ahead with certain instructions for the guide the trail was overgrown and luis intent on picking it a bamboo stalk slipped from his protective grasp and brushed the castilian's swarthy cheek as if it were a thunderbolt that stock slew vieta's smile quita aya he cried and added a thumping oath es posible a moment ago lewis had looked anything but a coward now as he turned in his saddle stark terror stared from his eyes don ramon with a single blow knocked him clear of his mule and a yard into the thicket as quickly as it had come however the storm passed luis returned his face a tangle of thorn scratches to his ever advancing post and vieta resuming his smile as a man might pick up his hat came back to dan and continued his anecdote the girl rode on with bowed head and the american marveled at her stoicism no less than at his own self-control he was sure that the former arose from some mysterious fear of her uncle rather than from a tropical callousness the latter he dared not trace to its source. He vowed that if Vieta were in any way half so cruel to the girl as to the servant, he, Dan, would forcibly take up her cause. Then he laughed bitterly for his impulsiveness, and youthfully swore to himself he would never be impulsive again. Nor, with the passing of his brief shower of anger, did the planter exhibit the faintest need for further mistrust his smile was open and his luminous eyes kept turning toward stone in frank good nature within five minutes more it was next to impossible to believe him guilty of what all eyes had seen the pilgrims reached roads of sorts and before these ceased climbed along their dusty and uneven tracks now heavy vegetation steamed all about again appeared open spaces dotted by thatched and whitewashed huts and broken by tiny farms the first valleys were fragrant with a perfume of coffee blossoms grown in the shade of trees designed for the aromatic plants protections higher up these surrendered to maize and sweet potatoes and as the very heights approached to fields of millet finally the travellers dipped to the edge of the great jungle of the interior straight into this luis nosed an invisible way for more than two miles then out of an unexpected clearing rose the ruins of a forgotten castle its fallen masonry overgrown by rank weeds among which lizards darted to their holes and here the sudden sun flashed a farewell and sank the party was in total darkness and must so remain until moon and stars should achieve nocturnal brilliancy luis with the aid of a flash lamp made their preparations for the night out of the miraculous saddlebags he produced a score of necessities he slung hammocks from tree to tree he canopied them with nettings he built a fire and soon produced a supper the girl ate scantily alone and in the shadows don ramon proved a mighty trencherman and laughed through the meal commending its cook as if nothing but kindness and respect had ever passed between them dan decided he was puzzled simply because he was in the presence of customs entirely new to his thoroughly north american mind no bread don ramon smiled to dan we prefer millet and domingo but see these yams you do not have green plantain in the united states nor yet cassava roots he raised his eyes ecstatically 
think of christmas dinner without cassava pudding and our coffee your people possess no such coffee as ours his eyes answered the gleam of the campfire and he rubbed his hands so he breathed over a deftly rolled cigarette you will cure my friend tucker if we are in time stone reminded him of course if we are in time and who knows ramon genially continued we may even acquire on my plantation a little of what you call yellow jack to keep you amused we have many interesting diseases in domingo elephantiasis fevers the sleeping sickness which i think is mostly feigned oh you should have experience and despair when you leave us he rubbed his plump hands again when you leave us he repeated then added as if reflectively a thousand nice clean dollars a month yes yes and accidents too there are unfortunately occasionally little accidents where there is machinery he paused something sinister ran through all his joviality even as with one fat palm upraised and its outspread fingers bright with jewels he mirthfully requested better attention you hear that no dan nodded from far away there came the monotonous beating of a drum the palapois of blacks whose fathers crossed the hills from haiti vieta explained that is the first call to their rites of voodoo to the sound of this vesper summons the travellers sought their hammocks but sleep was tardy in its approach toward dan he thought over all the events that had led him to this dark resting place incidents of his earliest boyhood encroached on his consciousness hand-in-hand walks with his father years ago pictures of school days and college days his pursuit along a narrow straight path of respected success among his fellow townsmen he reviewed the horrors aboard the hawk with their ultimate and fatal climax and asked himself how he could have curbed his anger even if he had taken time to reflect he lay again on the damp sands rode again in the dangerously careening surrey and was once more in don jose's coffee-house looking down through the blinds at don ramon and his niece and the stealthily trailing figure of hoagland the hawk's passenger he shuddered but the shudder fled stone turned to the memory of a fallen mantilla and the soft gaze of frightened black eyes the tropic moon rose washing trees and vines in liquid emerald and with it rose all the night sounds of the west indian forest the whistling frogs barking as of wild dogs the buzz of insects and a guttural chorus which reminded the tossing stone of nothing so much as the cries of baboons heard on his single visit to the bronx zoo when he did sleep it was to waken with a start cold sweat was rolling into his wide eyes he brushed it away the bright moon was reinforced by the last glow of the fire directly above his head the mosquito netting bulged downward something that had not been there before something like a tree limb from one of the trunks supporting his hammock the limb swayed it fell clammy and slimy and heavy it fell and circling canopy and hammock the thick coils of the snake wrapped dan around and squeezed a shriek rang out not his own he saw in a green streak of moonlight the beautiful face of the girl distorted by terror dan had no chance to cry he was struggling with all his imprisoned strength at the horror that encircled him coming that was ramon's voice the huge man flung himself upon the monster the thing's flat head darted up and gaped at him with an exultant laugh the Eta ripped that head from its bloody body dan slept no more and all next day his unrefreshed physique was taxed by the party's continued penetration into the jungle it was one long push through trees and bushes bound together by wiry creepers under arches of lofty green orchids now lovely and now repulsive bloomed about them jasmine odors fanned their sweating cheeks stinging insects beclouded them and land crabs scuttled underfoot only the never-resting trade winds made it possible to endure not until the latest afternoon did they reach their journey's end they came upon a slatternly pueblo of adobe huts toiled wearily along a more or less modern road and halted before a high stone wall covered with cracking cement 
it was yellow and weedy and it stretched to the right and left until it disappeared in the renewed jungle ramon rode up to a thick nail-studded door and jangled a bell the door swung wide six half-clothed peons stood there waiting to welcome their master we are home at last said vieta senor medico consider all on my poor estate your own a strange arrival no shouts from the servants the only smile that upon don ramon's round face the half-savage peons drew aside while the cavalcade rode up a mile of neglected avenue the great palacio appeared beyond a curve on a hillock it was a double balconied rambling building of stone partly new but mostly very aged and colored a deep pink it rose before them from behind a semicircular clearing sprinkled none too artistically with sago palms hedges of hibiscus century plants and aloes in a marsh to their left a grove of mangroves steeped their roots in dank water where mosquitoes bred and between these and the house dan noticed with strange interest a deserted graveyard its flat tombs askew and broken its stones moss-covered and half hidden among rubber trees and melancholy vines something else however straight away caught his eyes it was a crumbling chapel that leaned against one side of the older portion of the palacio attached to the east wing and seeming on second glance to form part of the dwelling he could see that it was or had been a perfect example of the ecclesiastical architecture of new spain enthusiasm fired his voice that's a fine thing i must look that over one of these days don ramon turned sharply and then under the fixed but non-committal gaze of his niece as sharply turned away only an old chapel he said for the first time he addressed dan brusquely interesting only to me and to me only because my late wife's ancestors lie buried in it or about it he glanced rapidly toward the girl and inclined his great head slightly my wife's and to be sure my dear nieces toussaint's soldiers wrecked it when they drove the spaniards out of all the island and after the return it was never repaired the stone roof is dangerous a pair of my inquisitive peons my servants he quickly corrected were killed in the place as late as february therefore i have locked it up he eyed dan again he was smiling now but now his smile was different those prying servants their death was one of those things i thought of when i spoke to you of accidents you remember that i spoke to you of accidents last night dan met that smile wonderingly why yes very good i must ask that you do not venture near the old chapel signor medico and then into dan's mind there readvanced a question that had troubled him all the while he waited for don ramon at the coffee-house of jose lograno and sanchez a question that only the difficulties and dangers of the subsequent journey had banished why did this man offer such a salary to a third-year medical student turned beachcomber and wanted by the police for a thousand a month i'll bet he could have hired any two regular physicians in all haiti and santo domingo end of chapter six chapter seven of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven flying steel they came to a long flight of wide pink steps narrowing at the top and to the palacio's ancient doorway surmounted by a pure spanish fanlight while dan made sure of the medicines that had been brought two native servants who looked like cattlemen stepped from out of the shadows their machetes thrust in their belts made by twisting around their waists lariats that would easily support the weight of a man the peons leaped toward the tired mules and at a gesture from don ramon who did not otherwise greet them led the animals away in broken-nosed luis's company a mere word from her uncle and the girl with no phrase or glance of farewell hurried through the open door and disappeared down a vaulted hallway to stone vieta repeated the castilian form of welcome 
First of all, said Dan, condemning himself for not having thought more of the sick man, and now thoroughly intent on the saving of life, I'd like to see my patient. My dear fellow, Vieta put his brown, jeweled hand gently on the young man's shoulder. You must have refreshment. You must bathe and rest. There is no such haste after a two days journey. But I told you that he might be dead by now. Don Ramon's wide face shook in smiling dissent. You were too occupied to hear, but no, it is your wholly excusable ignorance of Spanish. My servants say he is not dead, not even a little. And now, he smiled deprecatingly, as if at stone's zeal, this so lucky patient must be made ready. In the twilight of the corridor, Dan had been trying to ascertain whether his medicines were intact. Not at all, he exclaimed. His professional manner, though young, would brook little interference. Here he must be his own master. The patient, he said decisively, needn't be made ready for his doctor, nor in the circumstances need his doctor be made ready for the patient. I've come a long way, and the man was very sick when I started. I wish to see him at once, if you please. Ramon murmured protestingly, Muy señor mío. From far down the hall, a raucous scream interrupted him in the Domingan cry for help. Socorro! 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 Something rushed through the dark air. A wing brushed Dan's startled face, and then, by the light from the still open door, he saw a green and yellow parrot settle on one of his host's broad shoulders and begin to peck in a sort of insolent affection at Vieta's swarthy cheek. Do not be alarmed, Don Ramon smiled. He put up a plump hand and stroked the bird with a kindness unmistakably genuine. This is only my best friend, Pedro. Pedro, this is the good American doctor who has come to cure Senor Tucker. And in Spanish he bade the bird speak to his guest and apologize for having startled him. Pedro cocked his head and glared at Dan with an evil eye. Lo siento, he squawked, but if he indeed knew what he was saying, his tone and expression belied the apology inherent in the words. Meanwhile, Vieta appeared to have been using this diversion as a cover to reconsider Dan's indubitably fixed demand. The young doctor could not understand the hesitation. So you must see your patients at once, Vieta repeated. At once, said Dan firmly. Don Ramon shrugged. You American doctors, he chaffed so impetuous but i think the results of your impetuosity justify themselves i have the utmost confidence in american doctors he had submitted dismissing pedro he led the way up broad stairs and then through the long and echoing corridor this portion of the building obviously the old portion seemed untenanted and yet dan had the sense of unseen presences once he thought he heard the patter of bare feet ahead, yet nobody was overtaken, nobody visible. Again, his ear was caught by what sounded like a woman's sob, but neither Ramon's niece nor any other woman came into view. So Vieta and his physician made a half-dozen turns, past rooms apparently deserted, and came to a narrow stone staircase up which they climbed to the very top of the house. As they mounted, Vieta talked genially as always, but in a voice that seemed gradually to rise, and was, Dan somehow suspected, meant to carry a warning of their approach. They now gained another hall, and here, at one closed door more, Vieta stopped. He spoke against the panel to someone behind it. It is the master, he said in Spanish. I bring a strange doctor, not the Sanchez medico, but an American. Was there the slightest sound from within? Dan could have sworn to one, yet when, after an instant's unnecessary pause, they entered, he observed no occupant save the sick man. That one, in a bare apartment under a high and narrow window, lay on a lofty old four-poster bed, tossing to and fro, his long fingers plucking at the sheet that covered him from feet to chin. His age was perhaps fifty-two or three, and the stiff hair on his head, as well as the stubble on his cheeks, was iron gray. In health, he must have been one of those gaunt New Englanders of the Massachusetts coast whose families used to recruit the whaling trade. 
intolerant men and hard but honest and brave who see small help for themselves or anybody else in a future world yet they live in this one a life of rectitude how fallen he might be from the estate of his forebears there was now no telling his face was purple his eyes feverishly aglare and his lips so stiffened as to emit only at rare intervals a low groan unconscious asked don ramon dan lifted an eyelid unconscious but you can bring him around vieta frowningly nodded his fingers now that he had admitted the physician he seemed to be in the utmost haste the work is of such importance and so immediate if you can bring him around for one week only stone got busy with an examination if he gets well for a week he gets well entirely i want hot water there must be a counter irritant tumblers spoons he looked about the all but empty room hot water bottles or cloths if you've nothing better i suppose there is no ice and i must know just how this man has been kept alive so far and why there is no one here to nurse him now there is or there just has been don ramon soothed i too i cannot understand the absence the nurse must have stepped out for something what has he been fed demanded dan i must have full details there was about all this too much the look of neglect to suit dan if the patient was to be cured there could be no longer any carelessness or inattention a nurse must be in constant attendance i am amazed that he left even for a moment said don ramon he looked really perplexed and dan softened a little the fact is don ramon said he that it is miraculous that this man is still alive if he is to continue to live i must have all the help i can get you shall you shall vieta with one eye on the unconscious man paced the sombre room he appeared to consider the advisability of confidences then seeing nothing in dan's eager young face to dissuade him he proceeded you thought perhaps that i seemed too much to realize the impossibility of great hurry at the start of our journey now having made the journey you should understand that i was but facing facts like a philosopher which i am it required nearly two days to go to sanchez and two to return it may be i had other errands of equally vital importance but those are completed i should say one of them is satisfactorily completed don ramon still pacing the floor looked the soul of honesty but now you are here i tell you truly senor josiah tucker is more important to me at present than anything else anybody else on my estate he looked anxiously at dan who all this time was attentively occupying himself with the man on the bed my dear fellow do everything in your power to save him then have me set at once the articles i called for your your servants he caught himself in time have you none that understands english vieta's eyelids flickered as if in self-questioning no he said none save my personal servant and he understands and speaks only incompletely but you shall have his services whenever possible and by all all your every gesture shall be obeyed he turned to the door i go now to have those articles brought to you when you have done all for the time possible inquire for the comedor that is to say the dining-room and do me the honor of joining me there for a poor supper he hesitated again tucker is quite unconscious is he not the ample planter's bulk filled the doorway he did not frown but he seemed in one final comprehensive regard to take note of the young doctor's straight youthful figure his straight blue eyes and above all his almost bristlingly straight tow-colored hair vieta's right hand had involuntarily sought his white teeth in momentary hesitation as the doctor corroborated his first examination then the hand lowered yes dan replied the patient is quite unconscious don ramon gave a great sigh he left the room only a few minutes later there came a knock at the door though dan hurried to open it he found no one there and yet his orders had been wonderfully fulfilled on the tiles of the passage stood everything of which he had need grumbling however at the lack of another's presence 
he set to work in the dual capacity of physician and nurse desperately he toiled over the man before him the crisis was apparently past the fever must be slowly abating the patient was nevertheless still a very ill man how he had lived until now stone could not divine the fellow must possess in remarkable degree the resistance of both a good constitution and a strong will however it was now clear that with proper care he would continue to live and that was the point of immediate import under his fellow countrymen's ministrations tucker gradually entered another state he began to move feebly the glassiness left his eyes and he passed directly from complete unconsciousness to semidelirium incoherent phrases tumbled from his lips now in spanish now in yankee speech dad did not try to catch their meaning nor at first would he have been able to for they were barely mumbled then all at once they became distinct ink this won't do it won't do ink ink i must have he half sat up he laid hold of the physician's muscular arm yes yes said dan a medical student true to type he had the habit of most doctors and all nurses who regard every sick man as either a baby or an idiot you shall have ink and a pen and paper too just as soon as you are a little better ah paper this had been an unfortunate suggestion it increased tucker's excitement that's it that's what i was trying to think of i can't wait any longer i must have it now the delicate fingers clutched at the air as if reaching for it paper 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 complete sentences followed but now utterly unintelligible stone explained to himself that his patient probably wanted to write home to wife or child or else that an unexpected letter from the states had failed to arrive something at all events was increasing the sick man's excitement to a dangerous degree it was becoming intense to the point of complete delirium he was tossing with such violence that unaided dan must soon become incapable of holding him there was a bell rope dan pulled it but heard no answering jangle he rushed to the door he uttered a few useless imprecations just in time he held back a summons in spanish he wished he had never told that lie about his ignorance of the language but now in his strongest voice he called in english for help he dreaded to leave his patient and yet he must have assistance he ran a few paces down the hall it was empty then not daring to remain longer absent he turned back the door had somehow closed behind him as he reached for the knob he was startled into momentary inactivity by a new sound from within it was the sound of a voice totally different from the new englanders it was thin and high-pitched it was unmistakably domingan with foul spurts of native dirtiness it was shrieking in the island patois you rabbit fool that are food for the snake you talk too much i told you to hold your tongue before the doctor i told you by the diamond of the toad but now you shall pay it was the strangest sort of phraseology dan's ears caught the general import of the words but he could hardly credit his hearing he flung wide the door and then he could hardly credit his eyes like nothing human like a black jungle cat like a devil a hideous form was kicking in the bed it knelt right upon the patient's chest and its long yellow claws were digging deeper and deeper into the sick man's throat dan leaped upon the creature and wrenched it off with loathing hands and rising hair he tossed it struggling and spitting into the farthest corner a dwarf hunchback with a twisted face panting from the exertion the doctor turned to the patient whose breath was stertorous then something warned him not to lose sight of the object in the corner and he wheeled again it was not a moment too soon across the room flew a vicious knife he dodged just in time the long blade buried itself a full two inches in the soft wood of the wainscoting not half a foot from his heart End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Chapter 8 A Fighting Chance At the same instant, Dan rushed the hunchback, and the hunchback leaped at Dan. The impact was terrific, but its advantage lay all with the dwarf. He had jumped directly for the oncoming head. Arms and legs tightened about Dan like the tentacles of an octopus, and fangs as if a dog snapped at his throat. The American, overcome by the speed and power of his opponent, staggered backward. Then heavy feet pounded on the flags of the corridor. Stone summons had been heard below. Don Ramon puffed into the room. Que? 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 He plucked the hunchback, like a lizard, from his perch and held him dangling by the collar of his ragged shirt. Pedro, the parrot, swaying lightly on his master's shoulder and by no means dislodged by that one's effort, regarded the situation with malign interest. K, 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 he raucously repeated. The patient was violent, panted Dan, his sleeves having worked up to his elbows and the muscles of his forearms showing angrily firm. I ran for help. This maniac must have been hiding under the bed. When I came back, he was strangling Tucker. I don't know what he is or where else he can come from, but will you kindly throw him out of this room? He turned his back resolutely on the dwarf and, hurrying to the sick man, rapidly assured himself that the hacienda's engineer was not desperately the worse. Fernando Peña, Vieta's voice was that of a bull. He spoke to the hunchback in the same dialect as that used by the hunchback himself, but the physician's ears, cocked to attention, missed nothing. How often have I told you that it is important he should live? Dan glanced over his shoulder. At Don Ramon's feet, the hunchback cringed, his talons that had thrown the murderous knife raised in trembling supplication. It was a frightfully distorted shape, clad only in his shirt and abbreviated trousers. The eyes burned under shaggy brows. From one high cheekbone, downward across the yellow face, ran a tallowy scar that drew the mouth up in a crooked and perpetual grin. The American turned from the sight with renewed distaste. He regretted with all his heart that he had ever had to come to this mysterious and violent hacienda. Even capture might have been less repulsive. Resuming his ministrations, he heard the deformed creature break into a torrent of pleading and defense. It was, in its unpunctuated velocity, a version of the island patois that, to be wholly understood, would have required Stone's undivided attention but he made out readily enough that Pina sought to justify his recent actions through some obscure fear, and woven into every second phrase was the shrill cry, Tucker talks, Tucker talks, Tucker talks. He was only... Dan had been about to repeat in confutation what the patient had said. When he had impulsively pretended his ignorance of Spanish, he merely regretted the necessity for the lie. Now, willy-nilly, he must hold to that lie as long as he remained under this roof. Something, some undefined attitude on the part of the inhabitants, if nothing else, had driven him to the conclusion that any admission of a knowledge of Spanish would entail real danger. Vieta was, moreover, already in the act of translating, glibly and falsely. My personal servant, he smiled apologetically, and his voice was soft and smooth again, this Fernando Pina says that Signor Tucker became violent, and he, trying to hold him, was so attacked by you, who of course misunderstood his intent, that he somewhat lost his temper. He is sorry. Dan had done his best for the patient. He gave Don Ramon his full face, and made it as much a mask as he was able in the circumstances to do. As his clear blue eyes stared into the complacent features turned toward him, he decided it would be healthy to continue to assume the mask, however difficult for his naturally tell-tale countenance. I see, he said, but his lips drew tight in spite of himself. The little matter of the knife had not been mentioned. Well, Tucker didn't need any such excessive attention. It is unfortunate, besides, because it may retard, if not actually prevent his recovery. He had excited himself by repeating certain words— Don Ramon nibbled at his nails. He raised his brows. What words? Do you recall them, Senor Medico? 
oh it was just delirium something or other about paper and ink i think he must have expected a letter or else he probably wanted to write home about his illness was there a quick intake of breath dan glanced toward tucker but though the sick man moved restlessly from side to side he was breathing almost normally now the huge planter and the gargoyle dwarf stood as still as statues words of that sort from a man in this condition dan continued and he was glad he could make his voice sound professionally disinterested hardly ever mean much though they sometimes indicate obsessions our main job now is to give tucker rest and quiet and not let this man of yours try any more stunts in what you call a mere fit of temper there there said don ramon waving a persuasive hand on which the jewels glittered it will all go well henceforth fernando will be more careful i can assure you he is perhaps a little excitable the poor fellow's temperament is tropical it is no worse than that there is no better husband on the island no gentler husband despite his medical studies dan shuddered at that mystery of the human heart which could win such a creature as pena a wife Stone was the last man willfully to hurt a deformed being by any exhibition of his horror for deformity, and yet he involuntarily began to frame an impulsive query. Do you mean to say? Fernando, declared Don Ramon, has a handsome spouse living just beyond the village, and she is as fond of him as he is fond of her and good to her. Now do please tell me of your patient's general condition. That is our vital concern, is it not so? he can live if he's given half a chance dan grudgingly admitted he shall be given it he shall be and now said the planter soothingly why not administer him a draught to quiet him do and let us all descend and sup my own meal was interrupted and i am famished you say that my dear tucker requires quiet give it to him you can leave him safely now i will send luis to stay here and report to us any change come we shall all feel more at peace with the world for eating. The physician gave a final, thoughtful survey of his patient. There was some truth in what Ramon said. Dan agreed to his suggestion. And now, said Vieta, softly rubbing satisfied palms together once he had got his way, the quarrel will be healed. Fernando, he ordered, you will shake hands without delay with the Signor Medico. It is the custom of North America. The hunchback slunk forward without protest, and, in movement like a recalcitrant child who has agreed to kiss and make up, put out the long and bony hand that had so lately sought to kill the man to whom it was now offered. The resemblance was only in movement. There was nothing of childish innocence in Fernando's look. Vieta was facing Dan, so that Pina's malformed back was presented to him. He could not see his servant's face, but Dan saw mingled with a fellow's smile of repentance was an expression of concentrated malignity it was with cold and evil boding fingers that stone returned the hand clasp don ramon led the way out and dan followed over his shoulder he saw the hunchback dart to the wall drag out the murderous knife and sheathe it before leaving the room as the american continued on his way he realized that nothing but the fear of arrest held him within the hacienda nothing except that and the still unexplained appeal he had caught from a girl's limpid eyes the dining room was a vast and shadowy apartment lighted only by a single pair of candelabra on its big mahogany table two covers were laid and one of these proclaimed vieta's recent interruption dan's mind again flew to the girl the senorita he began eats always alone said don ramon it is a custom among the ladies of our country when there are strangers in the house strangers they had made that long journey together she had slept last night in a hammock not five yards from his own her cry had saved his life dan mentally refuted don ramon's definition it was true that stone had not exchanged one audible word with her that once only had he fully seen her face that with all her look of appeal there had been something in that very glance which bade him retreat her voice unless that muffled sob he had fancied on his first trip through the corridors was hers he had heard only once 
and then in an unrecognizable shriek of terrified warning yet the warning had been for him alone and she might now have been sitting at his side so completely did the thought of her dominate him present she had impressed him deeply absent he found her more potent still it was a giant's meal anguillas y queso royal eels and grated cheese very strong a mixture of rice and beans sweet potatoes and bananas the flavor of garlic and the bite of pepper were not to dan simpler taste and the frying in olive oil was perhaps over rich but of its style the cooking was notably good and the wines had quite evidently been raised from a cellar musty and cobwebbed with age everything was suggestive of good living for the master everything in sharp contrast to the ill-favored and dour retainers dan's recent enemy Vina, waited on the diners in a silence that was too soft-footed now he was at don ramon's elbow now at stones appearing like a jinni summoned from the shadows changing as he altered his distance not once throughout vieta's jokes and chatter was dan able to dispossess his mind of the hunchback's proximity outwardly no one could have been more genially frank than the master of this house with the brightly colored birds snatching tidbits from between his teeth yet mystery of a far from alluring sort lurked in every dim corner of the palacio you must take a look around my little estate in the morning don ramon smiled across the stretch of napery and candlelight it is something that must seem novel to north americans dan was about to make a polite response when he saw the face of fernando pina grinningly mirrored in the silver plate before him the tropical fruits out there in my gardens vieta lavishly ran on bananas breadfruit oranges tangerines you will be free to help yourself to them everything is yours yet in that instant fernando's gnarled hand moving around his master and placing a heaping dish of twice roasted tortillas before him reminded the american of how short a time ago it had attempted his life but the chapel you noted don ramon continued almost parenthetically that alone as i have said i must forbid you to enter for some antiquary it might be a thing of beauty to be sure but of a dangerous and deadly beauty too none can venture there safely and so he pushed a large forkful of the tortillas between his protruding lips i have given explicit orders i wish no more deaths on my hands too bad it's in such poor condition commented dan intrigued into momentary enthusiasm by the mention of the crumbling edifice now architecturally it is he was startled into silence by the drop of hot coffee which was spilled on his wrist pina again yes yes one day i shall have it restored but until then don ramon sighed and closed the subject abruptly he launched forth on a dissertation of the countryside's flowers and the high coloring of its birds at last the long meal concluded vieta clapping his fleshy hands addressed his servant ordered him to conduct dan to his bedchamber and himself bade the american an elaborate good night it had been an unpardonable discourtesy he declared to keep his guest up so late when he must be so weary the guest however could have wished for another guide though the hunchback's manner had completely altered with new orders he was servile and smiling as his grotesque form partly lighted by the candle he bore high above his head an apy shadow of it cast on the paving he led the way upstairs i'll give my patient a bedtime visit first said dan it annoyed him that he dared not address the hunchback directly in spanish when the man had such an imperfect knowledge of stone's native tongue but he managed to make his desire clear his guides silently reversed their course luis was in the sick-room when they entered it the carib gloomily reported no change arrived at tucker's side however dan saw that delirium and fever had both disappeared he spoke to the patient in a cheery american voice remarked that the gray stubble of his beard might even be shaved off in the morning and suggested as a spur to renewed interest in things mundane an increasingly tempting diet at first only tucker's eyes answered 
Dan leaned over the bed to time the pulse, and then realized that Tucker was trying to whisper something. Could the delirium be returning? Stone leaned closer. The whispering ceased. He moved just a little aside. Pena was peering under his arm, straight into the patient's eyes. There was no use in protest now. Pretending to have noticed nothing and postponing action of any sort in the matter until tomorrow, Dan bade Tucker good night. He promised to call early in the morning and nodded to the patient a reassurance that he himself unaccountably doubted. Then he almost unwillingly gave Fernando instructions as to the medicines he left, listening while they were translated, accurately, to Luis for fulfillment. Again following the grotesque hunchback and the flickering candle, Dan descended the staircase and passed through corridor after twisting corridor. They started to mount again. Look here, he objected. I ought to be nearer Senor Tucker. Suppose I was needed quickly. Why, I couldn't even find my way. Master order, Pina continued imperturbably onward. Finally, he stopped before a thick door, which he pushed slowly open. Here's Senor Medical Room, said he. It was a large chamber, heavily curtained in spite of its tropical setting. Pina pointed out, in the long yellowy shadows cast by the candle, its canopied four-poster bed in one gloomy corner, the tall mahogany wardrobe actually appearing short beneath the high ceiling, the high boy, the washstand, the two closely shuttered windows. There was no bell. Bring anything, grinned the servant. Dan hated that grin. Not tonight, thank you, but I'll want shaving water in the morning. At eight, Senor Medico? Better make it seven thirty. But no, on second thought, I'll call for it. As Senor Medico wish, the hunchback lighted a bedroom candle and, bowing derisively in the shadows, backed obsequiously away. Alone, Dan looked the great apartment over. He walked to a window and, pushing wide its shutter, gazed out at a night heavy with luminous stars. In opening that barricade, he had loosed the full sound of jungle cries and whistlings, the yammering of farm dogs, the languorous sense of the tropical dark. Leaning far over the sill, tracing the uneven outline of the palacio, he could just discern the shape of the forbidden chapel at the farther extremity. His imagination was free at last. Spectres might tread the corridors of this strange mansion, but he was no longer haunted by them. He was even too tired to care about them. Instead, he let his mind turn to the lovely face which haunted him far more agreeably. He wondered where the girl slept. He wondered, too, if she slept. Somehow his heart ached for her in a curious pity. He noted that his room, like his patient's, was high up in the building, and that there was a sheer drop of fifty feet to the ground. Weariness overcame him. He prepared for bed and climbed in. There was no use in brooding now over the past or the present. Sleep was ready on his pillow. From it, he wakened to an odd, regular beating sound. The night was at its blackest, but the sound was that of reiterate motion, the unmistakable working of machinery. Turning over lazily, he told himself that this was doubtless the effect of that pressing order of which Ramon had spoken. Dan did not waken again until the full glare of the morning, when the chatter of innumerable birds made him sit bolt upright. It was only a few minutes after six, but the tropics were broad awake. Out of the window he had opened the night before, he looked now, standing in his bare feet, on a scene of wild beauty. He could see, under the blue dome of the sky, a complete semicircle of the walled estate. Here, some small grazing fields for cattle, there, woodland or acres of tobacco, and all about the house, just beyond the palm-sprinkled patio, the untidy banana trees, fields and fields of them. Recollection of Vieta's easy explanation of his kind of estate assailed him. He was perplexed. With painstaking eyes, he studied the landscape again. Coca trees, coconuts, patches of what looked like melons, the mangroves steeping their roots in the graveyard swamp. Everything belonging to the tropics seemed to grow within the heterogeneous hacienda. Everything, that is, but sugar cane. 
well a man must shave anyhow stone gave an eager moment to study the exquisite but dangerous chapel then still in his bare feet he crossed the room to call for water as he drew the knob swiftly inward the deformed figure of fernando pina toppled into the room end of chapter eight chapter nine money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the hunchback's eyes face to face with the unexpected physical action is man's first impulse the art of attack and defense is merely the highly specialized expression of a primal instinct and the yorkshireman's philosophy is of primitive soundness a word and a blow but the blow first dan's arm was quicker than his tongue but he drew it back just before striking what are you doing at my door he demanded intense malignity had been again written on the dwarf's face in the instant of falling into the bedroom now his expression became servile his eyes were dull and humble as he answered senor medico wake up fernando pino hear him move come to ask if shaving water i said i'd call senor medico want shaving water i'll shave after a while were you outside this door all night but no but no Pina shook his head in honest denial. Not when Senor Medico sleep. So I don't need to be watched when I'm asleep. Well, there's some comfort in that. I'll go and see my patient as soon as I can jump into a few clothes. Can you tell me what sort of night he had? The hunchback seemed well informed of the doings of the house. He did not hesitate to admit and impart his knowledge of the patient. Senor Tucker toss, see toss, but he not dead yet i see dan scrutinized the man there was plainly no particular desire in the fellow's mind that tucker should live though his devotion to his master would probably henceforth keep his temper in place it was dan reflected a dangerous sort of temper to maintain at too close quarters all through the devious passageways he watched for means of identifying the route he did not wish this spying attendance Another time, he thought, he might be able to find the patient without aid, although he was certain that once Pina doubled in order to befog him. What might possibly be the purpose of this circuitous procedure Dan did not then attempt to guess. It was enough that they reached the sick chamber at last. Tucker, in his high bed, was now deserted by Luis. He seemed destined to be deserted by his nurses, but pain also had clearly left him. He was thin, Dan noted, not altogether from the severity of illness, and his cheekbones stood out high and narrow. His chin was pointed, and his lips a-tremble. The mouth, Dan called either weak or sullen, or both, and the eyes of an unblinking pale gray were not prepossessing. These things, and one more, showing plain now in the glare of the tropic day outside the sheet lay two white inert hands the tips of all except the little fingers somewhat stained but the hands themselves delicate and slim they were not the sort one would expect in a mechanical engineer on a sugar estate and yet they were hands that obviously were constantly used and with skill how were you feeling this morning mr tucker dan smiled with professional cheerfulness which however did not altogether succeed in concealing his extreme youth somehow he could not feel wholly sympathetic toward this man but tucker was ill and neglected and stone meant to do his duty in any event and acquit himself honorably of his debt to his employer the man nodded slightly it was as if he could not or dared not speak the doctor bustled among his medicines where pena was beside him with ostentatious help then with a quick resolve of meeting guile with guile dan addressed the servant fernando said he peering into a pitcher this water is full of ants run downstairs and get me some fresh to his amazement the dwarf stared up dully but steadily in refusal no they looked full at each other in a moment's contest of wills if dan could not overcome the servant's antipathy to him he must take a final course Pena was too important a member of the household for him not to realize that, 
and however much don ramon might order him to be friendly the hunchback would remain lord of his own sentiments he appeared to be lord of his own actions as well if you don't follow the doctor's orders said dan slowly this man may die shall i tell don ramon that that's what you want fernando spat dan's anger rose you bring me the fresh water at once or i will throw up the case i go i go pena had acknowledged momentary loss but it was not dan it was only the dwarf's fear of displeasing ramon that had conquered him dan watched him shaking his shaggy head and mumbling all the length of the room make the turn at the door waited until the soft footfalls no longer sounded then hurried back to his patient and leaned over him now said he quick tell me what you were trying to say last night tucker's weak eyes were pathetic but traveled doubtfully from the doctor toward the doorway which however was hidden by the high foot of his bed don't worry he's gone dan hastened to give reassurance but either from fear or prudence the sick man now gazing fixedly at the ceiling would utter no sound his lips began to shape themselves into unvocalized words dan watched puzzled not the least whisper came and he could only rely on his sight alone for interpretation it was only after considerable repetition that he made out bit by bit they want to get rid of me but they daren't do it just yet they need me a little longer look out for yourself doctor i can see you're not one of them but here the patient's face showed the distress of desperation for god's sake get me away i made only one mistake i put out only one of our printings that paper maker he needed money and i gave him but what does that matter get me away get me away there was no delirium here however mystifying the phrases at last the younger man's sympathy was aroused he heard himself thoughtlessly reply in spoken words of all the damnable the fresh water senor their servile tones were at his very elbow the hunchback stood there his thick lips grinning his manner deliberately obsequious as he proffered another pitcher dan seized it he looked down into the dull eyes of the servant which though telling nothing nevertheless always held a challenge pitcher little way down hall senor said pena luis may be fill him he all ready in hall no ants now nice fresh water dan glanced quickly back toward the bed josiah tucker had closed his eyes beneath an excessive pallor he looked exhausted and hopeless but pena's expression as dan turned back was one of rage fighting against crafty repression how much had the hunchback observed he was just tall enough to see the moving mouth had he arrived only when dan spoke aloud or had he been silently standing there concealed by stone's back peeping beneath his elbow during the difficult moments of translation and in the latter case had he too been able to read the lips of the helpless tucker or merely attending had he correctly guessed their import end of chapter nine chapter ten money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten two million dollars silent and doubtful dan concluded his early morning duties to his patient and was conducted back to his vast bedchamber he prepared for breakfast fernando kept disconcertingly close while he finished dressing hot water senor medico your socks here senor medico here senor medico coat pina too small to help on the creature tried stone's nerves almost beyond endurance if dan did not see him directly he was forever catching his distorted reflection in a long mirror at the end of the room mystery breathed through the entire hacienda the forsaken graveyard half buried in marsh seemed alive with it the very stones of the chapel whispered of it there had been danger and to spare on the waterfront of san lorenzo but the danger of the gallows seemed because it was more tangible almost less ominous than the secret perils of this house of empty passageways set within the strange walled estate and guarded by peons 
That was the right name for them, who were equally terrified and terrifying. And then there was that girl. Was it merely shyness, as he had first supposed, that made her footsteps lag on the sands where he originally saw her? What had she been doing in San Lorenzo with an uncle who did not let her share his table when strangers were about, and who held her arm securely when she walked in public? Was he protecting her against invisible harms, and did she live in some impending danger that made her prefer this protection? Dan wished he had managed to talk with her and find out her trouble. Perhaps when Don Ramon came to trust him more, the planter would confide in him. Perhaps the trouble hung over the pair of them, and Vietta only simulated his cheerfulness. And the sick man, Tucker. Save a fellow American? Of course. But from what? From the same danger, it was to be guessed, that threatened the others. If so, Stone could find out just what it was, find out from his patient, on his next professional visit. After that, rescue, rescue if possible, for who was Dan, himself a fugitive, to be of any genuine help to anybody desirous of escape? He descended to the ground floor gloomily, yet there the bright morning sunlight, temporarily at least, dispersed some portion of his dejection. Don Ramon, resplendent in fresh white, was waiting here, his vivid parrot Pedro seated on his shoulder, and, reaching a gray bill forward, pecking at the full lips under his master's mustache. The breakfast table was laden with bowls of gay flowers and torrid zone fruits. Steaming coffee was brewing in a brass, alcohol-heated percolator, and Don Ramon, who was dressed for a journey in spite of the color of his raiment, at once hurried forward to greet his guest. His manner was the most radiant in the world. It gave every appearance of being spontaneous and inherent. He scattered good health and good nature and waved Dan with a genial smile and the flash of his never-absent rings to his seat at the table. You slept soundly, yes? Thank you, said Dan. He thought again of the machinery heard at night, then, glancing at his host, wondered if his own doubts were not the morbid results of his experiences aboard the Hawk. And you? he asked. I never sleep badly. That is what it is, said Don Ramon to have a clear conscience of a babe. And the Dan hesitated ever so little and knew that he blushed a great deal, but he brought it out with a sort of dogged determination. And the senorita, your niece, she enjoyed a good rest too? My good friend, what could there be upon the conscience of a properly brought up young girl? Tell me of your patience. Dan had something to say about that. But the moment when Pena reached up a plate to him seemed not particularly auspicious. He reported in general terms. Excused from the sick room, Luis assisted the hunchback this morning, the doctor anxiously wondering if his patient now had any attended at all. Nevertheless, Dan settled himself with no outward sign of protest, and with a thoroughly normal appetite, to eating. The breakfast was, unlike the breakfast of most continentals and those of continental origin, an elaborate affair. Rashers of bacon, broiled fish, eggs baked with green and red peppers, heaps of sweet tortillas as on the night before. There was nothing wrong with the appetite of the master of the house. Don Ramon's mouth was always open for more, though between tossings of food to the greedy parrot swaying on the table beside his plate, he talked as volubly as ever. I regret excessively that I must leave you to your own devices today, he said in his soft voice, with a polite bow and a smile that lighted his big round face. Socorro, socorro, squawked Pedro, and Dan looked up as the bird interrupted with startled blue eyes. But, continued his master, stroking the parrot, when you were not completing the cure of our unfortunate Signor Tucker, you may look about the estate or read. I have quantities of books, English, among the collections many American novels of the sort that one of your several societies formed to suppress something or other has succeeded in suppressing, so that you may not have seen them. You would like to look them over? Mostly they are very stupid and mostly they are poorly written. When a book is stupid and poorly written, those quaint societies seem to think it is also evil and I am inclined to believe they are right. 
Dan was not sure that he cared for these volumes. Well, amuse yourself at any rate. It is some distance I must go to meet some freight that I expect to be conveyed from San Lorenzo. I must meet it part way, at a transfer. Regressari a la siete, I beg your pardon. I shall return at seven or thereabouts. I shall be happy to receive a good report of Signor Tucker this evening. Dan, his patient heavily on his mind, tried to find a moment unsupervised by Pina, but time pressing and the master of the Palacio being on the very point of leaving, he was finally forced to speak, if at all, before the hunchback. Don Ramon, said he, there's a favor I want you to do for me. Whether from something in Dan's tone or for reasons better known to himself alone, Vieta's eyes narrowed, but his smile was in his final answer. A favor? Whatever it may be, rest assured that it is granted. Dan was by no means sure of that. I had hoped, he said, to have a chance to speak of it to you in private. Well, well? Vieta seemed restless for elucidation. His already closely bitten fingernails were being impatiently nibbled toward the quick. Dan, who had previously observed this only as a sort of mark of identification, found himself now codifying the habit as a nervous affectation, subtly correlative of the mystery of the house. You want Tucker back at his work as soon as possible, don't you? He nevertheless continued. Of a truth, yes. Peña was hovering over them. He was unconcealedly listening. Well, my patient, Dan continued, is being retarded in his recovery by a sick man's hallucination. He has a foolish fear of Fernando, this servant of yours. Unless relieved of that attendance, I frankly can't guarantee recovery. Stone felt, rather than saw, the dark look that swept over the dwarf's features, but Don Ramon burst into a great boisterous laugh, and while a parrot raucously echoed him, tapped Stone's arm with his fat, jeweled fingers. My dear Signor Medico, this is very foolish. You, as a physician, however immature, I beg your pardon, should not hold my poor servant's misfortune against him. I don't. I am speaking for my patient. The American felt his face unaccountably flushing. But Signor Tucker understands the temperament of my innocent Fernando. Sick men have violent fancies, Don Ramon. Dan insisted. Then, said Ramon with sudden sharpness, when they are nonsense they should be overcome, or they may grow to mania. There is altogether too much of this yielding to sick men's fancies by silly, abnormally sympathetic physicians. Ha! Ah, one would think their medical training would harden them. But I believe they're all as soft as Pena's wife or as this overripe mango. He carelessly spat the yellow pulp from his mouth. Then he leaned confidentially toward Dan and jogged the young man's arms. My dear fellow, said he, I really had more faith in an American doctor, even in one of your record. Why, ask Senora Pena. She will tell you that Fernando is as harmless as a lamb. Perhaps. Dan was determined not to let his own personal predicament influence his professional obligations. But I myself don't like his constant companionship. It's quite unnecessary, and it's got nothing to do with his misfortune. I simply can't have anybody, anybody, dogging my heels the way this man does. I've never had a valet de chambre to wash my face and brush my teeth for me, and I don't need one now. What's more, I won't stand for it. His tone was incisive, his purpose firm. After the peon's impudence in the sick chamber and Tucker's appeal for rescue, he was resolved to be rid of Fernando at all hazards. Vieta's swift glance read the decision, and the planter shrugged and submitted. Out of one corner of his mouth, de nada, no es nada, he whispered to Peña, but the next instant he addressed Dan. Of course, if the matter is personal to you, why, you are my guest, and you shall have your wish. Did I not tell you, before you expressed it, that your wish would be granted? He turned back to the brooding Pina, but now he spoke in English, and no longer in a whisper. You hear the Signor Medico. If Signor Tucker cannot recover with you in attendance, you must completely surrender your position to Luis. Luis will therefore attend to both the sick American and the well American, and will do no more duties in the dining room for the present. But, and he faced Dan again, 
you will have to transmit all orders through fernando because luis knows no english over his shoulder don ramon ascertained that the broken-nosed carib had left the room he added softly to fernando with a leer that dan's sharpened eyes did not miss no durará mucho there was nothing much in that of itself it will not last long but pina's reply was more explicit and seemed to involve his master as well as himself in its implications he too made certain that luis was still absent then he burst forth in a torrent of spanish that he never dreamed the american would understand this is all a trick my master watch these americanos we have enough why go to so much pains to get him well for a week muerte el traidor let me kill the sick man now plenty of time for that said the planter placatingly his smile never deserted him and his voice was as soft as if he were speaking to a querulous child dan bent his head low above his plate in order to hide the growing horror of his face he could not believe what he heard but ramon added emphatically and still in spanish to the dwarf the extra paper comes today why stop short of our two million dollars the parrot pedro had hopped to one of the planter's shoulders its bright green head impudently on one side muerte el traidor muerte el traidor it shrieked and shrieking glared with horrible innuendo at the young american End of chapter 10chapter eleven of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven footsteps dan's face as he finally raised it was impassive but he had been enabled to paint impassivity there only because of the danger that dangled he now felt sure everywhere about him the hacienda was haunted but most of its ghosts were alive and the worst of them all was some evil purpose of that one the patient upstairs lay in desperate fear it terrorized the lower servants the hunchback was driven to ungovernable actions on its account even don ramon scrawled his knowledge of it across the walls of his daily life what for she could not be guilty of a part in it what was it doing to the vanished girl Dan meant to act, but before he acted, he would put one question to the planter. Meanwhile, and before interruption was possible, Don Ramon, elaborately jocular and smilingly mendacious, pretended to translate the hunchback's remark. Fernando is so sensitive, Vieta apologized. He has an intricate and delicate soul. Oh, in spite of his poor distorted shape and though he wishes as he says to oblige the signor medico he so appreciated the honor of his position as guardian angel to our poor patient that you have much hurt his feelings pina with a glare at this translation the gist of which he plainly understood left the room he sent luis the broken-nosed indian back in his place but continued don ramon thumping his chest and marking the transfer of servants merely with a lowering of his eyelids i i alone am master in my hacienda my orders shall be obeyed anything for the good of my workingmen that is my motto his broad white teeth showed in a radiant smile dan wanted to hit him but all he said was i see and by the way where do you grow your sugar cane sir Ramon regarded him through quickly narrowed eyes. Ah, said he, you know sugar cane? And you have already so early been exploring my estate? Dan ignored the first question. No, he answered. I haven't been exploring your estate, but I happened to look out of my window this morning, and I couldn't see any cane. It's your main product. I wondered where you kept it. Don Ramon's parrot seemed to catch and hold Stone's eye. It stared unblinkingly at the American with a glassy vindictiveness that could not be doubted. Dan wondered if, by some obscure sympathy, the bird reflected his master's feelings. There appeared to be an odd understanding between the pair. Almost there was a threat in Pedro's beady gaze. With a slight tremor, Stone looked from the brilliantly feathered creature to its master. 
Vieta's head bent above his parrot now as he stroked its plumage. The voice in which he replied to his vis-a-vis -vis was suave and unsuspicious. You would hardly be able to see the cane from your window, my friend. We grow it on an outlying farm. But your work, Dan wavered between doubt and belief. He was determined to pin the man down. That is here, isn't it, Don Ramon? The mechanical part of it? How so, my friend? The young doctor raised a puzzled face. Well, said he, last night I was sure I heard machinery. Vieta leaned forward over the table, pushing a bowl of goldfish from between him and Dan. I must sooner or later explain a small matter, said he in his honeyed and most confidential tone. My business is a little, well, secret. Dan said to himself, now we're getting down to cases. To speak frankly, the planter softly elaborated, the Santo Domingan government places an exorbitant export duty on my product, so that I find it expedient to minimize, for my reports to them, its quantity. Add to this the import duty in the United States, and without some petty subterfuge I simply could not compete. I should be a ruined man. He spread out his fat hands as if in helplessness. Pedro sympathetically cocked his head and blinked into space. Bootlegging is perhaps of the same general nature, though what your countrymen call low grade, quite low grade. I must confess it is more profitable, and like all laws made by the powerful few, morally illegal. Personally, I am above such practice, however, just as I should not risk my excellent digestion with your famous home brew. Legitimate business is another matter. The United States has no power to keep me from earning a reasonable living. He smiled sardonically, and his thick eyebrows lifted. So, truly, but between ourselves, I may say that I am practicing a little deception. Innocent in my mind, I assure you, on the government. As you North Americans would so picturesquely put it, you get me? Dan thought he did. Good. Like a genuine host, I place my innermost secrets in your hands. Now, said he, as he deposited the golden remnant of fruit on his plate, dipped his fingers into a bowl of water, and proceeded to pick his teeth, I wish to acknowledge with fitting generosity my appreciation of your services. There is no doubt in my mind. You are, and he smiled, saving Signor Tucker's life. The parrot gave a loud squawk of disbelief. The abstracted Don Ramon stroked it soothingly. That, he declared, is just now of paramount importance to me. If you can put him into working condition by the day after tomorrow, you seem to work miracles, there is no need for you to stay the month. I shall, indeed, pay you double the price I first mentioned in recognition of the cure. Meanwhile, he beamed with his own lavishness, I mean to pay you one thousand dollars right away. The man seemed determined to placate him. Sitting perfectly still at the breakfast table, Dan watched Don Ramon, with Pedro perched securely on the shoulder, hurry from the room. He listened to his footsteps along the empty corridors. Idly at first, he counted, all the time resolved somehow to be loyal to his patient, though loyalty to the master was no longer to be considered. He would save Tucker not only from disease, but from death, aye, and murder too, however long he might have to stay in this dangerous house. Yes, and because she must also somehow want saving, and must certainly deserve it, he would contrive to save the girl as well. His mind went back to her like steel to a magnet, but throughout all this process he subconsciously continued to count the echoing steps of his host. Subconsciously at first, then with a purposeful deliberation, the steps ascended a staircase to the left, then there were ten staccato footfalls and the sound of a door that opened on hinges hungry for oil. Broken-nosed Luis was slowly removing the plates. Dan, desperately seeking an ally, smiled at him a little, but secured no response. The Indian was stolidly, but by no means swiftly, bent on his work. Stone continued to listen, now with strained ears. Just then that unoiled door above was again opened and closed. Ten footsteps followed, the stairs were descended, the length of the corridor traversed, 
Don Ramon re-entered the dining room. With a flourish, she gave to Dan what he carried, ten brand-new hundred-dollar bills. Behold, said he, and struck an attitude of philanthropy. Pedro, always clinging to his shoulder, echoed it. Dan took the money. It was, however, early in delivery, a bargain payment. Thanks. He somehow could not put the proper gratitude into his tone, though his heart leaped with the thought of all that the money would buy. But Vieta's quick eyes had shot to Luis, and they saw that the Carib, carrying a couple of plates, stopped in mid-progress and stood staring. Don Ramon flushed. Before, however, he could speak, Luis, overcome with nervousness, tripped and dropped his burden. The china clattered to the tiled floor in a hundred fragments. Ramon's rage raised his huge strength. His fist closed over the flesh at the back of the Indian's neck. His face was rough with knotted muscles as he lifted Luis, like a kitten, from the floor, and with the merest premonitory swing of his own body to gain momentum, threw him across the room. The peon's head bashed against the edge of a mahogany buffet. He fell in a heap and fainted. Ramon laughed at the inert figure. Then, for Dan's benefit, he addressed Luis. No, you needn't apologize at all. Sever is China or a stupid Indian. For me, the China is the harder to replace. Bah! Quite readily, his muscles relaxed, and he turned again, thoroughly amiable once more, to the white-lipped American. He smiled affably, as he said, with a shrug of explanation that held not the slightest morsel of regret. The only way to keep order with these cattle is to use what you gallantly call the strong arm. During all that vast exertion, Pedro had marvelously remained with his claws secure in the cloth above his master's shoulder. Now Vieta plucked him delicately from his perch, kissed him, and with a tender gesture of affectionate farewell, flung him fluttering into the air. Hasta la vista, he waved to the bird. A firm, easy step carried him toward the outer door, but he gave a final reassuring smile to Dan. Signor Medico, he waved gaily. Hasta la vista. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Followed. Luis! The Indian lay still in a huddled heap, but his breathing was now steady. In answer to Dan's cry, his eyelids fluttered. He tried to smile, failed, lay silent. There was an ugly gash, not dangerously deep, just above his right temple. Dan's swiftly questing fingers revealed no broken bone. He saw that a drawer of the buffet stood open. It contained fine table linens. Heedless of consequences, he tore several of the napkins into bandages, cleaned the wound with water from a carafe, and bound up the sufferer's head. Evidently a man of iron, this tall, broken-nosed Carib. In an hour, perhaps, he would be about again, yet some rest he must have. Dan thought first of taking him to his own room, then recalled that, next to Tucker, was a small and apparently empty bedchamber to which he had himself hoped to be assigned. Well, he smiled sternly, it would be more convenient to have his patients close together. Fernando's precautions had at first muddled his sense of the plan of the house, but he knew a road well enough now, however circuitous it might be. The moment Luis showed definite signs of returning to consciousness, Dan put one of the Indian's arms about his neck, supported him by the waist, and half-led, half-carried him to the chosen room at the top of the palacio. They passed no one. Tucker's door was closed. In the neighboring bedchamber stood a bed bearing an uncovered mattress. On this, Dan, with practical skill, made Luis as comfortable as possible. Having fastened the door softly against any eavesdropper, he returned to the wounded man, who lay now with his eyes open and intelligent. Many, many thanks, murmured the Indian, and Dan for the first time noticed that, in spite of its broken nose, the face was pleasant, even fine of its sort. Oh, there's nothing to thank me for, he said in Spanish. There is something else far more consequence. 
What I want you to do is tell me honestly what is wrong about this hacienda. The islander started. He rolled terrified eyes and crossed himself. The senor medico speaks Spanish. Yes, said Dan, and added, but for heaven's sake, don't tell that. If I do, Luis simply answered, they will kill you. They do not dream that you understand Spanish. I'm by no means sure they won't kill me anyhow, my friend, but before they do it, I don't want to die of curiosity. Come, let me know what's going on here. Luis shook his bandaged head. I have no idea. You must have. Look here, you can't like this master of yours or that infernal Fernando either. I know you hate them both. Speak up. The Carib could only stupidly repeat that he had no idea. His protest was so solemn, he swore by all the saints, that Dan had at last to believe him. Well then, said the American, taking another tack, help me get that wretched fellow Tucker safely out of this hole anyhow. Luis clasped his thin hands in distress. He looked toward the closed door with a fright that was all but palpable. No, no, they find out everything. Besides, he added, as if to justify himself, what is Signor Tucker to me? He is no such wonderful man, Signor Medico, and when the machinery stops, he calls out loud words that shake the earth, and he does not hesitate to shake any of us poor servants, too, who block his way. No, no, I cannot risk my life for him. Dan ran perturbed fingers through his upright hair. He could not guess how young his intense straight figure and anxious blue eyes looked, how foolhardy his proposition of rescue sounded to his hearer, who nevertheless wanted to oblige him if the cost were not too great. All he thought was that there was need for haste, and, if he were to count on this man's help, he must have the promise of it soon. Yet here he was forced to use up precious time in argument. What if he has not always been kind? Dan pleaded. Would you have him die? He is a human being. So are we all, the gaunt Carib smiled grimly and made an impulsive sign of the cross, as if to secure for himself a continuance of that state. Dan took a few turns of the room. Then, stopping abruptly before Luis, he snapped out, So you still love Don Ramon? The copper face took on a deeper shade. Luis's teeth set. He is very cruel to a faithful servant. He will kill me one day, but what can I do? I am helpless. Still, I am grateful to the Signor Medico for his kindness. If I can safely show that I am grateful, I will gladly do so. And that hunchback, you love him? The swad then on the pillow writhed. I hate him. Always he has the better place, and all because he was born with a little more intelligence than poor Luis. But no more fidelity. It is not my fault that I know no English, that I cannot intrigue cleverly about the paper. Paper again. Dan thought that he had found a clue. The what? But on that topic, Luis would say no more. I will aid you all I can, Signor Medico, but this Indian can help very little, he beat his thin chest. He must keep his own life, if that is possible. Dan pursued the paper theme in vain. It became clear that Luis either could not or would not enlighten him, and his doctor's instinct told him that he must not be too insistent until the Indian had rested a bit. With a submissive sigh, he at last put a hand on the Carib's shoulder. Well, then, he said not unkindly, we'll let that pass. But there is another thing, and I guess you can tell me this without risking your life. In what room does the Senorita lodge? At once, Luis's whole manner changed. He sat up in bed. A mixture of eagerness and caution illuminated his face. There was no look of the savage about him now. He was the loyal, if frightened, slave. The senior medico swears he means her no harm? Dan vowed that he did not. What apartment is now hers? said the Indian in a tone that was lower than a whisper. Indeed, I do not know. Of old, when I was a servant to her esteemed father and her honorable mother, honorable truly, though own sister-in-law to Don Ramon, then I was privileged. But now I do not know what beyond my commanded duties goes on inside this palacio. One of these hundred rooms she must have. More than that, I know not. Dan frowned. You say that Vieta was her mother's brother? Of a surety, her mother's brother by marriage. His first wife was my dead master's sister. 
I gathered that from something he told me the other day. What I don't understand is why he, instead of the senorita, is the owner of all this. Nor I. I do not know. Who am I that I should understand the law? I am only a Christian. But this, and he looked hard into Dan's eyes, of this I am sure. Don Ramon calls himself the proprietor of this hacienda, and it is him we must obey. But before God, he has no right to these lands. That is why the Senorita Gertrude ran away, and why, overtaking her, he brought her back from San Lorenzo. In San Domingo he may not marry the daughter of his wife's brother, but if he keeps her hidden he may use, perhaps he may at last acquire her lands. The Carib's eyes blazed. He was, after all, a wounded man, and he had told, in broad strokes, all he knew. Dan remembered his own profession, and wondered if, in any case, Luis might not yet ease the situation. Meanwhile, however, the fellow must certainly have some rest. There, there, he said, patting Luis's shoulder. I'll help her, and I'll help you, too. Try to sleep, and forget your troubles for a little while. When you wake up, I'll have planned something. Then we'll talk. Just remember this, he concluded. If you were at all my friend, don't speak to me when others can possibly listen. Don't even look at me as if there were any understanding between us. And understanding Spanish, I'll know whatever you say to them before me. His new patient lay in an agony of terror as the doctor left him. Dan was aware of that, but he was aware also, and with a sense of gratification, that, in spite of Luis's fear of open alliance, he had at last a friend in this house of mystery. His spirits rising, he went toward the next room. He wondered how Tucker fared. He pushed open the door softly so as not to waken the sick man should he sleep. Crouched on the floor near the bed, his long arms folded across his flat chest, the crooked-mouthed hunchback was rocking to and fro. At sight of him now, the American's patience came to an end. "'You get out of here,' he ordered. Don Ramon told you to keep away from this room. Go. The hunchback continued to rock. His lips twisted yet more stringently. He looked up at Dan with an impudent leer. Don Ramon rides, Senor Medico. I am lord of this hacienda when he is absent. I stay. He began to hum softly the same tune his master had hummed in the cafe in that street of the pink turtle doves in Sanchez. My mistress is a lady, a lady, his lady. She smiles, her lord not looking, and throws a rose to me. Dan hesitated. Patience had snapped, but, fortunately, his leash of caution had not yet broken. Should he use force? His strong young hands tightened in his desire to do so. He wanted to wring the dwarf's neck. Then he glanced toward Tucker. The New Englander's tired eyes conveyed a plain plea against interference. Hot blood deluged Dan's cheeks, but he left the room with no further word. Pina's derisive laughter rang after his footsteps down the stairs. He decided to walk about the estate and think things over. He must bring some sort of order to his mind. He must decide on some straight course of action. Stopping only for the pith helmet that Don Ramon had brought him at their point of departure, he strode to the front door and was about to pass it, when he paused at the sight of an armed peon. Around his waist was the Dominican cattleman's machete-bearing lariat. The sight called an instant halt to his thoughts. The man was apparently on guard. Dan, however, was not long halted. He descended the stone steps. The guard made no attempt to hinder his movements, but Dan had gone a distance of perhaps only fifty yards into the patio toward the deserted graveyard, when he realized that, not many feet behind him, the peon followed with a carelessness that was nevertheless deliberate enough. He reversed his course. This would never do. He returned to the house. Within the palacio, he made his way to another exit. A second man, similarly armed and lariated, stood there, expressionless, unforbidding, but obviously prepared to follow. Again the American retreated. Here was a situation that he had in no wise anticipated. He remembered that he had determined to meet guile with guile. Very well. He shaped his lips to a nonchalant whistle and stuck his hands into his trouser pockets 
quite as if he had noticed nothing extraordinary. He walked from hall to empty room, from room to empty corridor. Every window was shuttered and fastened. He was unable to open one of them. Could these precautions have been taken only against the fierceness of the tropical sun? His heart beat none too evenly. What, after all, was to be done? Pena was doubtless still with Tucker. The armed peons, under obvious orders from the master of the house, were on watch, but seemed to confine themselves to guarding the doors of exit. He could hardly believe that this excessive precaution was directed only against himself. Was there not some danger from without? He suddenly wondered if the glib story of evading the customs were not largely a fiction on Don Ramon's part. Inaction became beyond endurance. If he was not to explore the outside of the house, he determined to explore its interior. An inexplicable impulse sent him back to the table at which he had breakfasted. Sitting there for a moment, he thought of Don Ramon's abrupt excursion of only an hour earlier, and to make sure of its reality, he felt in his pockets for the roll of ten bills given him then. They crinkled at his touch. Oh, they were there right enough, ten one-hundred-dollar bills. To the left, up the stairs, ten steps, a door. Why, Vieta must have gone at least part of the way to the Forbidden Chapel, perhaps the whole way. Forbidden only because it was crumbling? Dan must find the Senorita Gertruda, but he must also discover Don Ramon's secret. He would, therefore, try to repeat Don Ramon's walk. He entered a narrower corridor than the main one to the right. He found the staircase, brief of worn stone curving still more to the right. In the short hallway above, he took ten steps, approximating the length he thought Vieta's legs would consume in a stride. At the tenth pace, he found himself opposite a narrow oak door, pointed at the top. For an instant, he stood still and surveyed the position. A pace farther along, on the other side of the little passageway, was a second door. He might not have measured the steps correctly. He was still hesitating when the faintest glimmer from that second door made his glance fasten there. He wondered if it were hallucination, or if it actually did move ever so slightly and flash a thin streak of light along its opening. If so, it moved back into place before he could blink. Nevertheless, his heart throbbed, and he had to force his mind to sane reasoning. The eyes of this dreadful house seemed everywhere watching him. It must sometimes be his own imagination, he told himself. He meant to go on, in any case. With the master away and Pina in the distant sick chamber, here seemed his sole chance to discover whatever was to be discovered. First, he would open the pointed oak door. He tried the handle and pushed gently. The door creaked inward, and he followed it through. Closing it after him, he went along the inner corridor on which it opened. He realized that he must be heading straight toward the ruined chapel, and yet the chapel was level with the ground, whereas this was an upstairs corridor. He almost ran into a second portal, very ancient, very small, the top fastened into an equilaterally pointed architrave of stone, gray from centuries of erosion. It was locked. Dan knew what it was. That knowledge of ecclesiastical archaeology against which the Pennsylvania Dutch lawyer of his hometown had inferentially warned him, it was at last of real use. This door would lead to a compartment or gallery overlooking the chancel of the ruined chapel. Medieval noblemen in Europe had built their castles in just such a manner, so that they and their families could, unseen by the more matutinal and soberly garbed serfs, attend early mass in their dressing gowns. Quite apart from his desire to solve the mystery of the hacienda, there arose now with revived insistence Dan's interest in a glimpse of the architectural beauties that he knew existed in whatever ruin beyond that barrier. The lock was old, but too firm to be shaken loose. Nevertheless, it was not rusted from disusage. The American grasped the door by its protruding hinges and lifted it with all his strength. He was thinking fast, but his mind no longer concerned itself with suspicions of the second door in the outer corridor. 
during the night when he had heard the metallic rhythm of machinery it had come from this direction he pushed upward with rigid muscles the hinges were stiff fruitless though the immense effort promised to be he strained on and up there came at last a quiver the door yielded he let it swing creakingly wide his architectural knowledge had stood him in good stead he stepped upon a stone balcony just such as he had imagined and looked down at the very picture that his fancy had drawn the place no longer bore much of the air of a sanctuary weeds had invaded it from between the tiles of the floor purple wild flowers edged their way the font was broken halfway up the apse an unusually large and very rickety confessional box leaned crazily sunlight made crooked dusty streaks through a small but partly broken rose window opposite the high altar which itself was bare and deserted but what regardless of all his architectural interest caught and held dan's gaze was a two-peaked hulk of steel that towered in the aisle and seemed in spite of the general desertion and decay a living sacrilege on what was once a piece of holy ground he bent far over the stone rail to look at it before he could examine it he drew up short he was sure that he had heard a call muffled by distance but nevertheless a call it did not sound like a cry for help rather it reminded him of the senorita's scream of warning when in his hammock in the jungle the great snake was about to strangle him could this now be she he had caught the phrase look out in that he felt he must be mistaken surely no one at present in the palacio except pina and the sick man could speak english and pina would be slow to give dan a warning the american glanced behind him nothing he listened intently no further sound again he bent over the rail here assuredly was the machinery that he had heard at work and here he now knew was that which had taken vieta from the breakfast room don ramon had given the impression of seeking money for stone's fee in reality the planter had had that with him from the first he left his guest dan saw it as with eyes of a seer to satisfy himself before quitting the hacienda that all was well with this desecrator of a chapel so much revelation vouchsafed no more desecrator there were two instruments as stone looked they became less indistinct but no less mysterious well oiled they seemed and perfectly conditioned what were they that they should so obsess vieta dan was nothing of a mechanic he did not know the nature of the hulking things but he was looking at those shining objects trying to elucidate their meaning when something hissed beside him a rope a lariat it just missed him he wheeled in the corridor beyond the little door that dan had lifted from its hinges in the act of loosening his hold of the failed lasso stood that first armed peon who had followed dan from the palacio's front door into the open end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen: The Fortune. For one sharp instant, as Dan wheeled upon him, the peon paused, and the two men stood at gaze. The servant was a nimble-bodied black whose teeth flashed white in a surprised grin. Dan saw the hot light of the savage in that face. He read ferocity in the raggedly clad form that leaned forward, ready to spring. Without a flicker of his wide eyes, the guard reached down at last for a machete, thrust in this instance through the soiled sash about his middle. One blow of that frightful weapon, part knife, part cleaver, would serve any enemy. Dan waited no attack from it as if jumping for the ball in the decisive moment of a football game he took a flying leap and flung himself with all his weight upon the domingan one fish smashed into the black face then seized the neck the other reached across and downward it grasped the weapon that the peon was already struggling to draw the domingan's arms relaxed and came back mightily he had the advantage of being braced against the inner wall 
and now with unexpected power he sought to push dan away and so gain the chance to free the machete they wrestled in silence now they were locked in a panting embrace again the peon wrenched at his knife and stone strove to drag it away each fought with every muscle used every ounce of strength a fear lest the peon should shout for help appalled dan against that help stone would be defenceless one thing was certain it had not been this fellow who gave the call heard immediately before the attack he was sure at last that that was meant for a warning to him but he had no opportunity for conjecture with his life at stake shifting his pressure ever so little dan shoved the upper part of the arm that grappled for the machete hard against the moving larynx of the peon for a fraction of a time the enemy's eyes bulged if only stone could risk a trifle more pressure but he dared not loosen ever so slightly his grip on the weapon the combatant's breath mingled in a cloud of steam dan could feel the others beating on his forehead his own came and went noisily with a twist the adversary lowered the upper half of his body and pushed again the stone balcony was only two feet high the drop from it to the floor of the chapel was a good fifteen feet as they crashed to the floor of the balcony neither releasing his hold dan realized that the peon's purpose was now to hurl him over the rail he was handicapped because he must keep a grip on the machete and yet prevent a call for help that might summon the entire vindictive household the strength against which he was pitted seemed inexhaustible the peon lay beneath him he had let go the machete but dan could not secure it and with one free hand and an arm partially free the black was actually lifting his opponent upward and outward was lifting him against the rail up up one of dan's kicking feet caught the top of the stone fretwork he shoved backward he reversed their positions consciousness nearly left him as his head struck the balcony paving but there was no instant to lose with a heave that promised to be his last he had the surprised body of the peon straddling the corrugated coping itself where it vacillated as if doubtful which way to roll dan's strength was gone but some other force decided the issue the domingan bewildered by the speed of the reversal lying now on his back a leg actually on each side of the rail lost his sense of direction rolled into mid-air gathered momentum flew outward and downward and crashed headlong into the pit of the chapel hurtling against the rickety confessional box with such force that its door was burst ajar slowly and dazedly dan struggled partially upright he pulled himself by the stone bars to his knees and still breathing hard looked over the rail the man who a moment since had been fighting so desperately lay very still below him dan lowered himself from the balcony and dropped to the chapel floor the domingan was quite unconscious but alive indeed a rapid examination showed a fractured leg and a broken arm the arm that had held the machete but the man was not fatally hurt then came a new alarm as he listened to the faint but certain beatings of his victim's heart dan heard another sound not a repetition of that call this was something far more ominous it was the sound of approaching steps along the gallery above had somebody heard the noise of the domingan's fall there was a narrow space behind the confessional box stone crept swiftly into this lying flat but peeped cautiously around its protecting corner through the narrow doorway above came the horrid form of fernando pina so he had left the patient whom he had previously refused to quit perhaps rocking derisively on his haunches back there he had come to think that after all dan had better be watched perhaps this peon who had followed stone had first warned pina but on second consideration that was impossible there would not have been time no fernando must have started on some other errand the hunchback had no inkling of the physician's presence here some broken woodwork lay before dan a protecting screen prone he could watch fernando's every move without himself being detected pina squeaked a great oath as he peered across the rail nimbly he crept over it and his long knife between his teeth 
jumped the sheer distance with a cat-like agility that made him bounce toward the body of the peon as he alighted. He ran to it and leered at it. With a grin of diabolical pleasure, he drew back and, knife now in hand, surveyed the unconscious man. "'So, you thief, you have been caught by your own cunning,' his voice rang shrilly through the dismantled chapel. "'No more sneaking tricks from you whenever the master goes away. No more treachery, my friend. I've been watching for just such treachery,' he laughed aloud. "'You'll be the third to die here. The rest will all learn enough to keep away, or else stay in church forever.' The hunchback raised his knife and struck. It came up red. He struck again. After the second blow, he had to tug to release the blade. He wiped the dripping steel on his victim's shirt, walked calmly to the chapel's main door, and opened it with a great key from his belt. A blast of hot yellow sunshine silhouetted his gargoyle shape. Then the portal swung behind him, and the lock turned. He was probably gone for discreet help to bury the body and repair such damage as he had observed. Dan was alone. The murder had happened with a swiftness beyond prevention, a swiftness that outdistanced realization itself. From leap to blow it had not consumed a full minute. Blaming himself for the amazement that had kept him from his late enemy's rescue, Dan crept out of hiding. He looked at the body. The fingers were already stiffening. There was here no life now left to save. Although horror enveloped him, Stone glanced about. He was determined to see all that could be seen. When he had removed the door above, he thought only of the architecture of a crumbling chapel, which he felt such an impelling desire to examine. Now he did not even note its presence except as an adjunct to the worldly articles that tenanted the place. Dan leaned heavily against the wall. An hour ago, and this chapel would have fascinated him as a rare example of church architecture. He could see it at this moment only as a charnel house. Only? His roving eyes were caught again by those twin machines. Even his technical ignorance recognized them for a pair of some sort of presses. More, they were plainly in daily or nightly activity, and yet there was no sign of sugarcane about them. Shuddering a little, he glanced back at the dead peon, and then above his head to the confessional box against which the body had struck. The impact had broken its glaringly modern lock. Dan looked within. The interior fittings had long since been ripped out. The box was almost completely filled with neatly arranged piles of American banknotes, new hundred-dollar bills, replicas of those which he at that moment carried in his pocket. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen Another Prisoner Counterfeiting that must be Don Ramon's secret and the secret of his murderous hunchback lieutenant. Gingerly, Dan stepped across the dead peon and crowded himself within the box. Here, everything was methodical. It might have been the legal storehouse of a miniature mint. To the top bill of each stack of money was pinned a slip of paper, a memorandum stating the amount piled below. He began a sum in addition. Roughly, he figured that this was the likeness of a million six hundred thousand dollars, even a bit more. He remembered what had passed in his hearing between Vieta and Fernando, the hunchback declaring that they had enough that more would be dangerous, that printing should cease, and that, when it had ceased, Tucker must die. Dan remembered how Don Ramon stood out for a round two millions. Stone recalled a score of hints and judged himself severely for not having joined them one to another and footed up the inevitable conclusion long ago. And Tucker? Tucker, who was to die? What in all this was Josiah Tucker's role? Dan thought of the weak, none too honest face that had looked up from the pillows in the sick room. He thought of the delicately modeled but discolored fingers. An American, too. Why, of course. 
the fellow had somehow been seduced from honorable but in tucker's mind underpaid government employ he was the expert necessary whenever any technical slip occurred to the actual making of these notes there was just one place from which he could have come from the manufacture of real money to the manufacture of bogus the rogues had doubtless persuaded him with the promise of lifelong wealth and he at long last lying sick in his bed at the top of the palacio had come to realize that they did not mean to fulfill their promise that they had decided to rid themselves of him when his work was done and so have one less to share the spoils a few bits of banknote paper lay on the floor where were the necessary rolls of it oh it was easy enough to piece the facts together now the conspirators had just used the last of their old stock it was a new supply that ramon rode to-day to meet how he was to procure the quality and texture requisite dan did not then inquire but it was clear that when he came back the printing dan stopped short if he was caught in this chapel by vieta if he was caught by fernando his life would not be worth a button he ran to the door pina had locked it it was heavy and firm and not to be budged by any one man's muscular strength dan surveyed the even sides of the chapel the only possible exit was by the way he had come yet there was no slightest projection whereby he could raise himself and jump as he might his fingers could not grasp the bottommost opening in the rail of the balcony he thought of shoving something over and climbing on it but there was nothing movable that was of sufficient height he searched in a desperation that impaired his ingenuity he pushed while great beads of sweat blinded him at all the extraneous and other objects in the desecrated chancel the high altar the confessional box the machinery itself suddenly he saw the lariat when the peon had failed with it he had released it entirely it shot clear over the rail and there unseen while dan looked upward it lay at his very feet on the chapel floor he picked it up and tried to throw it across the rail of the gallery but he was unskilled and nervous once twice three times it flew far of the mark only on his fourth attempt which he made with more calculation did he succeed the rope circled the rail and was so looped that the farther end hung low enough for his straining fingers to catch it he knotted the two ends together tested it for his weight made it fast to the stone altar rail and clumsily clambered up hand over hand he was not light and the lariat was old and worn he had just grasped a balcony post well above his head when with a snap the rope broke his feet dangled for a moment and then he had them braced against the wall of the chapel and with a great swing pulled himself up to safety he staggered into the main hallway his head reeling his feet unsteady he turned down that passage as he did so the second door which had so caught his attention not many minutes since opened quickly and somebody stepped out you he gasped it was the senorita gertruda she was dressed in a long and clinging gown of some soft white stuff typically spanish but no mantilla masked her now her delicately carven face dusky with the blood of spain was flooded by crimson her lips shone as red as the hibiscus flower that drooped in her blue-black hair her dark eyes glowed dan's surprise at the sight of her overcame every other sensation it was you who called to me he persisted the answer was not in words her fingers closed on his shoulders she drew him across the threshold and shut the door behind their entrance her present bedroom this but plainly not one that had long served that purpose no spanish lady's bower no pretty hangings no feminine trifles here were only a bare table with a cracked mirror above it a sixteenth-century armario a narrow black iron cot and a window strongly barred she let go of him and stepped back one slim hand was tight against her breast that rose and fell now speech broken but all clear enough poured from her panting mouth i heard a strange step in the corridor guessed it to be yours earlier i had seen my uncle right away the lock was old i broke it when i saw him go the good god gave me a strength that they thought impossible 
but when i peeped out i was not sure that it was you and i was afraid then i saw what followed you and became certain so i called he realized that she was astonishingly making use of his native language there was a spanish accent there might be unusual construction but the speech was his own you do speak english she cried yes yes did you kill him did you kill that man don ramon said that i didn't speak it i know but he lied he always lies but i dared not deny his words to his face he ordered in san lorenzo that i have no communication with any stranger he dreaded what i might tell of his wrongs against me when here he suspected that i might disobey him in secret when he feared that you might chance to find me he locked me in this room near the chapel where he said he had forbidden you to go tell me did you kill that man no but he won't bother us she clasped her hands and i may trust you i feel sure that i may trust you dan smiled a little in spite of what you heard me say of myself to your uncle i guess you can trust me i know it why did i ask i know it that was my reason for opening the door it was my chance the chance i had been waiting for ever since he recaptured me in san lorenzo when i first saw you i said this man looks honorable he looks kind you are an american while my parents lived before my uncle made me a prisoner on this hacienda for their money's sake i went to school in your country she had come to the climax of her appeal she tottered toward him you must rescue me he had wanted nothing so much as the opportunity to take her away yet now he remembered the armed guards below stairs danger to himself to tucker might be cheerfully defied but danger to her i must think of a plan he said she seized him again don't think act oh you must rescue me i am quite quite alone in the world don ramon is my only relative and he has robbed me of this which was my parents estate he calls himself a guardian but he squanders his trust for his own pleasures there remains no one to whom i have the blood right to appeal she raised her lovely face close to his senor stone for the love of the mother of god get me out of this prison house she was penniless she was friendless she was beautiful would she should he succeed be any better off alone in santo domingo city alone in new york alone anywhere than here he was ignorant of the jungle trails the police sought him at this hacienda he was one man against a score himself a prisoner nevertheless he took both her little hands i'll do it said he she laughed there in the desperation of her plight she laughed as if their escape were already accomplished the completeness of her faith in him increased his doubts of his own ability i'll have to reconnoitre then go she cried pressing him backward go now there must be some opportunity as long as don ramon is absent there must be luis likes me get luis he will find us a way to leave the house i should have gone after him myself had you refused hurry hurry i cannot remain here one instant more than is necessary she was pushing him from the apartment as eagerly as she had drawn him into it go the door closed on him he was alone in the hall he could almost believe that her appearance there had been some dream that invaded his brain made dizzy by the fight on the balcony and the discoveries in the chapel resolutely however he pulled himself together and headed for the room in which he had left the broken-nosed Karib. He ran, and he ran some twenty yards away, directly into, and well-nigh over, Fernando. The hunchback's eyes were wild, as, just in time to save himself from a trampling, he sprang aside. Pina swore a crackling oath. Where have you been? Dan drew up short. He must stop. It would not do to excite suspicion now but he was not going to be tyrannized over any longer none of your business where i've been he said am i a convict here and are you the warden those questions missed fernando he had something else to think of and he thought of it with malicious triumph 
i then looked for you most everywhere senor medico you are not the wise doctor you don't know all things you make mistake about that tucker get along all right now he takes spasm just this minute you follow me immediate end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the wild cat dan had to go he owed that much to tucker as his patient and as a fellow american to whom whatever the sick man's crimes he had promised more than professional help moreover this indeed was not a propitious moment for renewing pina's suspicions stone followed fernando no chance to talk to ask questions concerning what had happened before their destination was reached on this occasion in no roundabout way pina went ahead of the doctor and went at such a pace that the latter had all he could do to maintain that distance which at the start the guide placed between them small time elapsed before they entered the new englander's room tucker lay there silent and motionless his face was purple his eyes stared dan bent over him the look was enough he is dead said stone the brief words showed nothing of the shock that the surviving american had sustained his brain reeled but he gazed over his shoulder with quick intensity at pina fernando shrugged just when persisted dan was tucker seized with this spasm the hunchback's face was rarely communicative it was now a perfect veil nevertheless his mouth answered glibly enough but now senor medico it is three minutes less i go at once for doctor senor tucker throw himself he talk loud and about nothing he look black he look red i run at once for doctor a lie of course yet it would not be well to remind fernando that he must have left his patient with nobody to care for him while a chapel was sought and a knife stuck into the helpless peon on the floor time pressed and a renewal of open hostilities must wait until plans of escape had been perfected pina peered up close to the dead man too as if fearful lest he might still be able to speak tucker talks tucker talks tucker talks dan almost heard again the servant's protest to don ramon well this solved one riddle that had begun to trouble him the riddle of how to keep his promise to rescue his fellow american something more immediately pertinent prompted the physician's actions he drew gradually away continuing to put questions about the case and as he did so a course toward liberty for the girl and for himself was revealed to him it was a desperate course but what course would be otherwise what other indeed existed still making formal professional queries he maneuvered so that he stood between pina and the open door and close to the table on which still rested the dead man's breakfast tray then he spoke your master said he will not be pleased he wished mr tucker to live so that he might go on with his work behind dan fernando pina's dull eyes gleamed a flash of triumphant defiance the good god he said take senor tucker because maybe the senor tucker he finish his work already there had been the marks of clutching fingers about the dead american's throat dan in his swift examination had not missed them the good god he declared with a clarity that could not be misunderstood did not cause this spasm that was the devil's work he looked full at the hunchback and shot out his concluding words this man was strangled he was murdered on the instant as if the statement were a signal fernando's right hand flashed to his knife prepared to throw it but this time dan knew what to expect it was with just such a contingency in view that he had backed to his present position with a single movement he seized and flung the breakfast tray straight at the hunchback's face and he flung himself after it he was too well aware of his antagonist's strength to concern himself with the ethics of the prize ring pina however was quick to recover he leaped into mid-air the pair literally flew into each other's arms and from the impact were dashed to the floor the knife shot away at a tangent and rattled under the bed over and over they rolled and nearly crossing the room in the fury of their battle they knocked down chairs and upset tables 
nearly everything that was within the apartment seemed to be in noisy motion only the dead man lay unmoved his open eyes staring upward the devil's work dan had called tucker's murder and certainly with a demonic ferocity and a demonic power pina fought his accuser their previous battle had been nothing to this in fernando's diminutive and malformed body resided a frightful energy his muscles were iron his nerves steel seen at his ordinary occupations he appeared a creature that the average man could break across his thigh fired by his frenzy for blood he was all but incapable of defeat all but irresistible in murder it was in contest against this hellish force that stone had rashly staked the senorita's chances of safety the dwarf fought in the full fury of a jungle beast his wide nostrils fanned dan's cheeks with the flame of their breath his yellow teeth shone in his twisted mouth stone powerful as he was felt upon him the absolute horror of contact with deformity and knew himself to be struggling against a wildcat pina bit into his coat and threw it till he drew blood from the shoulder losing his hold there his teeth snapped in air until they fastened on the tow-colored bristle that surmounted dan's round head they pulled at the same time the hunchback kicked ruthlessly with his long thick curved nails he clawed he beat his own arms and head and chest indifferently against his enemy he shrieked rage and exultation suddenly he began to jab with two rigid fingers straight at the american's eyes it was the ultimate tactic of the thug the world over dan was to be blinded he tried to shout out just then the entire weight of the hunchback miraculously lifted the voice of louis shouted encouragement the indian no longer able to stand the din of the struggle had got out of the bed in the next room and rushed hither had seen the last few seconds of the battle realized its import and now tore the madman from his victim stone reeled against the nearest wall he wiped the sweat from his eyes a shiver of nausea shook him louise he stammered thanks from the rear the carib held squirming pina in a wiry grip the prisoner's feet banged back and forth angrily against louise's shins with a ferocity that brought a gray pallor to the indian's battered face but he did not loosen his clutch deprisa he called that appeal restored dan he sprang again into action there must be no delay jerking the towels from the washstand he tied up their captive whose piercing cries they speedily silenced with a pillow slip for a gag they trussed him securely and fastened him tight to the footboard of the bed on which dead tucker lay pina's gaze glared vengeance but he could neither speak nor move behold him said luis in his spanish patois and with savage satisfaction he cannot harm us and only his eyes can speak dan answered with significance and no longer hesitating to use the language of the hacienda in pina's presence senor tucker's eyes speak also luis made the sign of the cross he tiptoed to the farther end of the room and took two candles from a mantel shelf he stood the fallen bed table upright and on this placed one of the pair he moved a chair to the head of the bed on the other side and put the second candle there with steady fingers he lighted them both now said he senor tucker will rest more quietly dan watched the procedure gathering his wits as it went on miraculously he had come through his two fights with no injury save that slight wound on the shoulder but his aching brain rested itself for a moment among trivial things he wondered how the dead man would relish luis's attentions tucker had probably been reared a congregationalist then he ground out cinematographically enough of the story of what had occurred in the chapel and of the senorita gertrude's subsequent appeal for release so he concluded now that we've got pina safe and sound we must get the lady and ourselves out of here but every door is guarded how are we to do it the indian nodded toward their captive first of all we must kill him pina writhed dan gaped at his rescuer we can't do that senor he has heard your plans he's safe enough until he's found no longer luis spread out his hands you ask me what to do and i tell you come senor it will waste not one little minute 
Stone looked at the deformed wretch trussed against the footboard. If ever terror dwelt in human eyes, it dwelt in Fernando's now. The man was loathsome, but he was helpless. Luis mistakenly read hesitation in Dan's face. He would have killed you, said the Carib. That was in a fight. He would kill you anyway, at any time, if he dared. Well, I won't kill him in cold blood. Get all ideas of murder out of your head and keep them out. Dan Stone was final. Luis cast his resigned eyes heavenward. Again, Stone looked at Pina, crouched before him. The bonds were quite secure. Dan nodded to his companion to precede him from the death chamber. You guarded Senor Tucker alive, said Luis to the glowering Fernando. You shall stay and guard him dead. He stalked out of the room. Dan followed and closed the door. He locked it on the outside. There, Luis again attempted to answer to the American's question. Senor, I do not know how we are to escape, said Dan. That servant of Don Ramon's who followed me from the front door where he was watching, he is dead, as I told you, by this hunchback's hand in the chapel. Did he leave his post deserted? There is a bare chance that he did. Though Luis's dark eyes were full of a dog-like devotion to his project, he shook his head doubtfully. He may have been missed. They may have found him in the chapel, the Carib answered in a hopeless helplessness. This is not a house where secrets are kept, except by Don Ramon and Fernando Pina. Well, Dan responded cheerfully enough, that's our only chance and we've got to take it. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixteen Ready Louise, still bruised and weak from his master's manhandling, nevertheless was sufficiently recovered to be ready to follow, and to follow with an intelligence the lack of which he had bemoaned as his course in Vieta's service he made sure that his lariat was fast about his waist. He ran lithely to a cupboard and brought forth two villainous-looking machetes. He rummaged in the buffet for bread and a bottle of wine, and from somewhere procured part of a ham, which he slashed into thick slices, bundling the lot up in a cloth and fastening it at his side. Meanwhile, Dan softly retraced his steps to that corridor down which he had so lately hurried. He went swiftly, but warily, yet he met with no impediment, saw no one. So far as all this part of the great house was concerned, the usurping master's retainers, it now seemed, might have ridden away with him that morning. Whatever the racket of the fight with Pina, it had not reached the ears of the guards below. A few hours since, Stone would have said that each one of those many doors in the long halls of the Palacio resembled all the others and he would have had no little difficulty in finding the one that he sought. But not now. The girl was waiting behind it, and the fact of her unseen presence there distinguished it from its fellows. Mistake was impossible. Although no alarm had been given by his struggle, he hardly dared to knock. He bent to the broken lock and whispered, Senorita! She was expectant. She opened the door. Is everything prepared? She stood there like a flower that waits the rising sun. Less than it ought to be, but as much as possible. How about you? Every woman is definitely of two sorts. Either she is never ready, which is frequent, or else her celerity in anticipation outdistances that of the average man. When it is a question of dressing for the theater or a dance, she will let you wear out your shoes as they pace the reception room. But when there arises a real emergency, she is rarely found delaying in the matter of clothes. Ready, said the senorita. But, see? She stepped backwards a pace. Dan could ill afford the time for inspection, but he ventured it. However, simply her jailers had furnished her room, they had brought her wardrobe with her, and stowed it in that sixteenth-century armario. She was habited for the road, and her practical accoutrement gave her a look absurdly youthful. 
he felt at first as if he were about to kidnap a child but then his rapid gaze noted the black mantilla held in her white hands symbol of the spanish girl of marriageable age she followed his glance her lips curved into a twitching smile yet her swiftly upraised arm showed the next moment that she realized something of the seriousness of their undertaking her face was as calm as a woodland pool but it was also resolute there was a brief pause am i not ready she asked presently dan caught his breath she was lovely and he was about to lead her into danger we've got pina tied up but there are guards at most of the doors you know they're armed and these must have orders not to let us pass we think we can find one way out of the house that isn't watched only then there'll be the patio and the outer defense to negotiate she made a gesture that defied these things that's all right said stone and of course they won't want to hurt you if they can avoid it these fellows down there it'd be only luis and me they'd aim for they'd just try to recapture you still they're bound to be careless with their guns and in any mix-up let us go said the girl he looked meaningly into her black eyes you will take the risk she bowed a full and comprehending assent it's some risk you understand he still warned her the senorita advanced to him she looked up into his face she put a hand in both of his anything death is better than remaining here let us lose no time let us go he ran by her side to the room in which he had left luis the carib though fuming from impatience displayed his preparations with a certain degree of simple pride that's good dan commanded him take these said luis he shoved the machete into stone's fist first i look ahead he added from the doorway dan and gertruda watched him as he tiptoed to the central staircase he ran silently down it reconnoitering all but his head disappeared the girl pressed stone's hand if i escape she gratefully whispered i shall owe it all to you and luis dan corrected and luis admitted gertruda and if you don't escape his voice shook at this repeated mention of her peril she smiled then i shall be in no worse position than i was before but if if i i mean if you're hurt you mean if i am killed her own tone was serenity itself why not speak the word if i were armed i could force the issue i could make it that they should never recapture me alive as the affair stands well if i am killed by mere accident how can it matter here i have been a prisoner whereas the dead that die in the lord they are free she pressed her hand again charge yourself with no crime against me whatever may happen senor you risk much for me and if my life is risked too why that is at my request he looked down at her above them rose that vaulted ceiling behind them the long corridor stretched away silent empty at their feet descended the wide staircase the way perhaps to liberty but certainly through jeopardy long he looked at her and she at him a low whistle interrupted them dan's glance shifted to the stairway luis was impatiently beckoning the american wanted to take this woman in his arms he might never see her after a few minutes hence again surely she would forgive him if he told her now what he had come to know she meant to him her face was very close her moist red lips were parted surely again the whistle dan released her he turned to the stairs come he said end of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Luis's Machete. They joined the Carib. All is safe, he whispered, and then ominously added, So far. The three stole down the broad stairs. Before them, the main hallway, full of shadow. Anything might be hiding there, but the tall front door was open and there a glare of sunlight outlined an oblong of the stone floor baking it a bright yellow 
just so the peon must have left this post in his haste of suspicion to follow dan the intervening space was brief but the journey across it seemed to the fugitives to consume an interminable period no guards however leaped from the darkness no alarm shattered the stillness of the house a few yards from that patch of yellow light louise gestured a command to pause himself he ran nimbly forward stopped and then an inch at a time thrust his head beyond the threshold they saw him turn this way and that they waited for a while breathless would there be somebody in the patio there must be stone felt more keenly than ever the folly of this attempt they could not expect all the jailers of the hacienda to be fast asleep by day as say those warders spellbound by the good fairy when prince charming rescues his princess from the ogre's castle in the fairy tale what time is it asked gertruda dan glanced at her in something close to annoyance how could the hour matter he wondered at the irrelevancy of this question from a woman who had lately shown herself so practical time he repeated yes what time the carib's swathed head had been drawn back it turned its broken nose in their direction again all safe the girl sighed relief i thought so it is the lucky hour of the siesta you mean they're napping asked the incredulous dan but of course all except the guards and everybody thinks this door guarded they have all had a little bread and a great deal of wine the peons and so they now repose themselves it is their right it is the one right that they have they could not live without it inwardly stone upbraided himself for his criticism of her he was glad even at such a crisis that he had kept it silent hurry said louise the admonition was unnecessary they sped after him not a creature was visible as they began to descend the widening flight of steps to the patio except for the ever-moving fern-like branches of a pride of india tree in the farthest corner scarce a leaf stirred in the noonday heat assured that his fellow was on duty somewhere just beyond the palacio's open door a single guard sat asleep with his back against the trunk of a coconut palm don ramon had reasonably built his reliance on the interior warders and every one of the outside sentinels now relied in tropical relaxation upon the jungle as the best of secondary prison walls he sleeps sound that one grinned louise but we won't run any unnecessary risks dan said walk softly they moved with caution down the top steps their footfalls roused no echoes moerte al trador a shriek a shriek of terror but a shriek as well so those words seemed to stone admonitory from inside the house it came from the very corridor that still yawned but a few feet behind and above the escaping prisoners a raucous voice that shattered the lazy quiet with this cry of haste and alarm it was as if the doorway itself vomited the shout dan wheeled nothing to be seen he turned again he began to drag the girl down the steps for a frantic dash onward all this in the smallest flash of time as he laid hold of her she looked up and smiled she incredibly smiled what began stone it was pedro said luis and laid a reassuring hand on the american's arm pedro the parrot explained gertruda my uncle's parrot dan drew a long breath but though he arrested his pace he was not wholly appeased it doesn't matter what it is if it wakens that guard it did not waken the guard however the dozing sentinel long familiar with the bird's noises never budged from his repose at the foot of the palm the trio of fugitives stood still to convince themselves the cry was not repeated the tropical quiet had returned the noon suspense of all perceptible motion monotonously continued phew gasped dan straight down on their heads poured the molten sun the courtyard clay pounded hard by the bare feet of one generation of peons after another 
was set aglow with the heat until it looked like a bed of living coal the dancing air was incandescent it burned the eyes from human interference the fugitives might be immediately safe in the patio but here and everywhere else where there was no shade there lurked the deadly menace of the skies we can't stand this stone continued we'll never get anywhere on foot we've got to get horses somehow he addressed luis the carib nodded but of a certainty senor he led them by a devious way around the house they left a cleared space for a grateful shade a slim path that plunged among rioting convolvulus a tangle of spice and lemon trees what's this asked dan it was a rear approach to the hacienda stables presently he saw their roofs just topping the foliage the low buildings appeared to be deserted wait said luis and ran nimbly ahead they saw him creep into the stables by a back door dan drew gertruda among the deepest shadows if they're not empty they will be but we haven't a minute to spare the siesta concluded Pina was sure to be missed and searched for by his fearful but faithful underlings he would be found and released pursuit would result inevitably and swiftly dan and the girl waited in anxious silence gertruda outwardly calm but with a vivid flush upon her cheeks her companion frankly chafing two minutes passed and no sound came from the stables five minutes the pawing of animals disturbed the rattle of harness sounds but no sign then the rear door opened luis appeared at last he was mounted and drew two saddled horses after him their bridles in his right hand i have left nothing but mules in the stalls he said almost at once the party was riding slowly down the neglected avenue toward the hacienda's wall hurry was as yet dangerous but as long as they moved at a walk the overgrown roadway deadened the sound of hoofs the gates will be locked said dan how are we going to manage that the carib smiled grimly let me ride ahead said he the gate is my business he dispatched it summarily as they grew near they saw the keeper sprawled under a clump of oleanders luis leaped from his horse picked up a stone vaulted back into the saddle and then threw his missile when columbus found the caribs they were experts with a sling and marksmanship is one of the few talents that centuries of degeneration have left them that stone took the sleeping man full in the face it was small and lightly thrown but it wakened him he sat erect and rubbed his eyes halt ordered louise to his little company they all drew rein the gatekeeper blinked he looked up he looked at the gate then still in quest of the source of the projectile he glanced up the drive he saw them he was an ugly fellow with a heavy scowl and an unduly large mouth the stone had cut him slightly between the eyes and a trickle of blood ran down his nose he sprang to his feet and whipped out a revolver instantly louise clapped heels to his horse the animal bounded forward before the weapon was fired the carib was upon its owner take this medicine he laughed his machete flashed una cucharada tres veces al día the keeper had leaped aside but not far enough the machete descended it was a brief but nasty business the girl realizing something of what was coming had hidden her eyes even stone did not care to look too closely louise searched the body and found what he sought a key the escaping prisoners took the road to the village end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen rejected sacrifice one horror was past but even yet they dared not ride too rapidly for the hamlet lay close at hand it was scarcely likely that don ramon would have taken any of its inhabitants into his full confidence still stone thought that there might be one there who was intimate enough with the planter 
to be rendered doubtful by the unwanted spectacle of a party riding away from the hacienda in evident hurry when pina came he would have nothing to lose by speed Whew! dan flicked the sweat from his forehead and wiped first one hand and then the other on a trouser leg the second hand made those ten notes in his pocket crinkle significantly he was a double fugitive and he was both charged with killing and with having possession of counterfeit money during the succeeding moments discussed his impulse was to throw the false paper away but second thought restrained him perhaps this evidence of don ramon's nefarious business an offence against a friendly nation would secure its holder a readier hearing by the dominion authorities for stone had resolved upon self-sacrifice the girl probably ignorant of the law and intent only on their escape from the hacienda's dangers did not guess the full extent of his personal peril and must never be aware until too late to prevent it of the full scope of his proposed immolation lest she jeopardize as knowing in time she infallibly would all of her safety for some degree of his gertruda's thoughts had to be kept from his own plight because he had definitely decided to risk himself with the police in order to secure her from her embezzling uncle his plan was plain and if they could outdistance pursuit long enough its execution ought to be simple luis must guide them by the briefest way to freedom from pina's certain pursuit the briefest way consistent with an avoidance of encountering the homeward bound vieta once safe from the chase or reasonably sure not to be overtaken and brought back before reaching the officers of the law closest within call the course would be laid direct to the dominican capital there he would tell gertruda's story to the police since his description had doubtless been sent out broadcast and the lookouts were everywhere this would be tantamount to surrendering himself for the killing of goldthwaite he looked at the girl she wore the mantilla but had forgotten to draw it lower than her hair her face was resolute her chin held high her black eyes shone she was worth it the horses were familiar with this portion of their route at an easy jog they threaded their way through the garbage and refuse of the single street most of the inhabitants were however still sleeping heavily only a few barefoot and half-clothed native children some dark with indian blood more dark from the sun stared at the cavalcade dan turned in his saddle to the carib will they carry any warning of our escape to the hacienda he suspected spies everywhere luis was less dubious why should they they'll tell their parents that they've seen the senorita they don't see her often nowadays i suppose they would no more dare to wake their fathers than i should dare to wake a sleeping watchdog senor and if they did what do those fathers know pina's wife lives beyond here the danger lies not here the danger will come when these children are questioned by pina they will point out our way to him he will not have to ride through the pueblo slowly if the hacienda servants had not fernando they would be helpless if the senor had only let me kill him dan interrupted never mind that there's probably a warrant out for me but i'm not up to first-degree murder even yet the carib was pushing ahead rapidly but stone stayed him though the village assumed a serpentine length that he found intolerable the palm thatched cabins panted in the heat flies and mosquitoes lazily buzzed outside the motionless jalousies mother goats in the cool of the doorways would summon their overly energetic kids from danger under the horses hoofs it was finished at last quit to the village luis turned them into a jungle trail along which they proceeded with what speed it permitted the fear of pursuit always close behind them the dread of they knew not what interference ahead it was still possible for dan to ride abreast of the girl and he wanted to remain close to her as long as he could leave her soon he must never to return unless some miracle should clear his name he thanked god that he had kept silent his love for her he was even glad that he had not burdened her with any knowledge of the role she played in the heart of a man whom the world must regard and treat as a criminal 
but he did desire her proximity as long as it was attainable and he therefore kept close to her she had not spoken for some time dan wondered whether her thoughts were entirely occupied with the death of the gateman yet he respected her reticence now suddenly she looked up and his curiosity was almost immediately satisfied what she asked in her precise english is to be our destination he tried to smile anywhere that don ramon is least likely to look that's up to luis he knows the country but ultimately her gaze was very steady stones generally so frank shifted i don't know you must have some plan there wasn't much time for planning you told me to act and not think we cannot go on like this forever as a high school lad he had read and loved browning's last ride together now that phrase of hers set the poem's concluding lines to ringing in his head what if heaven be that fair and strong at life's best with our eyes upturned whither life's flower is first discerned we fixed so ever should so abide what if we still ride on we too with life forever old yet new changed not in kind but in degree the instant made eternity and heaven just prove that i and she ride ride together forever ride he almost quoted the words but he checked himself and stammered i we i mean to get you to some reliable authority or other somebody who'll look after your rights get your fortune out of your uncle's fingers oh i do not think that he has left much of it she said but even if he has i prefer only that we escape from this island he felt her cool eyes reading his mind but he made one more attempt at dissimulation well i hope to make your escape possible and to get your rights for you too she spoke quietly senor the police are seeking you if you go to the authorities on my behalf you will be giving yourself up to them it should go without saying that i will not permit such a sacrifice for any fortune whatever the blood mounted to dan's temples embarrassment choked him but remonstrance struggled against it in his throat what however would have been the issue he was never to know for at that moment the carib riding ahead flung up a warning hand listen end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the vagabond the trail had opened on a small natural clearing in the jungle's heart it was walled by sour orange trees and giant ferns ropes of vines hung snake-like from surrounding boughs no spot could have seemed less usually frequented by humankind the heavy carpet of moss muffled the sound of the traveller's progress and no other sound reached dan's attentive ears listen repeated luis he drew in his horse gertrude's mount and stones stopped still to the american the perfect silence seemed continuous what's wrong he inquired yet he spoke below his breath i'm listening all right but there's not anything to hear there is said luis dan looked inquiringly at the girl she shook her head i don't she began luis gestured a command that all talk cease and then sure enough from somewhere ahead from somewhere along the trail as it cut again into the jungle at the clearing's farther side there came the crackle of breaking twigs the girl gasped my uncle your uncle said louise does not go afoot somebody from the hacienda whispered dan louise shook his head there is no trail there that connects with this one shall we go on no wait and see the indian drew as already stained machete don't use that cried gertruda stone restrained her twigs crackled again the footsteps were distinctly audible now they drew nearer then the escaping trio saw approaching them a vagabond pedestrian on such a road at such a time even a beggar proved fit subject for mistrust 
this one as he paused at the side of the attentive group and gazed straight into dan's blue eyes was ragged beyond anything previously believable to stone beyond things believable the fellow was dirty and beyond things believable he was known and knew hoglan cried dan luis looked at him was this friend or foe stone could not answer with words he was half stupefied by the recognition for an insane instant his instinct for self-preservation clamored for precipitate flight could hoagland have followed him from the coast how could he know of that roundabout journey to the hacienda dan pictured the prosperous-looking fellow standing in the sheltered doorway of sanchez and thence tracking don ramon as the planter went to buy clothes and fill prescriptions the prescriptions that had so nearly saved tucker's life hoagland would probably like to put dan in the hands of justice but a surrender on the murder charge was part of stone's present enterprise and here might be at all events an ally against the certainly soon following pina the voyager of the hawk was at least a fellow countryman dan could speak frankly to him and trust to his national sense of fair play a motion told the carid to lower his weapon dirt was caked upon the erstwhile oglin's cheeks and sweat ran through it in muddy gutters he smiled was that the smile of a successful pursuer dan thought so but before stone could speak the newcomer demanded what's all this a joy ride it's no joke said dan and we haven't got a minute to spare if you were looking for me well i'm here and it won't be you i'll run away from he spoke rapidly turn around put a hand on my bridle if you like we've got to hurry if you'll walk as fast as you can beside me i'll tell you all about it we're sure to be followed soon you he broke out you must help and you will if you're a good american hoagland's eyes were keen i'm an american all right said he as to whether i'm a good one or not opinions differ then come along the hawk's passenger took off his broad-brimmed native straw hat disclosing to dan in a bow toward gertruda the once familiar thatch of thin hair i think no introductions now snapped stone and as the march was resumed he continued you'll want to know first about what i did on that ship and anyhow what i did there is what got me into this new mist well then but again luis interrupted and again it was with a command to listen that he did so he reached from his saddle and touched dan's arm hush this time it came from behind them from that stretch of trail over which they had just passed and this time it was immediately unmistakable nothing afoot mounted men mounted men advancing as rapidly as the jungle track allowed it was the pursuit at last there they are said dan they asked hoagland who there was no use in attempting to run away any farther since a battle there must be it had better be here stone flung a rapid and sketchy explanation to his latest recruit when you were looking for me in sanchez you followed a big man in white a planter names vieta he's a crook all sorts robbed his niece this girl here i got her away now his people are trying to get her back as he spoke dan was looking to right and left his party had not yet crossed the clearing but he could see that the green walls of the open space were everywhere backed by a dense mangrove swamp its depths doubtless breathing poison its surface promising at short distant engulfment to any trespasser gertruda might hide safely on its outskirts for a few minutes abiding the issue of the now certain conflict but the rest of them must stand their ground stone ordered the girl five paces and no more into the jungle she reluctantly obeyed the sounds of pursuit drew still nearer got a gun he inquired of his fellow american hoagland nodded then draw off to the left there and use it from the flank we haven't anything but machetes we'll have to go it hand in hand if they get us to you try to draw them after you break for the swamp on the opposite side from where the senorita is he translated for the carib's benefit his own mount he pushed to the extreme edge of the open space covering the girl's retreat and he bade luis follow him there this last order was no sooner executed than the pursuers were upon them two four eight ten the enemy mule back swarmed into the clearing twelve 
a successful resistance was probably as impossible as further retreat nothing to do but fight it out anyhow they were coming without pause straight at their quarry at their head and well in advance of the others the liberated hunchback perched on his saddle like a big doll waved an automatic pistol and shrieked with triumph dan raised his machete his nearer ally also made ready to strike pina was now not a yard distant from luis upon stone's right the dwarf's wild eyes were all for that deserter Threador! yelled fernando another bound forward the carib struck but struck too late pina thrusting his pistol directly against the indian's broken nose fired luis flung up his arms he fell from his horse dead dan prodded his own mount toward the hunchback as he did so there came a volley of shots and a final rush from fernando's henchman he thought that out of the corner of an eye he saw hoagland reel the gang clashed all around they closed in stone's machete was straightaway stricken from his grasp of course the fugitives had been hopelessly outnumbered stone caught sight of three peons heading into the swamp beside him their trained eyes had even in the heat of warfare caught some tell-tale sign they were going to recapture gertruda well there remained the splendid opportunity of dying barehanded in her defence he reined his horse about broke through his nearest enemies and rode at the trio and then an incredible thing happened someone jumped at him from behind before he could resist his arms were pinioned to his sides and a voice hoagland's voice was shouting in easy spanish to pina if this is the man you're after i've got him only i think i ought to have a little reward for turning him over to you end of chapter nineteen Chapter 20 of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Double Crossed. Under the high window of Dan's room, a peon stood erect, or as erect as a peon can stand, a carbine resting in the crook of his arm. In the hall outside the locked door of that same apartment, a pair of servants were on guard and they carried automatics within dan sat his aching head in his hands his sick thoughts whirling dizzily from the treachery of hoagland to the possible fate of the senorita a key grated admonishingly swaggering like a hand-organ monkey the hunchback marched in his eyes were dull once more and he smiled but not even when he intended instant murder had he betrayed more malice the senor that captured you was hurt at the start of our little scuffle he said we owe him the reward of good care you have not shown yourself a successful doctor with our senor tucker but you are all that we have and so you are to attend this new patient his tone was a grating insult his speech spanish dan stared at him impassively oh pina mocked you can understand me well enough i know it for i heard you give orders to luis in the dead room stone bit his lip but after all these minor discoveries mattered nothing now how is he hurt he inquired in fernando's own language we do not know we fear some internal injury that it is your business to discover if you have the requisite skill not dan's business perhaps but surely his unpleasant duty he rose look here he said i'm going to attend to this fellow not because i want to for he double-crossed me and not because you order it for i'm past being afraid of you or anybody in the whole hacienda you've got me and you'll do your worst to me whatever i do now i'm going to treat your friend because though i couldn't prevent your killing tucker i'm enough of a doctor never to refuse help only don't you think i deserve a fee he resolutely bridled his pride can't you pay for my services with a little scrap or so of information pina's crooked smile more than ever distorted his yellow face most of us judge our fellows by the sole standard of ourselves this creature could not conceive of a prisoner in Dan's position as being anxious about any life except his own. 
you want to know what is going to happen to you he asked and he answered the question what will happen is almost certain but perfect certainty awaits the master's return i don't give a dominicano what happens to me said dan i want to know something about the senorita gertruda he hated to mention her name in such a presence and might indeed have spared his pains fernando merely smiled the more and the more evilly that also awaits the master's word come now to your new sufferer you are to employ your best skill with him senor medico for he is the last patient you will ever have there is no need of physicians in heaven with guards falling in before and behind the hunchback conducted his prisoner to the room in which the new englander had met his violent end any effort toward escape would have been futile and unless it could help the senorita which no effort now could do stone cared little enough to make one pina opened the fatal door poor tucker's body had been removed and hoagland lay on the bed probably between the very sheets that had recently covered the dead man all signs of disturbance were however removed and all signs funereal the snuffed candles were restored to their usual place on the mantel shelf dan disgust in every movement approached the injured man whatever the hurt incurred by the hawk's passenger it seemed to be a severe one there was no blood visible but he lay with a relaxation of utter exhaustion stone studied the not ill-natured features under the thin mat of hair it was hard to believe such a man a double dealer double dealer he had however patently proved himself and the doctor could not curb a shudder of aversion standing close beside him pina saw it you hate this man now he smiled it was very pleasant to impose the unwelcome task i'll do my best for him said dan shortly ah laughed fernando i know you will because you hate him thus it is with you americans the more you dislike a work the more you feel you should do it trust you you'll go through with it i have always heard so he rubbed his hands together well then having a multitude of preparations to make for my master i shall not take the joy of watching you do you think the case serious i'm no wizard dan mumbled i can't tell anything at the first glance so said pina remember your last patient make a fine job you will have plenty of time for double care of you i shall lock the door but there will be a guard outside of it with a key should you require anything call do not be modest of your knowledge of our language your excellent spanish will be well understood never fear senor medico he bowed with apish extravagance and impish irony dan could almost have found it in his heart to crush the poisonous creature as one might grind a venomous toad beneath one's boot heel fernando left the room the door was fastened then stone shook off his loathing he returned perplexedly to the injured man hoagland lay with closed eyes the sheet was now slightly drawn back and it revealed the fact that he was fully clothed one touch showed that he had no fever another discovered the pulse to be regular dan stripped off the patient's coat the better to examine for internal injuries as he did so he saw something protruded slightly from an inner pocket it was a small flat leather case stone relentlessly opened it up at him from under a glazed surface there stared the certified information that martin patrick hoagland was a special agent of the division of secret service treasury department u s a eh that grunt of stupefaction was involuntary dan turned upon his patient hoagland was grinning broadly he was even administering to his physician the wholesome medicine of a slow wink in heaven's name began stone what's the meaning of that dwarf must be safe downstairs by now hoagland cut in with a quick whisper i'm all right of course and don't take what i did to you too seriously his voice carried no farther than stone's straining ears dan was still gasping who are you you've read that card yes but then why did you do what you did and what are you doing here in santo domingo 
had to get inside this house somehow some way that wouldn't excite suspicion any means were fair in the circumstances besides they had us dead to rights out there in the jungle i couldn't help you fighting four to one and everything in their favor well you might have told me there wasn't time besides i wasn't sure of you and didn't know i'd need you even if you were okay and then you'll kindly remember you wanted to do the talking and it was all about the little lady and yourself no i had my special job on hand why it was on account of that since you ask it and i'll need you now that i came to the island you said this ramon was all kinds of a crook well a light broke on dan i know i found it out i was right about you just now you're the boy i'll need tell me what you want they are printing counterfeit u s money well resumed hoagland i got on the trail of some banknote paper back home it was to be shipped by the hawk and the hawk was really booked for san lorenzo no matter what they said and no matter how much condensed milk they meant to take to other places later i don't know how deep goldthwaite and his cross-eyed johnson were in the thing i don't know how much they knew but i had a couple of men on the mate's track in brooklyn and he didn't look good to them down here i found out that ramon had to leave the landing of the paper and the first two land halls to an agent between stumbling over you and that runaway niece that he'd followed oh the sanchez cafe keeper knew a little and talked more dr gurney why vieta had his hands full hoagland groaned and then i had mine full gee but i'm stiff i rode a mule till i killed it but you can't do anything in this house cried dan wildly waving the leathern case they'll only kill you too they've killed a lot already and i'm next i don't care about myself it's the girl i'm thinking of i was on my way to give myself up for the goldthwaite killing hoagland lifted his thin eyebrows did you really think you did for that pirate dan cried out hoagland put a cautioning finger to his lips can the noise sonny and never mind the details goldthwaite's as good as ever by now or as bad more's the pity and what's more than that your new boss knew it was so or soon would be when he hired you end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one the treasury notes the mission of martin p hoagland to santo domingo had its origin in the greatest shock ever received by certain officials not unconnected with the currency of the united states of america as the secret service operative told it to his pseudo physician there in the fortress of don ramon vieta the history was shorn until its remaining details constituted the barest statement of fact what however had happened was a clash between temperament and system behind the high walls that protect the government bureau of engraving and printing in washington an intricate regimen rules laws as stringent as ever those of draco decree each movement of each employee for each second of his eight-hour day among the money printers everybody is inspected every part of his job is checked up every minute system commands it and system is supreme now concerning system two things are axiomatic first the better the system the fewer the permitted exceptions next when an exception is forced upon a system from the outside then the better the system the worse the confusion with the former of these axioms john h farley in charge of the bureau had long been acquainted he had just passed his fifty-third birthday when the latter bumped into him that year the second of january fell on a tuesday and the bureau opened for business at nine a m when he had closed up shop at noon on saturday december thirtieth farley lean and long looked back on the thus concluded year with all the satisfaction of which his cautious nature was capable this hook-nosed man with the worried air was head of the division that actually produces america's paper money he was also a stickler for peace and quiet and he had made good no damage plates 
a minimum of reprimands to employees, scarcely any ink troubles, less than ever the usual number of dismissals, 72.5% of first printings approved on initial inspection, and all deliveries on time, a commendable achievement. He could recall but one eruptive half-hour, and that had been due only to his handsome but mature stenographer. I don't see why I shouldn't be assistant instead of their running Mr. Dodd over my head. She had grown from an awkward girl into a painstaking woman at the bureau, but she had yet to appreciate the fine ideal of the civil service board. I've been here for years, she sobbed. I know the place, inside out, and I'm a lot more capable than Mr. Dodd is. But of course I'm only a woman, and all he has to do is pass an examination. A woman. Somehow, except during one condescending dinner at her boarding house, Farley had seldom before so considered her. He wondered why, in spite of her undeniable good looks, she had always seemed as permanent a fixture of this office as its very vaults. It must be because she was so efficient. He debated whether, being a woman, she had suppressed the more painful prong of her grievance whether her keen glance had seen that sentence relating to her in the annual character report that he submitted to the Secret Service. Green, Cecilia, private secretary, ten years in government employ. Faithful, efficient, incorruptible, will never marry. On this morning of January 2nd, however, Farley shrugged the doubt away. His desk was open and in order, and as far as her work was concerned, Miss Green was her conscientious self again. Farley touched a couple of his desk bells. From opposite doorways, two men appeared. Luther Lemmel, long in the service, was little and fussy. Grantley Dodd was a bare thirty-five, broad and prosperous-looking, with a gold chain conspicuously stretched across the curve of his already expansive waistline. We're going to begin the new year by printing the first of the hundred-dollar Fillmore heads. Farley stroked his jawbone between thumb and forefinger. The engravers made a time record with their part of the job. The plates reached us, he consulted an office memorandum, at 11.20 on Saturday. Now we're going to beat the engravers. You gentlemen lock the plates in the safe, again he consulted the memorandum, at 11.25. They'll come out right now at, let's see, 9.10. They'll be on the presses in ten minutes. I've notified Guff about the make-ready, and we'll have our first official printing underway at 9.30 sharp. Mr. Lemmel, will you please start the combination? It was one of the laws of the great system that only three persons should have knowledge of a safe's combination. One, Farley himself, holding the entire key. The others, two trusted employees, in this case Messrs. Lemmel and Dodd, who guarded one half apiece. At unexpected moments, the combination was changed. The two men left the quiet office, and Mr. Farley turned to Cecilia Green and began the dictation of routine instructions. He did not get far. Miss Green was seated on the edge of the desk chair beside him, her pencil poised in air, awaiting his sixth sentence, when Dodd and Lemmel rushed back. They're gone! Farley leaped to his feet. Miss Green, pencil and notebook still in hand, leaped to hers. Gone, echoed Farley. You mean the Fillmore plates are not in the safe where you put them? Dodd's large hands trembled. Lemmel nodded convulsively. Farley strode to the door. Close the building, Farley ordered his two assistants. Get the Secret Service on the phone, Chief Boyle. Then come back to the vault. I must make sure. Miss Green followed close at his heels. A glance over his shoulder revealed her interrogative eyes. Yes, yes, come along, said he. In the money factory, everything is done more safely in pairs. The room to which they went was literally a steel room, and in their speed thither they brushed with no nod of recognition past the guard at its door. He was an old government servant, far above suspicion in this place where everyone was more or less suspect. But, what was of the greater weight, he would be the last man to know the combination of the big safe within. There was now no use in questioning him. 
Inside, however, the thick door of that safe stood open just as Lemel and Dodd had left it in their frantic haste to communicate the news. Bad, bad, Farley groaned at this evidence of their carelessness. He and Miss Green ran directly to the yawning safe. They were to put them here in this main compartment, said Farley, touching the indicated shelf. His secretary had been far too long in the bureau not to be jealous of its honor. She peered this way and that with nervous, searching eyes intent upon a clue. The room was as vault-like as always, a series of steel walls, steel compartments, steel locks. It was not to be believed that anything could have been forcibly tampered with. Miss Green looked toward the single entrance door. It was, of course, ajar, but the guard, his back scrupulously to them, leaned beside it, a barricade against intrusion. Then, suddenly, within the safe itself, something out of the ordinary must have caught the secretary's scrutiny, for while her chief leaned forward to the ravished shelf, she raised herself quickly to her tiptoes and reached far up over his bent back. From a high pigeonhole, she pulled down a heavy package. Mr. Farley, she gasped. Before he gathered her meaning, Lemel and Dodd pushed past the guard. Chief Boyle is on the phone now, sir, said Lemel. Will you speak to... He stopped. Both newcomers stared at a small, paper-wrapped parcel that lay in Miss Green's outstretched hands. She stood there pale and swaying a little from the excitement of it. "'There are the Fillmore plates, all right,' cried the quickly exultant Dodd. "'I know the shape. And I remember the wrapping paper,' said Lemel. Farley had regained a degree of self-control. "'You put them in the main compartment, didn't you?' "'Yes, yes,' declared both Dodd and Lemel vigorously. Miss Green raised her perfect eyebrows. "'They were on the upper shelf. Oh, they are the Fillmore head, aren't they? Farley seized them and tore off the cover. Of course they are. He was saved. And yet, and yet, blurted Dodd, that isn't where we put them. No, sir, Lemel insisted. We put them in the main compartment, just where you told us to, and just where you were looking. Are you both certain? You might be mistaken. They were on that upper shelf when we found them. Would you both swear you put them in the main compartment? With his worried frown, he scanned the two men's faces. I remember perfectly, said Dodd, unabashed. I'd swear to it, declared Lemel imperturbably. Miss Green looked at Farley as if for a decision, but before he could speak, Dodd's hearty voice cut in. Well, anyway, they're found. We shouldn't worry. The incident's over. Is it? pondered his superior. I wonder. That was the prelude to Hoagland's narrative as told to Dan at the Palacio. This is what followed. One morning, a little more than a month previous to Dan's desertion from the S.S. Hawk, a man who had never heard of young Stone walked, as of right, into Mr. Farley's private office. He was a large man with flat red hair and a short but bristling red mustache. Importance declared itself even in the details of his well-cared-for clothes, which were all of one shade or another of brown. It spoke in his brown derby, his brown braided coat, his brown braided trousers. It shone in the polish of his neat tan shoes, and was impressively evident in a tiny brown neckcloth meticulously tied. "'Mr. Boyle,' said Farley, nervously pacing the floor, you called me an alarmist when I sent for you about the Fillmore plates and then found them within five minutes. That was on January 2nd. It's now only March 1st, and look here. Between trembling fingers, he held out two $100 bills to the chief of the Secret Service. The chief looked questioningly for further enlightenment. An hour ago, continued Farley, our man Dodd went over to the Marine Exchange Bank to see the president about a reissue of banknotes, and he had to wait for him a full twenty minutes while the banker was in conference. These financiers have no more respect for government officers than they have for bucket shop sharks. Dodd decided to put in the time beside the receiving teller's window. He knows him slightly. When they two were talking, a depositor came in with a roll of bills and checks. Dodd wasn't much interested, but as the man pushed the deposit through the cage, he noticed one of the new $100 Fillmore certificates. 
Something out of the ordinary struck Dodd about this one, and after the deposit had been made, he got the teller to give him a look. He brought the note to me. We compared it with the one of ours. It's counterfeit, chief. Boyle, with the two specimens, went to a window. Through a magnifying glass, he compared the certificates. If this note is bad, Boyle gruffly declared, then, with all due respect to the government engravers, the counterfeit's a better job than the genuine article. When did you put them out? Three days ago. Farley wet his dry lips. When did you get the plates from the engraver? At 11.20 a.m. on Saturday, the 30th of December last. They were brought direct to me by the messenger and were looked at by the people in my office, and then at once put into the safe before closing time. Who were those people? Mr. Dodd, Mr. Lemmel, and Miss Green, my stenographer. But they are all trusted and absolutely above suspicion. Oh, sure, what I want to know is how the plates were put in the safe. Miss Green take them there? Not at all. It's not her place to do it. Dodd and Lemmel went with them. Both men insisted they deposited the plates, as I directed, in the front of the main compartment. They then, in each other's presence, closed the safe, of which I had just changed the combination. According to rule, I next separately gave each man his half of the new combination. I see. On December 30th, you say. Then there were two days when the Bureau was shut up. Could a copy of the plates in any way have been made here? Impossible. How about the engraver? He made only one perfect set, as usual, and destroyed all the false starts in the presence of the regular witnesses. Then there's only one answer. The plates must have been removed in some way and copied. Are you really sure of Lemmel and Dodd? Mightn't they have pieced the combination together? They dislike each other. Lemmel has worked for the Bureau over twenty years and feels that Dodd is an upstart. Dodd's been in the government service since he was fourteen years old, started as a Senate page, and, though he's been with us only six months, he's got a splendid record. On his side, he calls Lemmel an old fogey and fussy, and says he ought to be replaced by a younger man. One by one, the two men, and then Cecilia Green, and even the stolid guard to the vault, were summoned and interrogated. The last answered the veiled questions that were put to him in an open-eyed wonder and frankness that at once slew suspicion. Each of the others satisfactorily accounted for his time between the hour of closing on December 30th and that of resumption of work on January 2nd. Lemmel had spent his holiday in bed with a cold that he hoped to cure before the reopening of the bureau. Dodd took his young wife and baby to Atlantic City, catching the first train afternoon by running, and then having to run from the return express back to his work. Miss Green went to a matinee on the Saturday afternoon. A gentleman from our boarding house took me, she said dryly, and she looked at Farley. Here was her way of telling him that she was unmarried entirely from choice. From the theater, she had gone to her married sisters at Alexandria, where she tended the children until Tuesday morning. This sister, it appeared, was then in hospital, and all possible help was needed at home with the babies. That will do, said Boyle, dismissing her. He directed his next words to Farley. We can tab up on all their statements, but I think they've told us the truth. Farley made certain that the door was fastened before he answered. Chief, there is only one man who knew the whole combination of that safe and could have removed the plates. That man is myself. I think it is my duty to offer my resignation to the Secretary of the Treasury. The bell of the desk telephone interrupted him. Hello, said Farley into it, and then to his visitor, it's for you, Chief. In his turn, Boyle put the receiver to one ear and listened for a moment. Presently, he said to Farley, It's headquarters talking. Hoagland, my right-hand man there. He's got something from a company that makes paper for you. The concern's been taking stock of their warehouses. They've just discovered the loss of three large rolls. There was a tense moment in which the two men looked in amazement at each other. Then Boyle shook an advising finger in Farley's gray face. Stop printing, said he. 
End of chapter 21. Chapter 22 of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Counterfeit. So that's that, said Hoagland. But it's not all? asked Dan Stone. Hoagland shook his head. There was one scene more. The mills of the gods grind slowly, but the mills of government are a close second. It was April 3rd in Washington before the affair of the Fillmore certificates came to the personal attention of the Secretary of the Treasury. The Secretary, who had not before, even in writing, had the case in its entirety presented to him, listened with concentration while first Farley and then Boyle rehearsed their parts in the mystery of the lost and found plates and of the subsequent appearance of counterfeit money. The Secretary was of the old school, he looked like a deacon, and, as a matter of fact, in his hometown, he was one. He was sixty, small and plump, with a genial pink face and effective side whiskers. His first move was to turn to Farley. Of course, said he, your offer of resignation was very honorable, but of course it was what I might call too conscientious. Besides, it would attract attention, possibly invite questions. We shan't consider it for a moment nevertheless he picked up and thoughtfully examined a single pencil ashtray in the ordered emptiness of his desk nevertheless you must understand that this is a most unfortunate incident most unfortunate in view of certain hopes and projects of the administration he tapped the pencil on his desk's glass top there was to be a presidential election in november the long and lean Farley had been sitting bolt upright in an office chair. He now bent forward, his thin hands spread flat on his high, thin knees. There are less than a hundred of the Fillmore certificates in circulation, as yet, Mr. Secretary, and we have stopped all printing. Hadn't we better recall the issue at once? Not at all, not at all, Mr. Secretary shook his side whiskers vigorously. Any such course at the present time would subject the government as a whole, and this administration in particular, to financial annoyance and political ridicule. Er, yes, that. And, of course, such a process would flatter criminals and encourage crime. To be sure it would. He turned to Boyle. Chief, said he, putting all the force he possessed into his utterance, these false plates must be found. You have got to ferret out the counterfeiters from their holes. You understand? There is no time to lose. Put every one of your men on the job if you have to. It is essential that success be accomplished with the utmost speed and uh, lack of publicity. Boyle's red mustache contemplatively rose and fell over a tightly bitten, unlighted cigar. We can't quite do that, sir, said he. We've got a pretty good organization, and we'll win out in the end. But we can't speed up till we've a bit more to go on than we have now. This is an unusual case. These crooks seem to have brains. They've covered up so well so far that all we've got to go on to date is that this doesn't seem to be the work of any men figuring in our phony money records. The secretary was about to interrupt, but Boyle indicated that he had not finished. Long before counterfeit was even suspected in this affair, all possible fingerprints on the safe were eradicated, and though we think that there was a removal of the plates from the safe, we have no actual knowledge of it. They were simply, according to two persons, placed on one shelf. After a couple of nights, they were missed for five minutes by those same persons, and then, according to two other persons, they were found on another shelf. The only thing we've got to work on is the disappearance of a little paper, possibly mislaid or miscounted, and the appearance of counterfeit money on the market. Well, that's plenty, Chief, said the now thoroughly irritable secretary. Take it off the market. Meanwhile, the Treasury will be obligated to stand the loss. I get you, sir, said Boyle, and you can rely on us to do our best. He drew a paper from his pocket. The oddest thing, he said, is this. Here is the digestive reports from every bank in the country. That counterfeit note, 
accidentally discovered by dodd just after it was turned into the marine exchange bank on march first is the only one known to be in existence and the depositor a thoroughly reputable department store owner can't tell where it came from the banks report a few of the real notes say sixty or seventy i haven't counted them up but that's all they do report it now looks as if the counterfeiters were resting or had somehow or other been scared off at any rate not a single counterfeit fillmore head seems to have been passed since that first one over a month ago curious curious declared the secretary well mr farley i believe i'd like to take a look at those two notes and compare them with some of your notes from the presses or with the plates themselves as i reminded you sir we stopped printing a month ago the moment we discovered counterfeit and the plates are locked up in the vault i can send for them farley looked at the secretary for possible contradiction but here and he produced almost tenderly a wrapped note is what is perhaps easier for comparison for the layman it is the certified standard bill struck off on december thirtieth ah so much the better the three men their heads bent close examined all three notes under a large magnifying glass first the standard note then the note in legitimate circulation, and then the counterfeit. Boyle gave a sharp cry. He actually removed the cigar from his mouth and shook it between thumb and forefinger in order to emphasize his words. I told you the crook's job was better than yours, Farley, said he. Look here, both of you. There's no blur on this scroll work in the upper left-hand corner of your standard note on the reverse side nor is that flaw in this thing which you call the false note it appears only on what you call the good notes of which by casual count i estimated there are between sixty and seventy reported by the banks well asked the secretary puzzled well echoed farley with dawning suspicion can't you see the chief shouted can't you see that dodd's discovery was the biggest sort of accident Why? what he reported as bad is actually good and there's nothing now in circulation but counterfeit that's the way the chief put the case to me said hoagland concluding his rapid chronicle to stone the way he put it to me when i'd come in to report on the trailing of the paper to new york and our blue-nosed friend goldthwaite's hawk he winked solemnly to a superfluous physician so i took a sea trip and you saved my life and remembering how one good turn deserves another i handed you over to these merry gunmen oh well said dan you thought you had to get in here and that was one way it seemed a bit strenuous to me that's all but the question now is what are we going to do here shut up like this we shut up the man on the bed chuckled those guards outside are your guards it was entirely on your account that Phineas said he'd lock the door he considers me a friend of course he'd have got to you anyhow and trust him to say so but the fact remains that i did turn you over to him you think you can help her asked eager dan her oh the little lady perhaps perhaps i can get a chance to help you too if nothing happens in the meanwhile to give me away here then once i've got this ramon fellow copped but how can you get him hoagland continued and speaking of not being given away it won't do to go flourishing that card about suppose you just hand it back to me throughout the narrative dan had been thoughtlessly holding hoagland's leathern credential case now to return it he extended it to its owner look out whispered hoagland for the card did not reach that owner preparing for some such surprise as was at this instant carried out the crafty piña had lied the door of the room was not locked it swung open and with an amazing lightness don ramon bounded in he flicked the credentials from dan's unworn fingers thanks thanks senor medico a cigarette his loud derisive laughter rang to the ceiling then he opened the case the briefest look sufficed him ha huh, not cigarettes after all he shot a glance at Dan, whose lips were tight, at Hoagland, but Hoagland at this intrusion had sunk back upon the pillows, and there, 
as the ill-starred Tucker had once done before him, was simulating unconsciousness. The huge planter drew back a pace. So this is your little game, is it? he purred to Dan. Fernando was right then. He is always right. You are a secret service agent of the United States come to spy on my poor house, senor, so-called medico. He spread his fat hands wide and moved back the fraction of a step farther. End of chapter 22「twenty three of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three Under the Hoofs. Stay there. I will kill this fellow myself. Vieta flung the words over one massive shoulder to the guard in the hall, kicked the door shut, and then, with the added force of momentum, rushed upon Dan. It was the charge of a rhinoceros. Falling before it, Dan was caught and enveloped in a mighty grasp that crushed him against Don Ramon's broad breast, while one of the hands that had torn the jungle serpent's head from its body gripped both of Stone's wrists and bent his arms straight backward from the shoulders. Victim and attacker struck against the bed. Then the invalid Hoagland suffered a sudden convulsion. The sheet that partially covered him sailed four square into space. It rode the air of battle and, descending, enmeshed both the combatants. A third combatant hurtled after it. The patient threw himself upon Vieta's shoulders. But Ramon's weight had deceived the detective. Both here and in Sanchez, it had seemed to Hoagland to be nothing more than the flabby fat of the heavy eater. Now he was to discover that underneath this soft outer layer worked, unretarded, muscles like the muscles of a crossroads blacksmith. Try as he would, strain as he did, the Secret Service operative, himself no weakling and always in trim, could not rend the planter's titanic hole from the nearly snapping arms of Dan. Had it not been for the confusion of the suffocating sheet, from which both Stone and Vieta struggled to free themselves, Don Ramon would not have let go at all. But the entangling folds of linen choked him, and, as Hoagland guessed this advantage, the Secret Service man decided to use it to the utmost capacity. He pulled the sheet tighter about the tossing head of the taller of the two concealed men. Ramon, half gagged and half smothered, could not call out, and in order to breathe adequately he must loose his hold on Dan. He fought the alternative bitterly, but at last let go and dropped to his knees. He pushed his great body first to the right and then far to the left, knocking over both his assailants. Fuming and sweating, he sprang upright and twisted the sheet into a ball, which he tossed to the bed. After all, he had been too quick for Hoagland. The alteration of position was a thing accomplished in the merest flash of time. Before the two Americans could realize the speed with which his maneuver was enacted, they were being dragged by the backs of their necks toward the hall, the door of which was reopened in answer to a kick from Don Ramon's heavy riding boots. With a contemptuous snort at the dazed guard, his master bellowed for better help in the removal of his prisoners. Socorro! Socorro! His ball echoed through the palacio. From the floor below, running footsteps sounded. They sounded nearer. They were ascending the narrow stairs. The sentry at the door, whose non-interference had once been commanded, shone signs of convalescing intelligence. Vieta, Dan, and Hoagland were just around the turn of the door when Dan, falling forward, managed to grasp one of his captor's ankles. Don Ramon was caught in mid-stride. He tumbled with a resounding bump. Heavy men are hard to throw, but if they are thrown, it is heavily. For one instant, Vieta lay so still that the sentry's whole mind was given to him, and during that broken moment, the Americans scrambled to their feet and stared at each other. To run forward now would be to run into that oncoming help which was clambering up the stairs. Dan, quicker in this crisis than Hoagland, dragged at the ladder's sleeve and pointed within the room. When Don Ramon had last kicked that door, its key dropped from the lock. It lay now a yard beyond the sill. 
Dan pulled the detective to it. They slammed the door just as a recovered Vieta flung himself against the barrier. Pressing with all their strength upon their side of the oaken panel, they managed to hold until Dan had turned the key. It was a strong key set in a strong lock. Once, perhaps, it had secured other prisoners in that room. The present prisoners were thankful for its temporary protection. Hoagland produced a pair of automatics and put one into Dan's hands. I oughtn't to have given myself away, he muttered, but I thought that so-and-so was going to kill you, my friend. He pointed to the proffered weapon. I didn't want you to have this down there in the jungle, he said with a vacant stare that Dan had noted on the hawk, but, oh boy, I want you to have it now. Why, why didn't you use it on him, Stone panted. He nodded toward the door and indicated the invisible but more than audible planter who was hammering at its farther side. The first rule of our service, Hoagland smilingly explained, is never to shoot while there's any chance without it. Vieta's blows redoubled. The treasury agent grew serious again. And now, he concluded, I think you and I are getting to the last chance. Again and again Ramon pounded on the door. More and more steps thumped up the stairs and came nearer and nearer along the wall. Vieta cursed the guard, then roared incisive orders. He called for guns, machetes, for all his adherents, and for Fernando, above all, for Fernando. Over the turmoil, the hunchback's shrill voice sounded finally in answer from far below. At once, Don Ramon, at once! Dan drew Hoagland to the window. You're right, said he, look and he pointed meaningly straight down the precipitous outer wall. We can't make it that way, never in the world, and we can't escape by the door, and the door can't hold forever. We're trapped. It's only a question of time. The Secret Service man, one eye on the reverberating portal, tapped Dan's shoulders. A question of time, that's just it. We must hold out as long as we can. But even then, a roar and a smash interrupted him. Don Ramon's peons had arrived in force. Their machetes hacked at the door. Their pistols shot through it. A minute or two, not more. Listen to that, Dan spoke between the noise of the blows. And if they can't work fast enough this way, they'll rig up some sort of a battering ram. The wood was already splintering. Through the thinnest of the paneling, the flash of a peon's evil blade gleamed among the splinters. After that, there was no more talking against the pandemonium. Hoagland gestured to Dan to stand close to the doorpost on one side. He posted himself on the other. He released the safety catch of his own weapon and held it cocked for the tumultuous moment of the enemy's entrance. Dan sedulously and resolutely imitated his companion's grim preparations. Crash! The wood seemed breaking at all points, and yet somehow the door as a whole still held firm. Hoagland lifted his left arm and examined the watch that he wore upon his wrist. "'We must keep them back as long as we can,' he shouted. But through the din of the battering, the younger man was forced to guess at what he said. Then came the end. With a rending lunge, the door fell inward, and after it, pell-mell pitched the vanguard of the dark attackers. The first two dropped at the first two shots from either side of the doorway. But what followed was wholly indiscriminate. Instantly, the room was full of men and gray smoke, pierced by the dull red of explosions. Don Ramon climbed over a pair of bodies and, seeing Hoagland first, hurled himself at the Secret Service operative, seizing his wrist and trying to wrench his opponent's pistol free. A couple of other men shouldered after him and fell on Dan, who shot one but missed the other. He did not greatly care so long as Vieta and Piña remained alive to threaten Gertruda, and Piña had not yet so much as appeared. The doorway was narrow. The attackers, crowding hard and without order, had to come in only three at a time. An ugly fellow with lopped ears postured at the threshold and flourished his machete. Hoagland saw him and, raising his wrist, despite the pressure Don Ramon had on it, fired. One ear hole became a slash of blood. The man howled and fell and so held back for a moment those behind him. Thus matters stood when, from outside the room, outside the house itself, a sound that was new beat through the noise of the assault, the galloping of horses, 
there arose a shriek below stairs which dan knew must be fernando's pina perhaps delaying to rally all the peons had inexplicably not yet come up in answer to his master's command ramon amid the turmoil of the fight stood at pause and listened i knew they wouldn't be a minute late hoagland's shout broke the second slow it's the constabulary to all save three of the crowd those english words meant nothing but to Dan and Don Ramon they came, though so differently, as the magic words that break a spell. Suddenly, no longer restrained, Stone burst free with a yell of triumph and battered his way toward the door, his sole thought the rescue of Gertruda. Vieta's eyes started as if they would roll from his head. He backed rapidly, cursed a peon who was trying to aid, and roaring, Vaya! He flung the living obstacle aside, kicked his way over the blockade of bodies, and dashed from the room and down the staircase. By now Dan had also vanished. The leaderless peon stopped, turned, and stared after Vieta open-mouthed. Then, with a babel of cries and a savage disregard of their dead and wounded, they fled in their master's wake and followed him down the stairs. Hoagland had rushed to the window. He had been right. The patio was full of armed men, and more were galloping up. Helmeted natives, officered by Americans. He threw his arms high over his head and addressed the universe. Didn't I tell you it was only a question of time? Then horror trod upon the heels of exultation. He shuddered. For down in the patio, an ugly thing happened. Having scented trouble ahead of his master and not wishing to share it, the hunchback had all too tardily attempted an escape. Unsightly as he was, he had, as Don Ramon had told Stone in the course of his extenuation of the hunchback's actions, a wife in the neighborhood of the village, and, wicked as he had abundantly proved himself to all the rest of the world, her, in his crooked way, Pina loved. He understood the significance of the approaching hoofs. He guessed flight imperative, but without this woman he would not try it. He might have cut across the farther side of the plantation and made alone for the Haitian interior. Instead, he thought to slip between the raiders and secure his wife before any escape proper could be begun. Terror, however, poisons acumen. Fernando, in his panic, miscalculated the distance of the charging constabulary. As he reached the patio's edge, the first four horses galloped in. Their hoofs just missed his diminutive figure. He ducked this way and that. He swerved, he slipped, he fell to his knees. The next four animals crushed his shrieking form in the dust of the avenue. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four, Flame. Dan, dear, but I assure you," said the Senorita Gertruda, "and you can see yourself, my feet, that they have not been cut off. I can walk perfectly." He had found her in her own room after wildly searching a dozen others, deserted by the appointed guards who had run off in answer to Don Ramon's summons of assistance. Having once lifted her in his arms, he was now carrying her through the door that, from the ground-floor hall, opened to the patio. "'I don't care,' said Dan. "'I don't want ever to let you go.' "'Only,' she persisted, "'I have not been at all harmed, I assure you. "'And you never shall be, thank God.' "'Because, doubtless,' the girl laughed, "'these officers and men here will aid you to defend me.' This took his eyes from her, and he realized that he was now facing a crowded compound in which stood not a few of his uniformed fellow countrymen. She blushed as he put her down. He blushed, too, as an officer of the constabulary came up to them. Mr. Hoagland asked me to tell you, sir, that the house is now safely surrounded. Most of the peons are already in custody. You, you're really American? stammered Dan. United States American? Oh, altogether, sir. In Santo Domingo? The questioned man frowned slightly. I'm afraid, he said, that you're like most of the people back home. 
hardly any of them know that the united states citizens have been officering the constabulary just about ever since mr roosevelt took over the customs for us he was right dan was like most americans he contritely admitted having heard of the historic change and then forthwith forgetting it he recollected that don ramon had for the most part carefully kept to the back streets of both san lorenzo and sanchez of course he had seen no sign of the new order and hoagland sent for you yesterday the wireless to puerto plata from the only wireless station within twenty miles of here dan sniffed at the air there was the scent of something burning where's he now hoagland he's looking for the owner of this hacienda what's his name Vieta? it seems the fellow came down the main stairs but he never showed up here so he must have got out back or else he's gone up again by some other way dan shouted why good heavens he's in the chapel of course the officer smiled was this interlocutor crazy saying his prayers he asked no no you don't understand and i hadn't time to tell hoagland that part of it i only told him i knew what their game was dan all but forgot gertruda he seized the officer's shoulders why it's all there in the chapel the presses the fake money and a sweating hoagland rushed up to them something of what stone said he had caught in his turn he began to shake dan where is the chapel where is the chapel dan surrendered the senorita to the officer's care and followed by the secret service agent and a score of men led the way at a run as they advanced the scent of things burning grew more pungent he's burning up the money cried stone i don't give a whoop about the money panted hoagland what i've got to get is the plates in a counterfeiting case as long as the plates exist his breath nearly stopped and his words stopped altogether dan running well ahead remembered that during his visit to the chapel he had not once thought about the plates the heavy door was unlocked whoever was inside had wasted no time in securing it behind his entrance stone tore it open a cloud of smoke rushed out and on it flapped a squawking bird muerte el traidor don ramon in his extremity had not forgotten his pet but now pedro deserted him for the less stifling atmosphere of the hot afternoon the parrot flew still squawking into the jungle the attackers rushed inside a slow smoke was filling the transept from the rickety confessional box originating in the counterfeit hundred-dollar bills the fire had already spread outward the woodwork was crackling close to the body of the peon who was stretched there staring at the vaulted roof and seeing nothing the only disinterested figure among them all hoagland tore away a handful of the charring paper and stuffed it into a coat pocket as he did so three shots out of an automatic pistol flashed from behind the altar and spattered against the west wall above the raiders heads dan looked back toward the way by which he had entered the plates shrieked hoagland divining his purpose while it was yet but half formed never mind the man the plates are worth more than their maker why but stone with quick decision zigzagged a path among his new-found allies he had a score of his own to pay he ran across the patio and into the now deserted house he tore upstairs he rushed light-footed along a gallery and so came with quick stealth upon the balcony over which he had thrown the peon who now lay dead there on the chapel floor dan looked down over the rail in spite of the rising smoke he could now see don ramon quite clearly behind the altar and through its marble tracery the pseudo planter was taking careful aim at the constabulary he had probably made his way to the chapel by a roundabout course after passing through a back door of the palacio he never dreamed of looking up from the east end of the balcony it was a long diagonal leap to the shoulders of vieta below dan measured the distance with precision could he make it he climbed upon the rail and poised there into his mind flashed the memory of how he had poised before his plunge from the hawk below the eyes of the armed men were raised to him but hoagland gestured them to silence and the embattled counterfeiter the man who had kept gertruda from her inheritance peeped only at those of his enemies who were on his own level balanced as if for a dive into some quiet swimming pool 
Dan counted the number of yards and the angle he must cover if he hoped for anything but death or maiming on the chapel pavement. Ramon's huge, forward-bent back presented a clear but perilously far-away landing place, a landing place only just possible of achievement. Stone made the dive. The wind of his passage whistled in his ears. His heart seemed to stop beating. But he had not calculated erroneously. Like a missile from a skillful sling, he struck his goal safely between the sharpshooter's shoulders. The impact was tremendous. Both the human bullet and its human mark rolled, dazed upon the tiles. When Dan sat up, the invulnerable giant, Ramon, was surrounded by the raiders and was shrugging his recognition of the fact that the time was overripe for surrender. "'You appear to have captured me,' he said to the most zealous of his guardians. "'Don't point your revolver like that. It might go off. Never fear. I shall accompany you quietly.' Through the gathering smoke, Hoagland was anxiously examining the machinery in the center aisle while the one group of constabulary who were not busy watching Don Ramon set themselves to putting out the fire. "'Where are the plates?' the Secret Service agent again demanded. "'I've got to have those counterfeit plates, Mr. Vieta.' Don Ramon only smiled. The plates were not inside the burning confessional box. That was soon evident. Looking on detachedly at the fevered search, Vieta bit his nails and shook his head as if he were in no position to offer enlightenment. Hoagland ran up to Don Ramon. He shoved forward an enraged fist. Will you tell me where you've hidden those plates? You know we'll have our troubles with the jury unless we find them, and you know they're more dangerous at large than you are. Where have you hidden them? Vieta fairly beamed. Senor, I have no idea of what it is that you are talking. Shall I kill you, or will you tell me? Ramon knew that for a bluff, and he displayed his knowledge laughingly. You shall kill me. The bluff was fairly called. Hoagland tossed his thin thatched head and turned away. Throughout Dan's dash to the balcony, he had, under the hampered sharpshooter's fruitless fire, ransacked half the chapel. Now the second half had been vainly scoured. Yet the operative was decided that these imperatively important pieces of metal were somewhere under this groined roof. They must be. All the work had been accomplished here, and the place had been kept more securely locked than the chief counterfeiter's own bedroom could have been. Hoagland wheeled on Dan. You're a lot of help. You are, he vociferated. He had to expend his chagrin on somebody. You've made a lot of use of your opportunities, I don't think. Found out everything that I'd guessed beforehand. Turned up a lot of junk that I didn't half need. One would have thought that he had especially commissioned Dan to come here. Oh, I wired home for your record and got it, all right. Studied medicine and played with church architecture. If you had to play with something, why didn't you pick a thing that could be of some use now? It was the old taunt. It was, in effect, the jibe against Dan's father that the Pennsylvania Dutch lawyer had launched at the boy when the Elder Stone's estate was settled. Your pop was the kindest, hardest man as ever lived, but he hadn't an idea for money yet. If you want to get along, boy, keep your fingers off in print. And it stung his father's son to action. Marvelously, he remembered that single detail of the old books on ecclesiastical architecture which solved the pressing problem of his government's present quest. I've got it, he said. Hoagland fairly shook him. Got what? Where? The plates. Don't. You're hurting my shoulder where Pina bit it. I mean, I know where they are. Listen. In every Catholic altar, there is a piece of metal or a thin mortared stone, the altar stone, that covers a cavity. They put relics of a saint in it. This chapel's not used now, but the altar stone, that hole, that must be there. It's just a place. Look in it. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of Money to Burn by Reginald Wright Kaufman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five The Buenos Aires Woman. 
in the tonneau of his big limousine one of the largest in washington the usually genial secretary of the treasury displayed a troubled frown while so close to his face that the breath of that neighbor's speech rustled his gray side whiskers he listened to the deductions of the chief of the secret service it's all a process of elimination said boyle chewing his cigar emphatically i'm sorry for poor old farley and except by elimination we can't get a thing on him but somebody's got to be the goat or the administration will catch old harry these fake notes are all over the place there aren't so many of them but they're scattered about everywhere and the rumors got out about them only on the inside of course but out all right and the plain fact is that there isn't any clue as to how they got there well then farley had and has facilities that nobody else could have and that's all there is to it the chief was always direct he believed in going straight to the point however brutally so when the pair arrived at their destination and were finally ushered into farley's private office he gave that gentleman eye for eye not so the little secretary of the treasury one sidelong glance showed him the drawn pallor of the suspected man's careworn face and the stoop of his shoulders which recent worry had forced there the secretary kept intact the genuine heart to the old line politician he kept it firm but in the right place and so he now blustered in his fussy manner to cover a regret quite honestly poignant mr farley he finally began the government as you are well aware is most disturbed you've no good news i fear in this er film or note paper farley shook his tired head boyle continued to regard the superintendent steadily through his sharp eyes that never wavered the treasury department said its secretary has come to a standstill in this affair we've well we well we've just got to throw up our hands you mean the secretary blew his nose. He had a way of blowing it ostentatiously when he was worried. Public disgrace threatens us, said he. That's what it amounts to. Things can't be hushed up indefinitely. Every bank in the country knows, and when things are once known privately, it's never a long time before they are known publicly, too. The coming elections, if I may speak quite openly, do, please, said Farley but i understand what you're driving at he passed a hand across his eyes and tried to smile you mean that that i must go boyle clapped him on the shoulder i'm glad you take it that way but farley was no fool he guessed suddenly what lay behind the chief detective's masquerade of good fellowship to pay the disciplinary penalty for an executive error was one thing but to be suspected of overt crime was another crime after his long life of denial of hard devotion to routine duty after his record that bore only this single blot his cheeks turned gray he looked at boyle with a quick puzzled gasp oh, only you can't really think that i'm that i'm guilty it was an abrupt climax but before boyle could answer the office door was thrust open there stood miss green tight-lipped yet evidently almost bursting with news long training made her look only to her employer for permission to speak the male trio scowled at her intrusion farley's nerves were on edge well he asked sharply there are three men outside with three plain-clothes men besides they say that as one of them says he must see you at once it's a mr hoagland hoagland shouted the chief of the secret service bring him in what is it gasped farley he began to mop his brow boyle made a sapient gesture that meant wait and see he had no idea of what was coming the guards did not enter but hoagland smiling profusely bustled forward at once his derby hat in one hand behind him followed a sturdy boyish person with frank eyes and a shock of tow-colored hair and behind him and quite as if he were glad to accompany them a big broad genial gentleman carrying a malacca cane strapped to one wrist a gentleman immaculately clad in speckless white whose dark glances flashed from the now incarnadine miss green to the group about the desk and whose fat hands were lavishly decked with rings 
Well, snapped Boyle, who had no intention of betraying any lack of omniscience, let's hear what you've got to say, Mr. Hoagland. Hoagland did not at once directly answer his chief. He had his own pride and his own love for the dramatic. Not to be robbed of their indulgence, he had carefully refrained from telegraphing any news in advance. He pushed forward the younger of his two companions and addressed the general assemblies. This is Dr. Daniel Gurney Stone, said he, or almost a doctor, he corrected. He's proved himself of invaluable assistance to us. And this, he pointed to the smiling foreigner, is Signor Ramon Vieta, according to himself, and he can give you some information about those Fillmore plates. Don Ramon made a sweeping bow. Farley leaned forward and looked at the recent planter with puzzled interest. I've seen you before, but I can't think... Then he remembered. Boyle was entirely what he would have called practical. Quite as if he had never had the least suspicion of Farley, he now addressed Hoagland. Have you got the plates? Sure. The agent handed out a carefully wrapped package. You know what an altar stone is, chief? I traced these to an altar stone. Of course you did, said Boyle, but his assertion lost all its potential effectiveness in the common rush to examine that offered package. There arose a general sigh. Each in his own way, the Washington officials certified the contents of that parcel to be what they had just been pronounced. The Secretary of the Treasury cleared his throat. He pulled at his whiskers and opened his mouth. He was patently glad, however, that Hoagland postponed for him the immediate necessity to apologize to Farley. Remember Tucker? Hoagland inquired of Boyle. Skinny, lanky guy, government engraver with a chronic grouch? The head of the Secret Service nodded noncommittally. It was Farley who gave eager assent, and to him, as the more appreciative, Hoagland then addressed himself. Extra disgruntled. He resigned about six months ago. I've a hunch my friend Signor Vieta had something to do with it. Well, as the chief here knows, I'd had Lawson and Sweeney and myself following paper, mostly around Brooklyn wharves, and that's how I struck the lead. The counterfeiter's mistake was in wanting to overdo the thing, like that Pennsylvania case, where the fellows got away with their bills but were caught by their cigar stamps. This gang ran short of paper and sent up for more. Yes, yes, said Farley, and you followed that clue? went to Santo Domingo with the fresh supply, where I found this Tucker had been making hay while the sun shone on Signor Vieta's ranch, or while it didn't, night work, you know. I ran into a lively mess, I can tell you, but Doc Stone helped me out. Still, that's a long story, and Tucker's dead now. And so you got these plates? Yep, and cabled our consul to have the captain and mate of the ship the gang used held for further orders at Port of Spain, where I knew they had condensed milk to deliver. Then I came back. It was a side partner of Tucker shipped the paper. I gathered him in as I came through New York this morning, but he doesn't know much, so I left him locked up downtown here in Washington, and did you get any of their product? The phony money? Hoagland's face fell. Just this. He produced a few charred bills. All the rest was burned up in the chapel where they stored it. Money to burn, Vieta had, and he burned it all right. Then, for the first time during the interview, Dan Stone spoke. Out of a trouser's pocket, he pulled his ten bills. I've got this, sir. I was paid it for, well, for semi-professional medical services. He placed his thousand dollars on the desk. Boyle, however, had succeeded in securing attention by turning upon the Santo Domingan. I came across you just nine years ago, my friend, he was saying. He had the good detective's memory for faces. It was a little matter of opium smuggling then, but we couldn't get the goods on you. We suspected your wife, too. Where's she now? Don Ramon shrugged lightly. My new wife, you mean the wife I married two, three years ago, yes? Oh, she is no way connected in the present enterprise. She is living in Buenos Aires. There came a loud gasp from the door. Everyone stared thither. Miss Cecilia Green, whose continued attendance had been overlooked by Vieta, crouched there in a state closely verging on collapse. 
Nevertheless, even as they all stared, she was pulling her statuesque frame together and already pointing a finger at the foreigner. You, you, she exclaimed. On her invitation, Mr. Farley had once, it will be recalled, dined at his stenographer's boarding house. In those days, he considered it a good business to be on terms of personal acquaintance with his office force, and in those days he regarded this one of its members rather as a fellow government clerk than as a woman. Now he colored slightly as he dutifully inquired. Miss Green, isn't this Senor Vieta a gentleman who used to live where you do? She covered her face with those pathetic hands for ten years so efficient in the Bureau service. I thought that he and I were going to get married, she blurted. He made love so wonderfully. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Farley. Farley bowed his head. Go on, said he. Well, then I'd refused a lot of other men because I thought you were going to promote me, and at last it was plain you wouldn't. She lowered her hands and raised her eyes to Farley's with sudden defiance, but as quickly looked away. When I found I was mistaken, I, I, I guess I was a fool. Anyhow, that's why I borrowed them for him. All but two of the men regarded the handsome penitent with a mixture of bewilderment and compassion. Explain yourself, Boyle ordered. Quick to attempt to retrieve his error, Don Ramon turned to her. But, my dear Miss Cecilia, I am assuredly going to marry you. He was too late. You, you beast, she cried. She triumphed. What about the wife in Buenos Aires? She gave him a wholly withering scorn. Boyle had stepped over to her. He grasped her arm as if in a vice. How did you do it? He bellowed in her ear. Don't hold me like that, she shook him off. And don't yell, it's rude. Well, he demanded, but he let go his hold and lowered his voice. Mr. Farley said Miss Green, ignoring the Secret Service chief, and for some occult reason facing Dan as the least unsympathetic man in view. Mr. Farley had made up the fresh combination of the safe on December 30th. I knew he would. I've not been here for years for nothing. And I believe Don Ramon, I mean this creature, when he said he just wanted a glimpse at them. At what? asked Boyle. The plates? Of course, silly because he said he was going to be head of the Santo Domingan Treasury Department, and he wanted some ideas about plate-making. Only America was sort of in control of the island and wouldn't let him do anything. Oh, she broke off, I know I was a fool to believe him, and I knew then that it was dreadfully wicked. But I thought Mr. Farley... That one interrupted. He still spoke as a man determined to perform a painful duty. I remember, he explained to the company, that Miss Green was er, very much annoyed about not getting Dodd's position. Nevertheless, I must add that I did not speak the combination aloud, and no one, not even she, saw the paper on which I wrote it. The stenographer looked at him with sad eyes, but she went on. Not exactly, Mr. Farley. Only, when you worked it out, you did write it down in ink, and you blotted the paper on your desk blotter. I was watching, and I know. While you were out of the room giving Mr. Dodd and Mr. Lemmel their halves of it, I read the blotted numbers by simply copying them exactly on a sheet of tracing paper and holding that to the light. When we were closing up, I brought some unnecessary papers into the vault, straight past Jenkins the guard. Oh, I often had to do that, and he never looked into the room. Why should he? He always looked out. That was the way any burglar had to come from. Well, I just opened the safe quickly, stuffed the unnecessary papers under my dress so he'd see they were gone if he had sense enough to think about them at all. And I stuffed the plates there, too, of course. And then I went directly to the ladies' dressing room. And then it was Boyle who spoke now. He waved down Farley's hand that was raised in protest against harshness. And then she glared at him. In there, I pinned on my hat and powdered my nose. But first I wrapped the plates in oilcloth. She pointed to Ramon. He provided it. Where did you hide them? Where he told me to, in the box up top that holds the water. But, 
protested Farley, still loyal to his system. Every employee is searched on leaving. Yes, sir. Only that was a day before a holiday. I was searched as usual. I said I'd forgotten my bag. Must have left it in the dressing room, which I'd done, too, on purpose, sir. So I ran up and stuffed the plates again under my dress, and just ran back and opened my bag for the inspector to show him nothing was in it that shouldn't be. He was in as much of a hurry as I was. Then, then I went into the matinee and gave this, this Don Ramon the plates. And what did you do next? Boyle kept up the inquisitorial preeminence that he had acquired with so much difficulty. Why, next, pursued Miss Green, now only too ready to convict both herself and her false admirer, next he gave them back the way he'd promised to on the Tuesday morning when I stopped at the boarding-house after being at my sister's in Alexandria. I'd been near crazy all the time they were gone, Mr. Farley, and he, the memory was almost too much for her, he thanked me and said I'd helped a poor oppressed government and wouldn't ever have cause to regret it. She paused only to dab her eyes with a crumpled handkerchief. She launched defiance at her quondam lover. And so, she continued, after the plates were missed on Tuesday morning, we weren't searched when we came in, you know. I reached over your head, Mr. Farley, as if I were looking for them, too, and put them on the wrong shelf, and found them there. Nobody would ever suspect me, she said bitterly to Boyle, but I guess this, this beast copied them while he had them. Only I give you my word, I never dreamed he'd lied, not till months afterwards. She turned on the fat Lothario. You're a crook, she said to Don Ramon. A crook, and I want you to know that. Since I have found you out, I've, I've become engaged to an honest man. I've become engaged to Mr. Farley. The very room gasped at surprise. Everybody turned to the superintendent. Uh, <clears throat> coughed the thus announced fiancé. Eh? asked the secretary of the treasury it's quite true admitted farley with a sudden blushing recrudescence of youth of course i didn't know till now will it make any difference between us demanded cecilia green there was certain largeness about her gesture though her eyes were moist because if it does you're free she was really very handsome and she had been at last undeniably truthful farley looked at her it won't, said he, and then challenged criticism from everybody. None was forthcoming. Boyle had walked back to the desk and was examining the plates that his agent had brought. Vieta, said he, we've got to hand it to you for one thing. These are just about flawless. I congratulate you on being the most expert counterfeiter the service has ever come across. Don Ramon, now that Farley's stenographer had done her worst against him, was his best self once more. He bowed a deprecating acknowledgment to Boyle. Then, with an inclination of apology to Miss Green, he calmly usurped her place in the limelight. He coughed softly behind a fat hand with outspread ringed fingers, and, having thus secured the desired attention, said, "'Gentlemen!' i am about to denounce the guilty man and to prove prove that i am not he that he is a member of the cabinet of the president of your united states end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of money to burn by reginald wright kaufman this librivox recording is in the public domain Chapter 26. Guilty Uncle Sam Probably not since the denunciation of Aaron Burr had such a charge been made in Washington. Vietta was not mad. He patently knew the full weight of his words, and yet he as patently enjoyed them. Uninvited, he sat down. He crossed his plump legs, tapped one of them with his malacca cane, and beamed on his gaping audience. Boyle swore. In a paroxysm of stupefaction, Hoagland grinned frozenly. 
For Farley, this new surprise was one too many. He sought Cecilia's support, while Dan joined the others in looking from the cheerful face of Don Ramon to the dumbfounded countenance of the secretary and back again. Since nobody else appeared able to speak, the Domingan embraced the opportunity that he had created. As you gentlemen will shortly discover, said he, this affair, at least as far as I am concerned, is all but concluded. Therefore, I may speak as I always prefer to speak, frankly. I do not conceal from you that it was my hope, if the initial venture succeeded, and if, of course, he inclined his great head to the gasping Cecilia, and if, of course, my suit for this fair lady's hand was favored, to borrow, as time passed, other plates by means of her goodwill and efficient services. Nevertheless, in your secret service chief, my inherent honesty compels me to confess that I do not completely deserve your praise. His auditors were gradually emerging from their paralysis. Hoagland, recovering an instant before his immediate superior, seized the opportunity thus provided. Cut it out. Cut out the society stuff, he interrupted. Chief, he said to Boyle, this guy never had one lone good quality except that he was decent to Pedro, and Pedro was a bird. Boyle decided upon nonchalance. He sought to cover wide wonder with a narrow smile. Well, why shouldn't Senor Vieta be good to a bird? He's some bird himself. Don Ramon was not, however, to be distracted by persiflage. He went on, I was saying, Senor Chief, that I do not completely deserve your generous encomium, and this is why. Attend now, except for one bill here that, then without my knowledge, Senor Tucker had given to a temporarily embarrassed Senor engaged by a house of papermakers, of banknote papermakers to be exact, I have not yet put one of my notes upon the market. What? At least three voices shouted the unbelieving query. But no, softly laughed Vieta, extending an open palm. You must understand, my dear sirs, that when one what you call unloads in such affairs as these, the unloading must be all at once, before governmental alarm is taken. Myself, I wish to print an even two million dollars before I started to sell my wares. I was consistent, and save for the few charred fragments that Signor Hoagland has brought here, and that one unfortunately given to the papermaker, the only existing copies of notes I have printed are now on that desk there. I paid them to the Signor Doctor to quiet him, and because I hoped him soon to disappear. Don Ramon paused. He raised a dramatic arm. Gentlemen, he smilingly declared, you have grievously wronged me. It is not I who have been the counterfeit. I use real paper and real plates, your paper and the plates that you had made, and you never thought to examine what you found at last in your own possession. There followed a silence scarcely less surprised than its predecessor. Don Ramon was radiant. Dan could not quite suppress a merely nervous chuckle, but everybody else was solemnly astounded. Then Farley pressed a finger to the bell designed to summon his senior assistant and forgot to remove the pressure. Bring me, said he, as Lemo put his fussy little head into the crowded room, the Fillmore hundred-dollar note plates and the standard note along with them. Oh, you will see, Don Ramon bit his ragged nails while they waited. But he ceased on Lemel's return and began to rub his hands again in premonitory satisfaction. Then, as he watched his contention indubitably verified, he shot his full bolt. The plates that were half innocently substituted by my poor dear Miss Cecilia Green here I hate you, cried Cecilia, and I wouldn't knowingly have got Mr. Farley in any trouble for anything. Farley daringly reached over and patted her supple shoulders. 
they were continued the unruffled vieta not those which she had given to me not at all what i gave her and what she then gave you were my own counterfeit plates carefully but quickly copied from the originals while those originals were in my possession by your senor josiah tucker god rest his soul senor secretary of the treasury you have been flooding your own country with bogus money they came running toward him all of them their mouths agape but he did not budge and he serenely concluded unless you wish to expose your own foolishness by publishing this confession you will find no charge on which you can legally hold me he had the whip hand it was hoagland that struck it down well i charge you said he with the murder of two of your own servants two of your peons fellows that you caught investigating your hacienda's chapel stone tells me they died before i got there these two but once you're locked up we'll find some of your people willing enough to talk and if i've learned anything about santo domingo he looked at boyle who nodded a wise assent the courts down there where of course you'll be tried won't stand for the introduction of any impertinent evidence about matters up here in washington the effect of that speech on the great criminal and the high government officials that it more or less directly involved was manifold quite ten minutes had elapsed before so unimportant a person as daniel gurney stone m d minus had a chance to act in repercussion to its effect on him then he managed after several failures to drag hoagland privately into a corner look here he whispered as far as i can make things out the secretary's letting everybody except old ramon down easily because there's an election due and he doesn't want publicity he's even going to turn free that good-looking stenographer so she can marry her boss and he'll probably give her a wedding present by the looks of him why he's promised me enough out of his own pocket to well he's whispered that i may keep the thousand vieta paid me and apply it to my medical tuition fees but what i want to ask you is this you sounded a little while ago as if you knew something about santo domingo law can you inform me as to a good lawyer in san domingo city or puerto plata who will get back my fiancee's estate for her End of chapter 26 End of Money to Burn, an adventure story by Reginald Wright Kaufman Recording by Stephen Seidel